Welcome to the 37th annual Stringer LLP Employer uh, Conference. Uh, this year we're running the conference again as a hybrid format and uh, uh, most of you are attending remotely, but we do have with us uh, a live studio audience in downtown Toronto and thank you for braving the traffic to, to get here, uh, much appreciated. And for those of you at home, uh, uh, welcome to our conference. And we um, hope that you will be engaged with us for the full day if you can. And uh, as part of that, we have our Q&A sessions at the um, end of the morning and the end of the afternoon. So everyone uh, both at home and uh, or at the office or here um, in the conference center can pose your questions and hopefully feel like you're right here as part of the live experience. And uh, we, we have quite a variety of attendees this year from um, just about every industry you could imagine, public and private employers, uh, profit, not-for-profits and charities, uh, as mostly provincially regulated, but a few federally regulated employers as well. And uh, this year we actually have over 500 people uh, attending, so uh, across uh, North America, uh, from Canada and the U.S. So welcome to everyone. Before we start, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Stringer LLP acknowledges that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. The firm also acknowledges that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Uh, for those of you who are members of the HRPA, you can use today's uh, program for continuing education credits. It's worth five and a half hours. And uh, at the end of the program, if you'd like uh, credit, please send us an email at events at Stringer LLP and we will send you is it a code or? Yeah, we'll send you a certificate. A certificate. With the code you need. With the code you need yeah. uh, for, for it. We have some attend uh, lawyers here in attendance as well. And um, this is good for uh, CLE uh, hours as well. Unfortunately, not for the EDI and professional development, but yeah, what can you do? Uh, you should have all received an email on Friday. Uh, with a link to the, today's materials, so you can download the slides and actually went out last keep those. Night. Actually went out last night. Sorry, I thought it went out Friday. Uh, so you should have it in any event. If you didn't receive it, check your uh, junk email uh, folder. But uh, and if you still didn't get it, let us know. We'll make sure you got it. Now, with the people here live, that one of the perks of attending is that they have hard copies. So anyone, that, by the way who's connected remotely. If you'd like to join us next year live, let us know and we'd be happy to have you. Um, okay, so into the conference, uh, we're covering uh, a wide variety of topics. Um, I think hopefully you'll find it an engaging program. Our, our first speaker, he's going to be, he's fresh from the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, unfortunately, the case um, didn't go his client's way. Uh, he and Jeremy Schwartz uh, were there uh, a few months ago, argued the case. Um, historically, it was a 4-4 tie, which apparently has only happened a few times in the history of the court. And uh, unfortunately for our client, the tiebreaker is how the Court of Appeal decided the case. So um, unfortunately, it didn't go our way, but uh, Ryan will explain to you the ins and outs of this decision and what it might mean for, for all of you as employers. Welcome and uh, good morning, everyone, both those of you who are uh, joining us uh, live here in Toronto and those of you in, uh, uh, in virtual uh, locations uh, across North America. Uh, as Landon indicated, um, this to my topic is going to be based upon one case, a relatively uh, significant. For those of you who follow the legal news, I think there's a good chance you may have heard of the decision in Ministry of Labor versus the City of Greater Sudbury, which uh, is a case that um, 
dates back for some time. The incident, uh, the tragic incident giving rise to this case goes back to uh, 2015 uh, and the original trial back uh, in 2017. But the uh, really what I really want to emphasize is this case is important, is going to have some impact on all of you, perhaps even in your personal life, if you ever uh, attempt to undertake renovations of your home or your business. Uh, the, uh, the, the really the, the topic about it is who ought to be liable for occupational health and safety violations on a construction project. That's what um, the heart of this case is about. Uh, and the reason the Supreme Court heard it is the Supreme Court only agrees to hear a certain case. Less than 10 percent of the, those who apply to bring their appeal to the Supreme Court are ever actually heard. Uh, and part of that is, is because the court only hears cases that it views to be of national importance. So this is even for those of you outside Ontario. Um, this case uh, transcends uh, transcends Ontario and is significant uh, to every provincial and federally regulated employer across the country uh, as far as health and safety law is concerned. So one of the, the key hearts of this is um, how the Occupational Health and Safety Act defines employer. Historically, at, at common law, an employer is someone where you have a direct relationship. You hire employees directly. They're your employees. Uh, not a complicated concept, but the Occupational Health and Safety Act makes a general exception to that in that it says that an employer is someone who employs one or more workers or contracts for the services of one or more workers, meaning that when you subcontract out to any corporate entity or individual who is not your employee, uh, you're considered the employer of that of the workers of that corporate entity or that individual subcontractor uh, as if they were your own employee which is a general exception to employment law, where typically in employment law, liability flows to your direct employees for things like uh, employment standards violations and wrongful dismissal and uh, uh, issues along uh, and issues along those lines. Historically, there has, law, there has been an exception to the approach uh, to this, you're responsible for, you're responsible for subcontractors. And that is in the context of construction. Construction typically, although not always, is, is, is a multi-employer workplace. Typically, when you're dealing with a large construction project, you have uh, an owner who, in many instances, subcontracts out to a general contractor who the law refers to, Ontario law refers to as a constructor. Um, some of you in other provinces may have heard the term prime contractor before. That's a similar concept that, ought, that sometimes transcends construction in other provinces. The comments I'm making about the employer definition apply specifically to Ontario uh, and a few other jurisdictions, but uh, the constructor or prime contractor is the workplace participant who controls a construction project. They're the ones that uh, are primarily responsible for it, uh, and they have certain very specific obligations under our law. To, uh, to ensure compliance. A constructor or, and typically a prime contractor obligations are similar in other provinces. And then look how broad this liability is. A constructor is re responsible for the measures and procedures uh, re required by the act, ensuring that every worker and every employer complies with that on a construction project and that the health and safety of workers on a project is protected. So in other words, uh, if you're a constructor, you're responsible for the whole shebang. You are responsible for the entire project and everybody on it. Uh, historically, the owner has had fairly limited liabilities under Ontario law. The owner basically was responsible for identifying uh, any designated substances uh, associated with the project. And essentially, if you, if you contracted out to a constructor, provided, you, provided it was not a sham, provided essentially that you legitimately contracted out to that constructor, you were not actually controlling the work, you weren't trying to set up a straw, the so-called straw man to avoid liability, that if you properly contracted out that work, the constructor was responsible for health and safety violations on the site, up to the most serious violations, right down to not having a hard hat. But, and that's how that's how construction liability has been premised in Ontario for literally, for, and, and, mo and across most of the rest of Canada, frankly, for literally decades. Uh, the only time the, the issues really historically had arisen had been circumstances where owners had started to step in and try to control the project. They started directing workers. They started disciplining workers. They'd they would taken the kind of steps you'd expect the general contractor would do. And then regulators said, once you started doing that, once you started stepping into the shoes of the general contractor or the party designated to be in control of the project, uh, that makes you the constructor. But Sudbury has taken this to uh, a different level. 
And I think it's important to take a look quickly that fines in Ontario are going up and up and up. I mean, the maximum fine has gone from half a million dollars per offense not too long ago up to $2 million per offense. Uh, individuals face a half a million dollars one year imprisonment. Officers and directors are looking at a million and a half uh, in fines, which is, um, again, almost as much as that of a corporation. So liability under this legislation is serious stuff. And it certainly appears that given that the government has raised the maximum fines, that's a suggestion to courts that penalties ought to be higher rather than lower. Um, and to what extent that is the case, of course, will be, uh, uh, li will be litigated. So basically, if you were historically, if you were undertaking a construction project, you had to decide, am I going to run the project myself? Which, I mean, unless you are a construction company, probably not a good idea. Uh, or would you relinquish, the, relinquish that task to a third party you hire to be the general contractor? And then that general contractor would be the one who would select the subcontractors who would uh, uh, pay the bills and uh, all that sort of thing and report to you and would be the ones that the regulator, the Ministry of Labor, would look to uh, to establish liability. Um, again, this is the owner's um, obligation. And one important section of this, uh, of the Health and Safety Act that became quite important in the Sudbury case is an owner does not become a constructor by virtue only of the fact that the owner has engaged an architect, professional engineer, or other person to oversee what's called quality control. In other words, like if you hire someone to go on the site to make sure that you're getting what you paid for, uh, that you know the, the, the materials that, or that were promised are being used, the project is proceeding on time, uh, it's being done in accordance with the drawings, all the kind of things that you know, any customer, particularly on the sophisticated end of a construction project, uh, would want to know, uh, that doesn't mean you, you become legally liable as the constructor, understandably. So obviously owners want to have quality control inspectors and that, you know, became uh, an issue in the Sudbury case. So the elephant in the room is, what well, is Sudbury because of the definition of employer, where it says where you subcontract out work liable uh, as an employer for everything on a construction project? Uh, and the city of, so in, in a rare, as Landon alluded to, 4 4 tie, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada basically had the practical effect of uh, upholding a court of a very brief court of appeal decision that says because of the definition of employer, the, uh, the owner is liable for any contravention on a construction project, even if they've contracted out uh, as a third party uh, to would have historically had that uh, liability. Um, respectfully, in my view, I mean, again, speaking uh, in the speech on behalf of myself and not my client, uh, this is a game change in, uh, in health and safety law, where historically this kind of liability would only rest um, with uh, the constructor and the individual uh, uh, entities performing construction work uh, on the project. So what, so what, is that what could that practically mean? And certainly these were some of the issues. I mean, I'll give you an example. One of the judges of the Supreme Court, Justice Rowe, who is the first and only judge to serve our Supreme Court ever to be appointed from Newfoundland, uh, made the uh, comment, so if he hired someone to come in to remove, uh, if he had rats in his attic and he hired someone to come in and remove these rats, or I guess it was raccoons he used, and this person who was designated to do that didn't wear the required hazmat suit, could he be prosecuted for it? Even though like anyone here in the raccoon control business is kind of rather specialized entity, wouldn't it? And that's the court, basically under the theory of the Court of Appeal and the uh, uh, and what would become the de facto majority in this case, you would be responsible for the raccoon person not wearing the right hazmat suit, uh, which certainly was. Uh, and if you read through the judgment, there's other hypotheticals that are that are raised, particularly by the uh, what would be considered to be the dissent in this case that supported my client's position. That there are a number of circumstances where it would seem a little absurd to impose that liability uh, on a party with no means uh, to comply with it. Um, so the facts of Sudbury are as follows. Um, they're relatively straightforward. The city and tragic. I mean, like really, they were. It really was. It was true. A true tragedy. I mean, the city retained a road builder on a project to uh, conduct a road building project right through a downtown, a busy downtown area in the city of Sudbury. Um, there was no question on the facts, and no one disputed that there is that when you have a road grader that's reversing, you need to have a safety fence around that project. Uh, unfortunately, a requirement that's frequently ignored on uh, road building projects, if you take an observation around various places in Ontario. And more important, equally importantly, arguably more importantly, there is no signal reversing the, with the road grader. When you're reversing a road grader, you can't see what's behind you. So the idea of having a signaler is to make sure the road grader is proceeding backwards, uh, you can, that it can be stopped if someone uh, comes into the construction project where the idea is they wouldn't be. So unfortunately, the... Uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, the uh, there was a person that crossed into the construction project, <clears throat> and, the, and they were tragically run over and killed by the uh, by the road grader. The road builder was charged and found guilty, fined one hundred ninety five thousand dollars for failing to have a signal. So the actual party, and that was the party that employed the operator of the road grader. Um, the city was charged as both constructor and employer for the same offenses. For our purposes, that's the safety. What really matters is the counts related to the safety fence and the uh, uh, and the uh, signal. Or there were some other counts that were somewhat uh, peripheral and not proven. Much of the trial, the original trial, focused on whether various actions by the city made the city the constructor, whether they had actually taken actions that took over the job. Uh, the, the, the legal issue related to the employer, frankly, just sort of an interesting comment, was somewhat peripheral to most of the evidence um, at the trial. The trial court found that the employer that, that the city did not take over the job as the constructor and did not assert sufficient control to be treated as the employer. The trial court basically found that there, there ought to be a nexus of control in the uh, before someone's treated as an employer on a construction project when one considers the broader statutory scheme of being able to contract out to a constructor. So the court read the scheme as a whole and said, if in order for, you know, for the scheme to make sense, uh, you would have to, you wouldn't impose employer obligations on a party that's contracted out safety and is obliged not to interfere uh, with the operations of the general contractor. The city, and in, in the alternative, the court found that uh, even if the city were the employer, that it had exercised uh, due diligence, which, you know, we're going to get to in a moment and becomes where the, rubber hits the road in the in the brave new world of uh, liability on a construction project. So the Supreme, it is sometimes it is difficult. I've read many Supreme Court decisions in employment law. Frankly, the Supreme Court doesn't take on a lot of employment law cases, relatively rare, and even less cases dealing with occupational health and safety. I mean, I can think of in my in my career, maybe three or four judgments um, that the court uh, dealt with a health and safety issue. The last one related to drug testing from a case from New Brunswick, um, which was also not a particularly favorable decision for employers, I might add. Um, but these uh, th 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 these are two these are four diametrically opposed two diametrically opposed judgments. Uh, nine judges heard the case, so there ought not to have been a tie in the court. But Justice Brown, who uh, was one of the judges heard the case, retired. Uh, before the uh, before the judgment was issued, so we had uh, the judgment of four judges um, of the court who took uh, two very diametrically opposed views. It's completely opposite approaches, really. Uh, the, the the four judges who supported um, who supported the Ministry of Labor's position, who became the decision that was basically is the one that carried the day, is that the Occupational Desert Health and Safety Act doesn't create silos of responsibility. And that employers and constructors should have overlapping responsibility. It's almost sounding like a policy judgment saying, look, they're, they're, that really, it's a, we're in a better situation where uh, both the owner and the constructor have legal responsibility uh, for liability. And of course, what's on, of course, the, the side of these four judges is the definition of employer is consistent, at least read in isolation anyway, is consistent with that position taken by, the, uh, by these judges. They felt that worker safety was better protected by imposing liability. And key from their argument is the employer could avail themselves of a due diligence defense. And well, what is due diligence? I mean, that, of course, is a, a topic for courses in law school, to be entirely honest. But uh, what it basically means is an, the defendant has to prove that all and, and that burden is on the defendant to prove that all reasonable precautions in the circumstances have been taken to prevent the offense. So, I mean, simply, I'll give you a simple example. If we had a worker that was not tied off to fall protection on a construction site, the uh, um, defendant would have to, to prove what reasonable precautions were taken. If you were the constructor or you were the indirect employer of that person, you'd be talking about things like we have a policy that says that you shall wear fall protection. We have an enforcement mechanism. We have disciplined workers for uh, not wearing fall protection. Though all the workers have the legally required training, it's, those would be the kind of those are the kind of arguments that are heard in courts across the country every day of the week in health and safety prosecutions. But how does that look like for an owner? Remembering an owner has to take this sort of hands-off role or the owner becomes the constructor themselves. Remembering that that was one of the issues in the Sudbury case at trial, which never made its way up to the Supreme Court because uh, the Court of Appeal uh, didn't address that issue for various legal reasons. Um, so what on earth does due diligence um, mean uh, in the context of an owner? Um, the other judges of the, uh, of the Supreme Court, and what I would describe as a rather spirited defense, and obviously I can't walk in here as a uh, 
you know, unbiased party here in light of the fact they're supporting the argument that my client made. But the other the port judge said the entire scheme of the act was designed to say in the context of a constructor, uh, an owner needs to take, was allowed to take a hands-off approach. The belt and braces approach, and that's sort of the, that's the word that's been used in the case law over the years to describe imposing liability on multiple parties, uh, was illusory. What was the benefit in imposing liability on a party that was not responsible for carrying out safety measures? The court uh, was very skeptical that there was any health and safety benefit at all to imposing liability on a party that, who by the design of the very legislative scheme that at least as it had been interpreted by the courts for decades, uh, was not responsible for carrying out safety measures. The dissenting judges, and obviously it doesn't come as a surprise, I would agree with that, found that the ministry's approach would lead to absurd results. I mean, if for those of you who have ever looked on the internet, you'll find uh, what's called the Ministry of Labor Constructor Guideline, where the ministry goes through a number of examples where basically where it shows how an owner should be taking a hands-off approach in order not to be considered the constructor. Basically, the Supreme Court held that employers would put an impossible position for legal duties um, to, would be impossible to fulfill. How would you meet, how would you meet a due diligence standard um, if you're supposed to be taking a hands-off approach? And, 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 one, and one comment I rarely hear courts make, it's really to the credit of these judges in my view, you don't, like, often courts rarely talk about practical realities, but the court made reference to a concern that, okay, even if this due diligence defense is available, how much do you think it costs to launch this a case like that? That if you were, that if, first of all, when what exactly due diligence means in these circumstances is hardly crystal clear. Uh, and secondly, that the costs of that, that the, the costs of having to prove such a thing may just encourage defendants to plead guilty that it's, uh, again, another concern they had was just as a practical matter that defendants would be would be reluctant to uh, uh, spend that kind of money. Ultimately, I suppose one could say that in defense of any case. All right. So, what exactly does the does due diligence look like in these circumstances? Like on the screen is what the Supreme Court's the, the judges that said my client was liable. Uh, it, it, what they would say hypothetically could be due diligence factors. And I want to pause for a moment and say that a judgment of the Supreme Court that's a 4-4 tie is not a binding precedent on any other court. So the, these factors for these, so the, these factors are not binding on two fronts. First of all, the legal issue of what due diligence is or isn't was not before the Supreme Court candidate. The only question that was before the court uh, was whether or not my client was the employer. So this, these comments are, first of all, all in what fancy Latin word lawyers use is obiter dicta, meaning we're not you know, directly, it wasn't before the court, it's a comment about something that's per, that is not, uh, had not been argued by anybody uh, before the court. And secondly, because it's a 4-4 tie, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, ne have pre necessarily have presidential, presidential value. What courts have said about tied judgments in uh, appellate courts, which is not a lot of cases on it, say that it has persuasive value, perhaps highly persuasive value. So you can be certain that judges will look at these comments as to what due diligence means, but they're not necessarily bound by them. My client essentially, I essentially argued on behalf of my client that if one were to, were to technically concede, which the Supreme Court has now and the Court of Appeal have now found, that owners have obligations for health and safety violations on projects that have been contracted to constructors. The due diligence should be nothing more than following the system as set out under the Act, which is to properly contract out to a constructor. And any other measures that, that employer's taken, and there were a number of measures Sudbury took uh, in terms of pre-qualification of a contractor and uh, requiring a certain safety training, that that should amount to due diligence. That was the argument that was advanced. Uh, uh, that was the argument that was advanced at trial. And what exactly due diligence means is actually going back. The Sudbury case is not over. It is going back to the uh, appellate, a lower appellate court, for a ruling on the facts as to whether Sudbury was duly diligent or not. And of course, that ruling is subject to at least two, to at least one level, and possibly two more appeals after that. I mean, we might be here five years from now talking about what the Court of Appeal or even the Supreme Court has said about what uh, due diligence means. Uh, in this context. But for now, what the, these four judges have laid out, at least as ideas for other courts to consider. Delegation of control to a specialized contractor, including pre-screening the contractor's regulatory history and capacity to ensure compliance. I, I think that as a minimum, this is something I agree with the court 100%, assuming that, that, due to, that their illegal obligations exists, which you know I don't concede, but that's now that's what's been found. 
uh, that you have to, uh, you would want to have uh, an assessment of the, first of all, first of all, leaving aside the legal obligations, you don't want to hire a contractor who can't do the job, right? <laughs> Clearly not. And an important part of that job improves safety. Um, the Supreme Court's reference to regulatory history could mean whether they have a history of prior convictions or orders. Uh, that's something you probably want to ask a contractor. I'm not necessarily saying that a prior conviction is disqualifying. I mean, in certain markets, I mean, just using Sudbury as an example, how many companies do you think there are in Northern Ontario that have the capacity to take on that work? I mean, we're, I mean, it may be different. Maybe if you're, you're roofing on your house, maybe there's a dozen companies, but there is a handful of companies that have the resources and the knowledge and frankly, the ability uh, to do that kind of work. So you, everything is going to be very context driven. You may only have a, like the, in public tendering, the evidence was at trial is that people bid and how many bids you get uh, are, are what your options are. Obviously, this work needs to be done. It's a public, I mean, you need to have the roads need to be fixed in downtown suburbs. Someone's got to do it. So uh, uh, th that's a factor. Obviously, informing the constructor of hazards. If, you, if there's some hazards that are within your control on your job site, even beyond designated substances, you're always going to want to inform uh, the employer of those. Uh, monitoring the quality of the constructor's work. Uh, this is, you know, an issue that's going to be challenging, right? It's probably of the court's suggested due diligence measures, the most challenging one, because you have, we already know that you can, you can monitor for quality control, which I think, which I think is fair to say includes safety. But we know that if you sort of jump across the line and start, uh, uh, and start, and start directly disciplining workers and taking a very active role on it, you may very well be treated as the constructor. I'm going to say, I mean, there's been a lot of commentary on this case. I've read some commentary that's alluded to basically take on a full active as if you were the constructor yourself monitoring safety. And yeah, you can do that. But if you do, you're going to be treated as the constructor. I think that the more prudent approach until unless and until a court says otherwise, unless and until a court basically says that, you know, you have similar obligations to the constructor, in which case the, the constructor uh, provisions are in essence meaningless at that point. That could happen. It could. But in, uh, unless and until that happens, I think the better uh, approach is to certainly have your people on site monitoring for safety, but uh, certainly dealing with that, not dealing with workers directly, dealing with the general contractor directly about, uh, uh, about about safety concerns. I mean, monitoring the quality of the constructor's work and how that interacts with the delegation of control is a very complicated issue. Um, it's a law school exam issue, frankly. Uh, so I think uh, uh, that is one of the more challenging aspects of uh, this decision. So how does an owner not cross the line and become the constructor when monitoring a project? Uh, again, I'm going to take my comments are is these are just based upon my thoughts in general, not the thoughts of the city of Sudbury or really anywhere else. But I, I, I think that exercising a level of, that, that exercising a, a level of significant hands on control over a project, you will be treated as the constructor. The test has not changed. I mean, the courts the courts have always imposed uh, a control test in, in determining the identity of the constructor. So if you're running the show or seem to be taking a, a significant a significant level of control, uh, that be that I think you'll be treated as the constructor. I think a higher level monitoring for safety uh, when you have your individuals uh, on the project is the uh, is the better approach. I think the emphasis on due diligence for an owner has got to be on that pre qualification part. But you just don't want to, and, and, and some of it is some of it's going to be common sense. I'll give you an example. What, what if you, for example, are a school and you hire a roofing company to redo the roof and you're the principal of that school, you show up and there's a bunch of guys in t-shirts, hats, running shoes, no um, fall protection, no, gu no guarding, nothing. That, when you look at that, it seems to me, one need not be an expert in construction to think something is amiss here. That might be an example of where, you know, you, just, you shut the job down and get on the phone uh, with the owner. Um, but rarely, uh, rarely is a construction violation so flagrant. I mean, that's almost bordering on criminal, uh, the scenario that I, uh, that I just described. So, I mean, you're not going to be, hopefully, in that situation very often uh, where, um, uh, where you uh, would have to do that. But that's what you would want to do is shut the job down. I mean, again, I think that, you're, uh, I think that your monitoring uh, is focused on quality control. If there's a safety issue that you see, you identify it with the general contract. I will say there are some other people that would suggest that a better approach to due diligence would be to hire a safety consultant to be there uh, monitoring the job at all times for safety compliance. Uh, again, uh, that is a debatable that is a debatable point. Certainly, would significantly increased costs of construction, and arguably could be said, depending on how one looked at it, as usurping the role of the constructor. Is the owner obliged to hire a specialist? 
Well, you're certainly the law obliges you, as we know from the Supreme Court's uh, certainly suggests that you should be pre-qualifying someone to make sure they can do the work that they can. The kind of thing, the, the, the basic stuff you would always do, like clearance certificates, which just speaks to paying WSIB premiums if there's a license required to do the work, which there is. Like, you certainly don't want to be hiring an unlicensed contractor, for example. So if, you have, if you're hiring someone to do an electrical job, you would want to certainly verify they have a license from the Electrical Safety Authority. Failing to do so is obviously problematic from any number of perspectives. But those are the kind of things that, uh, that, that you'd want to look at. But you're going to have to just do your best to evaluate what you're dealing with. Anyone who is not an expert in construction procurement has a, just has a certain degree of, uh, of, uh, of common sense that has, to be, that has to be exercised. Is it more challenging for larger and more sophisticated owners to make the control argument? In other words, I mean, the, court, the way the court put it out, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I think at the end of the day, unless you really are in the, the core construction business, I mean, obviously the city of Sudbury, just using them as an example, like any other municipality of that size, is a large and sophisticated employer that employs a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of different things. That being said, the, uh, at trial, the uh, you know the, the city's director of public works testified that they they are not in the road building business. They don't have the owner internal expertise to do it. So they, like most other municipalities, have chosen to contract that out work to experts. That that decision it was, it was considered. Is this something we could, that we should could or should do in house? Uh, and that's and we made they came to the same decision that virtually every other municipality does for a major construction project. I mean, obviously particularly bigger municipalities may do some construction work internally that they choose not to contract out. Maybe they're putting together a bus shelter, for example, things like that. But, uh, uh, but, but at the end of the day, uh, contracting out to, a, to an expert um, is permitted. And in fact, in the case of building a road, I argue probably entirely necessary. Is an OHSA record uh, disqualifying? for a potential contractor. If, someone, if a contractor tells you, you ha we have a record under the OHSA, do we have to, can we have to say that's it? I, I personally don't think so. I'm gonna say that it may very well be, you just, you want to um, assess that as a factor. So if an employer has a, uh, has a conviction, you wanna know how old was the conviction, what it was for, what were the, what were the facts, uh, and issues along those lines. Do you have to disclose hazards beyond the strict requirements of the OHSA? Yeah, I think that's essential. You got to go well beyond designated substances. You you know about a uh, you know about a hazard. You have to uh, uh, you should be communicating that. Should we dispense with using a constructor altogether? At the, at this point, no. Unless and until basically any court, a, a final court of appeal says that you essentially have the same obligations as the constructor to be day to day responsible for compliance by every employer on the job and every worker on the job, in which case there is no distinction and you're stuck with being a constructor and it's a risk you then would have to manage. I still think it's a good idea to follow the historic structure of uh, contracting out to a third party if you're not in a position yourself uh, to have that liability. Will employers simply plead guilty to avoid the cost of a trial? Possibly, okay, I, I can't. How does an owner establish a standard of care in procurement of constructors? There's no easy answer to that, but I think the kind of evidence you're going to hear is you may, in fact, be obliged to call expert evidence to say an employer, you know, this is what a reasonable employer would do, and this is what's done in the industry. Uh, Sudbury didn't call an expert at trial, but certainly did call a highly experienced uh, uh, public works commissioner who testified that this is what I did, and this is what I understand, similar to what everybody else does in the municipal industry. What level of uh, monitoring is required? Well, uh, I, I, I think you want to at least continue to engage your historic monitoring for quality control. I would not recommend saying, let's stop sending quality control inspectors. I've heard that out there and you don't want to do that because I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't help you. You're still liable by contracting for the constructor. Whether you send quality control inspectors or not, doesn't matter um, for that liable. How is the owner supposed to understand what is required? Well, I think what you want to do is to the very best you can follow common sense. And there may be times in a specific complex situation, give us a call. If there, uh, we can, uh, we can give you a, uh, uh, some advice um, to close it out. I'm hoping one day uh, uh, this issue, we may get a clear answer for the Supreme court one day or another uh, about whether the city's is in fact liable. It's clearly a debate amongst the judges. There's also, there's, I also hear there's a political movement afoot. It may very well be, this is an issue the Ontario legislature has to fix by just simply amending the act to make it clear what the definitions are one way or another, whether they make it more clear that an employer, uh, uh, what, to spell out exactly what those obligations are.
uh, and that uh, that is a possibility. Lastly, we have to question whether owners will be an enforcement priority for the Ministry of Labor, whether we'll get a flood of these cases, or Sudbury was just a bit of an out- was just a bit of an outlier. Uh, that that remains to be seen. We just don't know. I mean, I, I, it doesn't seem to me from a public safety perspective it ought to be a significant priority, but we'll, uh, that remains to be seen. So those are my comments on the Sudbury case. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> Another example of the Supreme Court muddying the legal waters seems to be every time they touch a case, it just creates more questions than answers, but Anyway, that's just my two cents on the whole matter. Uh, our next speaker is my partner, Jeremy Schwartz. A significant part of Jeremy's uh, practice, actually a growing part of his practice, is workplace investigations. And um, uh, these days, that's something that comes up uh, ever more frequently with uh, added duties in dealing with, for example, harassment cases. Um, so over to you, Jeremy. Thanks, Lance. <clears throat> there we go. So as, as Landon said, uh, a, a fairly, depending on the year, significant part of my practice um, is either helping employers dealing with harassment or violence complaints, um, helping them with their hazard assessments and working out their policies and changes over the time, or actually dealing with um, the investigation myself. Um, sometimes I'll assist in the background by retaining the investigator on behalf of the client and we'll find a third party who'll come in to preserve privilege. And sometimes I'll go in myself um, and deal with it. Uh, the, the difference in, in approach depends on the circumstances, uh, the likelihood of litigation, things like that. Um, I will say that, you know, Me Too had a big impact on, on some of the nature of the kinds of complaints that you're getting, but really any form of harassment might be a kind that you have a duty under various pieces of legislation to investigate. And so um, I, I, I know that uh, uh, the folks in this room might be tapped or might have already been tapped and the people listening at home or at the office might have already been tapped to oversee an investigation. Either it was coworkers or it was a member of management or even an owner who's accused of wrongdoing. Um, and uh, it's not uh, confined to unionized settings. It's not confined to places where a grievance is permissible. It's not confined to uh, sexual harassment. There's all different sorts of forms and often employees uh, uh, subjective belief that they are being harassed or treated unfairly uh, creates a, a motivation for them to lash out. Um, and sometimes they're telling the truth. And so unfortunately, it, it falls on the investigator in circumstances which are often a he said, she said, um, to try to figure out what is the likely thing that happened here. Do we think that the, the complaint is, is substantiated or do we think that there, it really is a coin toss and we're not going to find that this individual committed some heinous or, or, or uh, uh, bad act, um, which will have disciplinary or even employment consequences for them if we can't prove it a little bit more uh, firmly? And of course, what happens when uh, you make your decision you're going to discipline, you're going to find there is insufficient evidence, you're going to have training. Uh, the next step might be litigation, might be somebody quits, might be a human rights complaint, might be wrongful dismissal litigation. So what you do in, in this little microcosm of an investigation, how you rely on the findings of your investigator, how, how you conduct that investigation, and um, the, the, the feeling of all parties as to whether or not they got a fair hearing during that investigation um, is going to be critical. Um, obviously, some people will never accept that they did anything wrong. And so there might be nothing you can do other than sticking to your guns and finding as impartially and objectively as you can um, what happened. So generally speaking, uh, there are a number of different areas where harassment uh, can, can arise. So there's the general uh, sort of uh, uh, workplace harassment definitions um, in the uh, Human Rights Code. And these, these ones uh, are divided between workplace harassment and workplace sexual harassment. Sorry, these are from the Health and Safety Act. Um, it's essentially the same definition, okay, in the Human Rights Code. The only difference is under human rights legislation, it has to be harassment 
in respect of one of the grounds that are prohibited from discrimination under the Human Rights Code. But otherwise, the actual uh, engaging in a course of vexatious conduct or comment, which can be a course of conduct that happens over time. Someone says, knock it off. You don't knock it off. Um, they or, or you don't say anything, but they should have known. Um, or it could be one serious incident that's so obvious to everyone that it's inappropriate, but that alone can be harassment. So workplace harassment, though, under the Health and Safety Act expressly, thankfully, although this this exclusion is not in the Human Rights Code, it should, frankly, should be, does not mean a reasonable action taken by an employer or supervisor relating to the management and direction of workers or the workplace. So legitimate, bona fide, professionally implemented performance management, that's a mouthful, is lawful and is not harassment. Now, that's not going to convince employees who are constantly being performance managed because they're underperforming or have behavioral problems, they'll feel they're being singled out and they'll call that harassment. That's obviously why the the legislature felt it was important to put this exclusion in the Health and Safety Act. Um, But if you're acting as an investigator or you're considering the fruits of an investigation, you have to decide, was it harassment? Well, if it's an employee about their supervisor or manager, you have to look at those circumstances. Was this just bona fide and legitimate performance management or behavioral management? And was it implemented in a bona fide professional manner? So you can you can have an employee who's underperforming and you can have the legal right to performance manage those concerns. But if you do so by cracking the whip and old schooling the thing, you're going to have a problem. Uh, that's simply not tolerated in the modern workplace. So if you've got managers and supervisors who are old school like that, and we just sort of look the other way and we say, oh, Joey, that's just that that's just how he does things. I pick on Joey. Everyone who's had a presentation or seminar with me will know there's always a Joey who gets kicked uh, for being the bad actor. Um, so Joey in this scenario has been in the company for 60 years and he just does things the way he does things. And everyone knows and uh, we just we, we just expect the employees to grin and bear it. Well, Joey is a liability and he's probably harassing people in his performance management, even when it's for legitimate reasons. And as an employer, you've got to make sure that they, that even if there are legitimate performance uh, management goals and issues, that they're handled in a professional manner. It's 2023. So. When you're sitting in, a, in, in, your, in your office and you're looking over a report or an employee comes in and says, here's what happened, you have to make a decision. Could this complaint, this person comes in and says, so-and-so said this to me last week, I told them it wasn't appropriate, they came back this week, they did it again. You have to decide, is that harassment? And then the other duties may or may not be triggered. So. Thankfully, it's an objective test, okay? So it's um, whether the conduct was known or ought reasonably to be known to be unwelcome, okay? So what is what is a reasonable person in the circumstances? Uh, unfortunately, until you get to the Human Rights Tribunal or a court, you're just going to have to use your own common sense, okay? So if you think in an ordinary workplace in 2023, in the context of these parties, that the things that were said or done that everybody knows that's completely inappropriate and that's harassment, if that's sort of the smell test to you, then I think you have to conclude that it's very likely that that's exactly what happened, that this person should have known that this was unwelcome conduct, especially if they were told the first time, the second time, the third time to knock it off, um, and they didn't. Um, Now, one of those issues, though, is what is reasonable, right? So if you're working in a workplace where people are often joking around, where people have relationships outside of work, uh, which can sometimes spill over into the workplace, um, these sorts of issues, the dynamic of the workers between them can be a problem. Um, In a sexual harassment case, the fact that the workers uh, like to hug each other, does that mean now that uh, one of the uh, uh, workers can grab the uh, buttocks of another worker. I like saying buttocks like that. Um, no, I mean, of, of, of course not. That's not going to be appropriate, right? Um, but the, the person who did the buttocks grabbing, are, are should, is it reasonable for them to know that it was inappropriate? Well, she always comes in the morning and gives me a big hug. 
I thought it was okay. That's just the way we do things. I've had a couple of cases like this. That's why I raised that example. The answer that I give on the phone when someone calls me with that question, is this harassment? Is yes, that's that's inappropriate and he should have known better. Um, and no, she didn't have to tell him not to grab her butt. It wasn't okay. Um, responding. You have to assess the seriousness of that report. Now, you may have a legal obligation to conduct an investigation, but the first thing you need to do after you say to yourself, okay, um, could this be harassment if these allegations are true as alleged? Well, if the answer is yes, it could be, you need to immediately decide what to do about it, right? So first things first, um, is it really serious? Do you have an injury? Is there a risk of immediate harm? Is this is someone saying that their spouse has come to the workplace and they're being abused at home and now this person is coming in the morning? That's actually how these sections got into the Health and Safety Act in the first place. Is somebody was murdered at the workplace at a hospital in 2006, which led to all these changes in 2008, adding workplace violence, harassment, and domestic violence um, uh, protections into the act. Is there a risk of escalation. So are these people always getting at each other and now they, they were almost uh, you know, into fisticuffs or did somebody actually uh, throw a punch? Um, prior behavior or incidents. You want to look at, has this been sort of a, a festering problem in the workplace or in a department? Is this a volcano? Sorry for all the folks uh, who are living near one right now. Uh, is this a volcano that is going to erupt imminently? Okay. Um, so obviously, if if it's appropriate, call nine one one. Right? There's there's there there. You are responsible to take all precautions reasonable in the circumstances to protect your workers. You are not yourself a police officer. If it's gotten to that point, call nine one one. Okay. Um, contact your delegated internal management. So you should have somebody in your health and safety program who is assigned to make these sorts of decisions. It might be you, the folks uh, uh, who are listening to my presentation. It might be someone else. Maybe you have a health and safety manager, and that's the person who makes the call. You're going to want to have somebody whose hand is on the joystick deciding which way this investigation goes, and they'll often liaise with HR um, to make the decisions about what happens as a result, of course, or, or more senior management, depending on the circumstances. But you're going to want someone who's properly trained who can address it. Um, you want to contact others if it's appropriate, obviously, and deal with that. Now, if it's relatively minor harassment, you want to explore options for resolution with the alleged harasser. So sometimes we can talk it out. Right. Sometimes an investigation is you sit people down in a room together and you say, hey, what? It's kind of like, you know, two kids in kindergarten. What did you do? What did you? OK, can you say you're sorry? Promise not to do it again. You do it in a professional way without being condescending the way I just did it. But um, the reality is often adults can be adult about things. Um, and when ultimately the uh, uh, issue is concluded and there's an a, a agreement on how we're going to proceed, um, you will have a separate meeting, of course, with that alleged harasser. And you'll say, look, we expect you to abide by this agreement. And if this happens again, then the response isn't going to be a quick apology. There'll be discipline up to and including termination. And you'll make that very clear. Um, one thing that's come out, which I just wanted to touch on uh, briefly, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the employment standards update later in the day, uh, for those of you, hopefully, who all hang around to the lightning round at three o'clock. Uh, but uh, there, there was in December of 2022 in the U.S., the Speak Out Act, which invalidated uh, non-disclosure agreements um, in cases of sexual um, assault and sexual harassment in the workplace. And this was done because it was uh, found after many years that there were serial harassers and serial uh, uh, violent offenders, frankly, people who were raping other people and doing other terrible things who were getting away with it because of these non-disclosure agreements. So one woman would complain, typically it was a woman, though it's not always the case, um, and then she would sign a non-disclosure agreement in exchange for money. Now, the, the problem with this is that for a corporation, really the only apology they can give aside from firing the person who did the bad thing often is to provide some money to the individual to compensate them. What else can a company do aside from saying we're sorry, right? I mean, re realistically, that you try to make the person whole um, as best you can. Um, and as long as if it wasn't you know, the owner of the company that did the sexual harassing, 
uh, then what you're doing is apologizing for a member of management typically who's done something that was unlawful. And what do you get in exchange as the company? Well, you, you don't want this becoming the talk of the town. You don't want your reputation to be damaged. Um, that manager might have done something bad, but perhaps they're a senior and they've been there for 30 years and you don't want to get sued. So you, you couldn't let them go. So you're trying to keep this situation contained. You're trying to uh, do right by the victim, but you also want confidentiality also to protect the victim from reprisals in the workplace is, is a genuine concern. Unfortunately, when these laws are passed, there's disadvantages and advantages. So, uh, you know, the advantage is we might prevent serial uh, uh, people, uh, sort of serial offenders from doing what they're doing. Uh, one of the disadvantages, of course, is there may be less settlements. There may be less appetite in companies to just accept the allegations. They may instead decide, well, you know what? We did our investigation. We really didn't find these allegations were made out. We're not just going to believe the victim because then we're, we're not going to get a settlement with a confidentiality clause. We're going to fight all the way and just see whether the tribunal agrees with us. Right. And I think that's the unfortunate result is going to be that a lot of a lot of victims don't get the they're going to end up uh, quitting. I think, because they're not going to get a deal because the company won't be willing to settle because they can't have confidentiality in the terms. But Ontario has announced that they're going to think about this. You know, they, they seem to be every week they're having a new conference to talk about all the fancy things they're going to do for workers. Um, so they're going to they're, they're thinking about doing this. They're going to put together committees and, and study the, the possibility of NDAs. Uh, I mentioned before prohibitive grounds of discrimination. And so, sorry, I've lost the uh, just want to make sure on my time we don't have a clock up here so i'm done at 10.05 got it so uh prohibited grounds of discrimination are the ones listed in the human rights code uh now the thing about the prohibited grounds is that there are all those white lines in between these various grounds that's where the courts can essentially create new versions that they think uh, are, are similar enough to these prohibited grounds that are expressly there um, in order to address them. So, uh, you know, originally it was gender, then it became gender identity and expression, but the courts had already and the human rights tribunals had already started looking at those kinds of add-ons or, or, or subcategories. Um, so again, the, the only difference between harassment under the sort of uh, uh, Health and Safety Act or a general civil uh, complaint in the courts, and one that's under the Human Rights Code is that it has to engage one of these bases. So it's, it's, it's a, a harassment on the basis of someone's age, it's a joke about their ethnicity, um, it's, it's uh, any, anything like that, okay? Um, but it doesn't make the test any less objective. It's simply that to fall under the Human Rights Code, it has to engage one of those grounds. So this was a case um, that I like to uh, sort of, it gives you a general idea of how these sorts of things um, arise. So in AM and Kellogg, the uh, allegations were of sexual solicitation advan advances. There was a pattern of behavior. Uh, so this is the, the applicant uh, constantly getting, oh, you look, you look beautiful today. What a nice dress, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the, the uh, assailant, we'll call him the assailant because just sounds good. I'm asking for hugs. Um, the applicant was just a probationary employee. The respondent was the senior manager. So a senior manager with a probationary employee, how's that probationary employee going to feel when they're uh, trying to hold on to this new job and someone is asking uh, uh, for hugs in the workplace and commenting about how they look? A question about the reasonableness. Uh, should, should the respondent have known that this wasn't okay? There was some discussion about how some people in the workplace hug. There's some discussion about how it's a friendly atmosphere and people uh, you know, might say, oh, you look nice today in, in, in the workplace. This was a probationary employee. She wasn't part of that office culture. But again, that office culture argument really doesn't hold when you cross the line of that objective, what is okay, what is not okay. Uh, behavior-wise. Uh, now, given the power imbalance, though, this was particularly problematic, right? So if two co-workers uh, working in the same department, neither of which had any authority over the other, had made comments like this, it probably wouldn't have been appropriate. Um, asking for a hug, um, the person uh, perhaps uh, might have said to them, you know, knock it off. I really don't feel comfortable with that. If that hadn't been respected, then it would have been harassment. Um, but these sorts of things would either not be harassment or would be less serious if it wasn't for the power imbalance. Because of the power imbalance in this case, there's no way that this probationary employee could have consented or felt 
that they could have come forward and said, I feel uncomfortable with you telling me that um, uh, I look nice today and asking me for a hug. And it's, there are some people who have the, the, the fortitude to do that and they're, they're fine losing the job they just got after six months of looking and other people will grin and bear it because they need the job and no one should be put in that position. And that's what happened in this case. So the respondent took advantage of this, of this imbalance. Um, the harassment had a significant impact on their job prospects. So this individual was, was actually over, over their probationary period. It was a constant problem. She ended up withdrawing from the workplace entirely for many months, almost a year, um, and, and ended up in counseling. $75,000 injury to dignity, feelings, and self-respect. So um, if you're thinking about right now, the manager that you have at the office who's really touchy-feely and friendly with everybody, perhaps overly so, and that is a cultural thing in your workplace, maybe you need to give some thought to whether that individual needs some training on how the law works in 2023 before your organization is paying $75,000 to a probationary employee who didn't want to hug their boss. Okay. Damages awards are on the rise. Every time you come to one of these conferences with us, we tell you that these, these, these are trending upward. Um, that, that tends to be the case. We don't yet have American size awards, but we're, we're on our way, right? Um, the, the factors are going to be the seriousness of harassment, the impact on the victim, and whether the investigation um, was conducted. So talk a little bit about the meat and potatoes here. Um, you have a duty to investigate when you believe that the complaint that has come in or you're aware of something, but no one is actually saying, I want to file a complaint. They don't actually have to formally file one. Um, might be harassment in the circumstances. As their employer, you have a legal obligation to conduct an investigation when you have reason to believe in good faith that there has been workplace harassment. Um, the, the, the measure of investigation will depend on the severity of the incident. What are we talking about here? Can it just be a conversation? Does it have to be we bring in a third party investigator and we start gathering evidence, right? Um, you want to ensure the complainant and the alleged harasser are informed in writing of any corrective action. So often people make a complaint, it goes into the black box. Maybe you did a whole bunch of things after the investigation to make sure it doesn't happen again, but you're concerned about their privacy of the harasser and all these sorts of other things. That's a really bad idea. And by law, you're not required to maintain confidentiality there. So frankly, if someone harasses somebody else, they've lost the right to not have people, or at least the person they harassed, be aware of the steps you took um, to address those um, mis misconduct. Um, you want to ensure your harassment program is reviewed at least annually. And keep in mind, a health and safety inspector, at least in Ontario, and there are a few other provinces, actually have the right to come in and issue an order that requires you not just to investigate, but to hire a third party investigator at your cost to come in and conduct an investigation. So you certainly want to head that up at the pass. Um, and if it can be done internally or with an investigator you would prefer to use, um, then that is a good idea. Uh, failure to investigate at all can lead to human rights damages. So in this case, ben, uh, uh, Bento and Minito, uh, in this particular case, this employee was terminated because the brother of the owner really didn't believe these allegations about their brother. And eventually, uh, after the investigation was never done, this employee's employment was terminated for essentially acting out. Like they, they were upset, they were unhappy. It, it caused them to uh, uh, be either be a behavioral issue in the workplace um, and it, that, that precipitated their termination. The Human Rights Tribunal found it was the failure to investigate that exacerbated the tensions and issues in the workplace. And that, that, that category alone was a $20,000 damage award just because it was the, the, not for the wrongful termination because it wasn't a discriminatory termination. It was for failing to investigate, which precipitated the poisonous work environment uh, continuing. So the employer essentially condoned this poisonous work environment that was created. Um, Calistro and Tibetel, uh, the employer rehired a former employee accused of sexual harassment before, told nobody about it. Then this person did it again. And the um, uh, uh, um, uh, employee sued and, and uh, was awarded damages for constructive dismissal. And so in this case, the employer failed to conduct the investigation. The first time the employee was there, the employee just left. They brought them back and didn't warn anyone, didn't provide any training, 
And so sort of that, that procedural failure to conduct a proper investigation and to deal with the results of that investigation led to the liability, not the harassment itself. That's a, another part of those decisions, the damages for that, but the, the failure to conduct an investigation and address the problems that you find. Um, you want to respond promptly. There are cases where waiting too long to conduct an investigation itself can be a violation of the duty. And when I say what is too long, there's no bright line, but certainly you only want to take a reasonable pause and you can ask the alleged harasser to stay out of the workplace if necessary uh, while the investigation is taking place. But certainly if that goes on for too long, they'll sue you for constructive dismissal, right? So you need to be diligent, you need to act in good faith, and you need to be prompt. Uh, don't wait for a formal internal complaint, especially in, in very sensitive uh, uh, complaints. You might have someone come into your office in tears, tell you about their problem, but say, I don't want you to do anything about it. I'm sorry. They didn't come to you as a friend. They came to you as the employer, as HR, whatever your, your hat is you're wearing in the workplace. The employer is now aware that harassment likely has occurred in the workplace. That triggers the duty. You have no choice. You can't just respect that individual's uh, request, but you can say to them, we'll do our utmost to ensure that this is treated confidentially, but ultimately the accused harasser is going to be allowed to know what it is that they're accused of doing. And that will necessarily mean knowing who's accused them. Um, the scope of the investigation, of course, will depend on, are we talking about historical abuse going back five, 10 years, or are we just talking about what happened two weeks ago? Um, then that might be the very precise investigation we conduct. Um, when you respond first, is it harassment? So you have to decide, right? We have the objective test. If it's harassment, you deal with it. If it's not harassment, you say so. Um, and you do your best and you act as unbiased as you can. Um, you want to look for the existence of any threats. You want to think about the history between the employees. Is there some fundamental animosity between them? Is there persistence in this negative behavior? And of course, we want to know, is this an investigation just under health and safety or general complaints? Or is this also a human rights aspect? Because that could trigger any number of other kinds of remedies uh, that might be appropriate. Do you want to retain a third party investigator? So first, are they serious? Is there a possibility that you're going to be biased? Is it the president of the company who's accused of misconduct or a member of the board of directors? The HR manager probably isn't the right person to conduct that investigation. That person is likely not competent to do so, even under health and safety law. And how are you protecting the organization when you can't feel independent in your role as an investigator because you can't speak truth to power without putting your own job in jeopardy? Um, allegations in me involving members of HR. Um, you want to look at the uh, inexperience. So if you yourself or the person who's going to conduct the investigation really hasn't done enough of them, and it's a really serious investigation that is going to require some expertise and experience, bring in someone uh, you trust who knows what they're doing. And of course, the likelihood of litigation. It's always important you get it right, but when it's likely to lead in, in, into litigation, it's even more important that we conduct a thorough investigation and no one can say, you failed to talk to these three witnesses or gather this evidence I told you about. And so your findings were biased against me. And now you're terminating me for harassing this person when I have, uh, I, I have uh, evidence that shows I didn't do it. I couldn't, I, I wasn't even there. I was on vacation. Why didn't you look at the evidence I submitted? That's the sort of thing that leads you into a court a case, not only with the person who's alleging harassment, but the person you just fired for the harassment that never happened. Okay. Um, so when you're conducting your own investigation, though, you want to preserve that evidence. Evidence can be hard evidence. Evidence can be electronic evidence. Electronic evidence has metadata. So it's not just printing off a copy of an email. It's preserving the digital copy of that email, which proves when it was sent from where to where. Um, if someone has a cell phone that they were using while they were in a location and they're telling you they didn't, uh, they weren't even there, the cell phone might have tower data that you can pull off the phone or there might be phone records. You want to gather that early and then deal with the investigation and review process after that. Of course, you conduct witness, witness interviews and you're going to need to report your conclusions. So... Um, Employees have a duty to cooperate legally as their employer. It's your policy. You tell them you have to be here. We will protect you from reprisals, but you can't just leave. You don't have the right to have a lawyer present. And sometimes uh, collective agreements will allow unionized employees to have a 
representative from the union present. Whenever I have the opportunity, I always try to prevent that. But there are a lot of collective agreements where that's just an obligation. Um, now, failure to cooperate may be grounds for discipline up to and including termination for a worker during this process. Common missteps. Uh, you don't you don't conduct the investigation promptly. You wait around. Uh, you keep it. You fail to keep an open mind uh, during the process. You, you don't get enough detail from witnesses and you have to meet with them over and over again. You don't interview everyone that is relevant to the investigation um, and you fail to document your process and take appropriate remedial steps when you're done. So this is sort of a, a review of, the, of, of how you're going to administer discipline. Everyone here who administers discipline knows the general process, but essentially you want to make sure that when that discipline is challenged in court, for example, um, that you can substantiate it um, and you can demonstrate that it was reasonable and based on an unbiased investigation um, that was done properly. And these are sort of the factors to consider, of course, when you're going to just implement this point. Um, how, how serious is it? What is the length of service? And uh, have the, has the employee expressed remorse and promised not to do it again? These are obviously important factors, but if the incident was serious enough, uh, that may not be enough, even if they're a very long service employee. Thank you very much. That's my time. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, uh, you may remember the pandemic. I know it's been a little while now, but um, yeah, uh, the pandemic may be over, but just like COVID-19 is still with us, so are the legal uh, consequences of the pandemic, which uh, uh, our next speaker, my partner, Jeff Murray, is going to be speaking to. Okay. Can you hear me okay? All right. So... The experience with the pandemic, I think for a lot of us is feeling your way in the dark and trying to do the best thing. And frankly, having to embrace the fact that you didn't have all the answers and you didn't have a very clear roadmap to make the decisions you had to make in real time. And I think a lot of Employers uh, heard from their legal counsel that we can use uh, general legal principles that are long established, but this really is a crisis of first instance, and we're going to do the best we can um, and find out later uh, if the legal system, in fact, endorses the decisions that have been made throughout the pandemic. And so topic of my presentation is COVID vaccine policies. The future is finally here. And this is essentially intended to be a retrospective on what happened and where we ultimately landed on some of the most fundamental issues in the pandemic. I remember uh, in February 2020 um, being asked questions about, well, you know, can we use these uh, temperature monitors on people's foreheads? You know, is that just too intrusive? Uh, and the answer was, well, you know, well, I, I think you should do it. And if there's a problem later, we'll deal with it later. And then a year and a half comes by and we have vaccines and employers want to know, can we require employees to get vaccines? And of course, the answer was, it depends on your particular enterprise uh, and what the alternatives are to vaccination. But assuming the right factors are there and it's a proportional response, we think you can do it. And so uh, we now have answers to all the questions that were in front of us uh, going in. And I think it's a useful uh, exercise to look back and see where we were and where we've ultimately landed. And so today I'm going to uh, basically talk about three topics. Um, one was the whole policies that were implemented uh, as soon as Vaccines were widely available in Ontario in approximately September of uh, 2021. Um, the issue that really, 
that's issue one. Issue two is the uh, concern that employers obviously had with what happens if the, the employees don't take the vaccine and we don't allow them into the workplace. Is that legal? Is that constructive dismissal? Uh, is that something we're going to get a grievance for? Is it something we can do? And finally, uh, at what point can you actually terminate somebody for not getting the vaccine? Fortunately, uh, there has not been a, a long litany of terminations um, and employers across the country uh, to the employer have acted reasonably in dealing with the non-compliant um, employees that were anti-vax. And um, so we don't actually have a lot of cases dealing with terminations, but we do have an answer to the question of whether you can terminate somebody for uh, not getting the vaccine. Uh, before I go into more detail on each of these topics, I think it's important to just sort of go through uh, where we were and how we progressed through time. Uh, this is uh, These are dates that we all, um, if we choose to remember them, we'll remember them. But looking back, it may actually seem like quite a blur. So it's, it's, it's worthwhile kind of looking at uh, where we were and when we were at various stages. So obviously, the first case of COVID uh, identified in Canada it was identified on March 25th, 2020. Um, that was sort of just a news report. Nobody really knew uh, the significance of that. Fast forward six weeks later, and we have a state of emergency declared in Ontario. And I think we all remember where we were on the night of March uh, 17, trying to figure out what's going to happen the next day at our various workplaces. Uh, that state of affairs continued until May 2020, and then a gradual reopening commenced, uh, and the state of emergency was lifted in the summer. That's when we had all the outdoor uh, restaurants open on the side of the road. Uh, unfortunately, we had the second wave begin in September of that year, and finally, to a great um, um, to palpable relief, Health Canada approves the first vaccine. Sorry, my coordination's not that good. I'm getting over long COVID, so I hope you'll forgive me. Um, second state of emergency in January, 2021, back to the future, uh, lifted very quickly third state of emergency in April 2021. Uh, shortly after that, half of all Ontarians, like uh, mostly the ones uh, at highest risk, have received the first dose of the vaccine. Third state of emergency gets lifted in May 2021. Second dose becomes widely available in June uh, 2021. And then vaccine passports are implemented by the provincial governments across Canada. And with respect, that really is the game changer that frames my um, presentation concerning mandatory vaccinations. Because here we had the provincial governments mandate that employee, that citizens have the vaccine if they're gonna function fully in society. And that caused employers to ask themselves, well, if the government's doing this to say, uh, I need to do this in order to go to a restaurant, go to the grocery store, what's unreasonable for me to require this of my employees? And so we saw uh, in the fall of 2021, uh, mandatory vaccination policies being rolled out across the country. Um, and with boosters widely available by the end of that year, uh, it was really the cause, uh, uh, it was the default of just about most employers. We then see uh, within three months, vaccine passports and mandatory mask requirements lifted. And so the, the, the real intense period of time with respect to mandatory vaccination policies was this uh, fourth quarter of uh, uh, 2021 and the first quarter of 2022. So uh, starting in September 2021, most employers, I'll say many employers, began to roll out mandatory VAX policies. Um, and those policies had two real uh, fundamental uh, components to it. One was uh, if you didn't get the vaccine, you were on an unpaid leave. 
Uh, we're not aware of any employer that said immediately, if you don't get the vaccine, you're fired. Uh, everybody seems to have said, okay, we're going to hit the pause button on you and you're going to stay at home. You're not going to work. You're not going to get paid. And we're going to see if uh, things change and uh, we'll hold back from terminating you. Uh, notwithstanding very high vaccination rates amongst employees, unions um, grieved many of these policies under collective agreements. And I would say they did that uh, with a heavy heart uh, and without uh, their um, without really being into the issue, I'll put it to you that way, that there was a minority of their members that were very anti-vax. And in order to represent them, they grudgingly filed grievances and took them to arbitration. And it was in November 2021 that we saw our first uh, awards come out concerning whether these policies were um, legitimate and could be enforced. The, the second element of these policies, of course, had the mandatory human rights uh, safety valve so that if requiring someone to take the vaccine was contrary to the human rights code, generally with respect to uh, an established medical exemption or a uh, exemption based on creed, uh, then employees were uh, uh, entitled to accommodation uh, if that is was in fact possible to the apport of undue hardship. And it was only after these uh, policies came out and arbitrators in the labor um, collective and grievance environment had pronounced on their enforceability did the courts uh, begin to uh, hear and decide cases concerning the consequences of these policies in the non-union environment, particularly whether uh, these, uh, if someone who had been terminated um, was justifiably terminated pursuant to the doctrine of frustration of contract, uh, or whether placing somebody on an indefinite leave was a uh, constructive dismissal. So the first uh, part here is to sort of just go through uh, where the arbitration law uh, developed uh, in the early days of 2022. Um, and we should ask ourselves, why are we looking at arbitration decisions here and not looking at court decisions? The court decisions came uh, later in at the end of 2022 and the beginning of 2023. The answer for that is that um, in a unionized workplace, the collective agreement is the contract in effect that can be enforced uh, while the employment relationship is continuing. Uh, employees can file grievances against their employer's policies uh, and get an adjudication on those issues. Uh, employees that are subject to an individual contract of employment, however, don't have that liberty of going off to court and saying, hey, can my employer do this, judge? And the judge says, well, no, or yes. Um, and so that's why the law really was developed by labor arbitrators. Obviously, non-union employers kept a very sharp eye on these decisions because it foreshadowed uh, what the legal thinking was concerning the reasonableness of these policies and justifiably um, assume that the courts would take some guidance from these cases of first instance. And so um, these labor arbitration decisions were relevant, not just to the unionized employers, but to the non-unionized employers. So there were a lot of cases in the last um, uh, two years dealing with the uh, enforceability of mandatory VAX policies. I'm going to talk about four that I think are representative of all the issues that arose in that context. Uh, the first one, and I'll go through them sequentially. Uh, the first one I would suggest of most significance is the Power Workers versus Alexicon Energy, Inc. Uh, that case involved a relatively, I'll say a mid-sized employer uh, that provided electricity to communities in central Ontario and employed 273 employees, some of whom worked outdoors. Obviously, some of them worked indoors. Uh, the employer implemented the VAX policy and mandatory, mandated two, um, uh, two doses plus a boost booster, subject to the normal uh, human rights safety valve exemptions. The union, when the employer uh, implemented the policy, objected and basically put firmly in front of the arbitrator this question. 
the argument that the vaccine did not prevent the spread of uh, COVID any better than other less intrusive means, particularly masking, mandatory testing, and distancing. And so the union's argument was, look, you got to prove to us that forcing people to get an injection actually is better to protect your interests than all these other uh, mechanisms that we've been using now for the last year. Uh, and this is really the point that this case turns on. And essentially, the arbitrator said, um, the employer has a duty under health and safety legislation to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of a worker. And after the SARS pandemic of, I think it was 2006, um, the courts decided that there's something called the precautionary principle, which is if an employer... Uh, has an option available to it to protect the safety of workers, that, that methodology is not going to be subject to rigorous scientific proof before it's reasonable for the employer to adopt it. So the employers don't need to go through all the scientific literature and determine what's being reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association versus the study in the Lancet and all of that, uh, there has to be just sufficient basis to conclude that this may in fact be a reasonable approach. And the arbitrator essentially said, um, that's the situation here and the employer's policy in general is reasonable. However, uh, there are some exceptions uh, for employees that are working inside. Certainly, um, this makes the most sense, but the evidence that you can't get COVID outside basically meant you didn't have to get vaccinated if you were an outside worker uh, and working in the general environment. Um, and so subject to that specific exception, the vaccine policy was upheld pursuant to this precautionary principle, which is... Um, recognized uh, by virtue of the general duty clause of health and safety legislation. The next case of note uh, occurred around six weeks later was the Coca-Cola bottling uh, decision. Um, we all know that uh, Coke makes uh, soft drinks and uh, they do it in bottling plants. They also distribute their products uh, throughout uh, society and grocery stores and convenience stores. And as a result, the employees that actually worked in the bottling plants had to work in very close proximity to one another. The drivers that went out and stocked the shelves in the grocery stores, A, had to comply with the requirements of the grocery companies that said no one's coming in here commercially unless you're vaccinated and you have to show us the vaccine passport. Um, uh, and also the, the company Coke said, well, you are going to be working with our customers in close proximity, so we expect you to be vaccinated. Uh, Coke had a uh, difficult uh, experience with its workforce across Canada. Uh, they had experienced a number of partial plant closures due to the vaccine. Two employees had actually died, not in this particular bargaining unit, uh, and 13% of employees had tested positive for covid uh, as they could demonstrate from their workplace access testing policy. The union's argument was, well, again, uh, this is very intrusive, and we think that there are more, uh, rather less intrusive means to prevent the spread. Um, continued testing, enhanced PPA. Um, but this was a workplace where the employer had already put up workplace barriers, couldn't really get people working in the bottling plant to work six weeks uh, six feet apart, uh, already had face shields, disinfectant wipes, and there really wasn't any more that they could do to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, so in this situation, the arbitrator said that employees could not work remotely. Uh, less intrusive means uh, had thus far proven not to keep the workplace safe, and rapid antigen testing was not uh, perfectly effective in detecting the Omicron variant. Uh, and obviously the arbitrator was significantly influenced by the fact that there had been such uh, uh, a difficult 
um, effect of the vaccine on Coca-Cola's operations and its employees. Um, interestingly, at the arbitration, while both sides are arguing about whether the vaccine policy is reasonable or not, they both asked the arbitrator verbally, um, so when would the employer be able to terminate people that decide they're not going to get the vaccine? Now, the arbitrator quite uh, courageously took that issue on, although he didn't have to decide it, and said, um, it's not unreasonable to place unvaccinated employees uh, on a leave of absence without pay. Uh, and you can't have people on a leave of absence indefinitely, and they're particularly when they can do things to bring them into compliance and come to work. And the arbitrator um, suggested that a four-week timeout or period in the penalty box was the right period of time to allow the employee to consider their next uh, great decision, and the employer would likely be in a good position to terminate the person after that four-week pause. So that's basically, you know, the general approach the arbitrators took. If there was a workplace issue with uh, COVID, uh, if employees work inside uh, in close proximity, if there has been issues in the workplace, uh, then COVID vaccine policies were uh, justifiable in light of the precautionary principle. Uh, as I said a few moments ago, things dramatically changed in uh, March 2022, nearly two years to the date after the first emergency order, when the government very quickly decided to uh, withdraw the policy of uh, vaccine passports, uh, and the general great reopening happened uh, in March 2022. Within days of that, the uh, union at Extendicare, uh, a retirement home in Ontario, filed a grievance and wanted the vaccination policy lifted in light of the fact that the province has decided that we're not gonna require this in general society for people to function and go to the grocery store, eat at restaurants, go to the gym. Um, in a very uh, concise decision, the arbitrator said, well, um, the absence of a government policy doesn't mean the employer can't do this. And the absence of a government policy doesn't mean that it is unreasonable to have an employer instituted government policy. All the reasons why it made sense for the policy in the first place are still here. And although the arbitrator actually acknowledged that the vaccine was not as protective as people had hoped, it was still allowed as a reasonable exercise of management rights. And so we peel away the whole um, social political pressure to be vaccinated and still employers have a strong basis to require mandatory vaccination policies. Last case I want to uh, address concerning vax policies is FCA Canada versus Unifor. Uh, FCA uh, basically was a contractor to Chrysler uh, it's a corporate vehicle through which the company Stellantis operates and this concerned uh, vehicle assembly plant in Windsor, Ontario. Um, like just about all manufacturing facilities in Ontario, there was a uh, mandatory VAX policy for the obvious reason that the workers have to come to work, they have to work in close proximity, and the employer wants to ensure that everyone is protected. Um, the arbitrator held that the policy, when it came into effect initially and required only two doses, was reasonable, uh, but decided that the fact that the policy did not require a booster rendered the policy unreasonable. And the reason for that was the arbitrator looked at what's uh, known in the scientific community as a preprint study, which is basically a study prior to peer review and publishing in a academic journal uh, that said that there is a waning effect on the vaccine in the absence of a booster. And therefore, the arbitrator could not accept that uh, requiring people to take two doses when there's a, a limited effect of two doses after a period of time was reasonable in the absence of any um, booster. 
the arbitrator said, well, I'm going to hold back on uh, my order being effective in validating the policy to allow the employer to figure out what it's going to do. Obviously, this was broadcasting to the employer that, well, you need to require boosters here, guys, uh, and then uh, your policy is probably going to be fine. Um, what's interesting here, I think, is that this is a bit of an outlier of an arbitrator actually uh, trying to understand the great uh, torrent of scientific data about does the vaccine work and does it work against that variant or this variant, uh, which none of the other arbitrators bother to do because of the, pro of the precautionary principle. It's interesting that this arbitrator didn't have any expert evidence to allow her to make this determination based on an unpublished report that uh, boosters were necessary. But nonetheless, that is uh, a precedent to be dealt with. And I think it's useful uh, to remember that there's a, a, an additional requirement to any policy, which is periodic review uh, to determine shifting uh, public health guidance and shifting uh, information concerning the efficacies of vaccines. So the key conclusions on the vaccination policies uh, are uh, this. And uh, you know, we're going into 2024. And so I'm not saying that this is going to be relevant to the whole COVID situation, but these are things that turned out to be relevant and are things to have in mind when the next big event happens, whenever that may be. Um, obviously, policies that are consistent with public health advice likely to be upheld. They're required by third parties. In other words, you can't come onto the customer's job site without being vaccinated. Well, you need to be vaccinated because you're working for us and we work for them. Physical distancing um, can be difficult for employees working indoors. Uh, bad workplace experiences, high uptake in infection, uh, fatality shutdowns uh, are very persuasive that a policy is justifiable. If you serve vulnerable communities, if you're serving um, the elderly or the infirmed, uh, obviously that is a factor supporting the reasonableness. Um, the approval of the Joint Health and Safety Committee is also uh, worthwhile. Most workplaces that actually put this in front of the committee, uh, the committees said, yeah, no, we think the vaccine policy makes a lot of sense. And that, that makes sense intuitively in light of the high uptake rate amongst Canadian workers for the vaccine. Um, and it, it was a useful way for many employers to put um, uh, non-compliant employees in a bit of a box and clearly showed that they were um, an anomaly. Periodic reviews for such policies are very important. And of course, the regular exemptions concerning uh, human rights um, pertaining to creed and uh, uh, medical need to be um, accommodated from the mandatory nature of the vaccine has to be part of the policy and the employer's considerations. Interestingly, less persuasive was the fact, you know, I said on the previous like uh, public health advice, the fact that the government's mandating these things or not really turned out to be not a big issue. Um, and the ability uh, for testing and other alternatives to vaccination really didn't get a lot of traction uh, with arbitrators in light of the precautionary principle and the general reluctance to really, um, for arbitrators to come out of the scope of their expertise and engage in, in an analysis of scientific literature um, uh, allowed them to draw comfort from the precautionary principle. So this basically happened uh, in the labor arbitration milieu for uh, nearly two years, and we did not receive any court decisions until uh, the end of 2022. And in non-union workplaces, the same questions were being asked of us, which is, uh, so I have a policy, uh, Joey's not taking the vaccine, uh, so what do we do with Joey? Well, the advice we gave is, well, you put Joey in the penalty box, and hopefully he'll change his mind and come back and um, maybe everything will be better and we can bring Joey back and he doesn't have to be vaccinated, but don't have Joey come to work. In other words, don't fire Joey. Uh, let Joey stay at home. You don't have to pay him. That's the best way to go. 
Uh, and uh, eventually, employers that did this uh, received lawsuits claiming generally constructive dismissal based on the fact that, well, you're not allowed to suspend me. And Jeremy made this comment in the context of harassment investigations that, uh, you know, you can have people wait at home for a while, but after a longer period of time, you're entering constructive dismissal territory based on established Supreme Court of Canada principles. Uh, and that caused us to be worried that uh, the courts would apply that general principle to say that you're not allowed to allow to force people to be at home and unpaid without paying them their common law notice and effectively terminating them. Um, other uh, cases, one other case, and so there's one case from British Columbia, only one case across Canada that's actually decided that. And there's another case in Ontario that decided um, a termination based on frustration of contract. And I'll uh, discuss both cases uh, now. The first one is the constructive dismissal case. Uh, that case is Parmar versus Tribe Management decided in September uh, 2022. It is the first and to date only Canadian court decision to consider the legality of a workplace COVID-19 vaccination policy. Consider that. Right. Like going into this, we thought that the courts would be clogged up with employees uh, challenging these employer policies. Um, the fact that we've only had one case says two things. One, the civil justice system is incredibly clogged and it takes longer than necessary for cases to reach adjudication. And the second is that employee lawyers and employer counsel have been reading these labor arbitration decisions and can pretty much predict what the courts are going to do in these cases. And so that's why I think uh, we're not seeing more of these cases percolate and be decided in 2023 and in the future in 2024. In any event, uh, this case involved a property management company and the employee in question was the controller i.e. a senior employee working in the office. The employer mandated that employees be paced, placed on unpaid leave um, for a period of three months if they didn't get the vaccine, and then there would be a reconsideration. Uh, the employee made the regular arguments about, hey, you know, I should be able to work from home exclusively. And she was working at home in a hybrid way, uh, but I should be able to work at home exclusively. How about testing? Um, strictly controlled site visits, you know, uh, let me do this. And the employer just said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, so the employer rejected the request, put the employee on paid leave. And she then said, well, you know, now you've constructively dismissed me because now I'm at home. I'm not making any money. That was never part of the deal. And I'm going to sue you for constructive dismissal. The, uh, the employee lost, uh, and the court gave some very brief comments concerning this line of authority dealing with suspensions, normally arising uh, in the disciplinary investigation milieu, um, and kind of fluffed that off by saying, really, the overriding consideration is whether what the employer did was reasonable and justified in the circumstances to deal with the situation that no one thought about at the time the employment relationship started. The court took judicial notice and judicial notice means just sort of accepting as true without requiring any evidence of the fact that um, the COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective in controlling the spread of COVID. Uh, that's a lot farther than any of the arbitrators were prepared to go. Right. I spoke a few minutes ago about how the arbitrators just sort of fell back on the precautionary principle and said, you know, well, you know, we don't know the vaccine's absolutely perfect. Uh, we don't know how well it works with respect to um, impeding transmission. But this judge just came out and said it is now a, a judicially determined that vaccines uh, are safe and control the spread of COVID-19. End of debate. Um, and this was a reasonable step for the employer to take to deal with the global pandemic. Um, and not only did 
the employer not repudiate the employment relationship by putting the employee on a suspension. The employee repudiated the employment relationship by not following the employer's reasonable policy. And so this was a uh, complete, um, we just uh, played the great cup. So I'm going to use a, a, a football analogy. This was a blowout for the employer community, right? This was just a slam dunk, grand slam, home run. Uh, all points uh, were in support of the employer. And this court went farther than any arbitrators by uh, giving little consideration to the whole concept of working from home. Uh, the judge said you can require the person to come in, and if you're requiring them to come in, they can be uh, vaccinated. The next case to uh, consider is a case from Ontario concerning frustration of contract. This employee worked for Bell Canada. Sorry, this, no. This employee worked for a company that worked for Bell Canada installing um, tele home, telev home television systems. Bell Canada said to the employer, you need to have all your employees vaccinated in order for them to do their work. And uh, the employer did that. The employee did not get vaccinated and the employer terminated the employee after 14 days. So here we have an actual termination, whereas the employee in the British Columbia case quit. The employer here, I think, very prudently didn't say you're terminated for cause. Instead, the employer said there's frustration of contract here. You can't do your job. We can't employ you because of a radical change to the employment relationship put on us by Bell Canada. And the court accepted that argument and held that the uh, vac uh, Bell's policy essentially rendered it impossible for the employee to continue employment. Why I say this was a uh, prudent decision is you can certainly see the employer just saying, well, you're not going to get your fired cause, right? We told you to do it. You didn't do it. Goodbye. The Employment Standards Act is actually quite relevant here because the Employment Standards Act allows you to terminate somebody um, without severance or notice if the employment relationship has been frustrated, constructive dismissal, or willful misconduct. And anyone who's been following the sort of the difference between the just cause standard and the willful misconduct standard will know that whether something is just cause may not be willful misconduct. And willful misconduct really means uh, being bad on purpose. And I think the employer here was quite sensible in terminating the employee for frustration because the common law test for frustration is the same as the ESA test. And therefore, not only did the employer not owe common law notice, but also did not owe uh, termination and severance pay under the ESA. Whereas had the employee term employer terminated the employee for just cause, they may still have had to pay the employee under the ESA because the behavior while just cause to terminate wasn't necessarily being bad on purpose as the willfulness conduct standard has been articulated. And so in these situations where an employer is required to have its employees vaccinated by a third party, it makes sense to um, rely on the principle of frustration. Um, putting these two cases together, I think it really means this. Uh, if a third party requires your employees to be vaccinated and they're not vaccinated, you can rely on the doctrine of frustration and terminate the employment relationship without cause. Uh, if, however, uh, it's you that's deciding that uh, you don't want the employee around in the workplace, our advice is not to terminate the employee in the non-union environment for just cause because um, the British Columbia case makes clear that it's better to just have them out of the workplace and if they quit, they quit. And if eventually you're in a position to uh, bring them back to work, you bring them back to work. So uh, we're not recommending that uh, non-union employers actually terminate employees for just cause uh, for as long as it's reasonable for you to require vaccination mandates. Uh, 
So that leaves unanswered the whole question is, is it just cause? Do you have just cause if you are going to terminate an employee for not getting the vaccine? And we're back to the labor arbitration jurisprudence. Uh, there have been two cases uh, that have addressed this. One is Lake Ridge Health in QB, uh, a hospital case decided in the spring of this year. Essentially, the employer um, experienced the lifting of mandates that the uh, government had, but still insisted that employees be vaccinated. And it was experiencing a great, and, and a lot of employees just stayed home and they didn't get paid. And it was very difficult to actually operate the hospital because you need workers in the hospital helping the patients. Uh, and the employer said to itself, look, we've got to either fish or cut bait with these employees and uh, try to get them to come back to work. And so they told the employees, if you don't get the vaccine and come back, you're fired. And within the course of a uh, couple of days to three weeks, it fired uh, a large number of employees that the uh, union grieved. And essentially, the arbitrator said, uh, in the circumstances of this case, it's reasonable to, in fact, terminate employees that refuse the vaccine because of the problems faced with actually staffing the uh, staffing the operation. It's such a big deal that you need to be able to recruit people to permanent jobs as opposed to say, hey, we're hiring you for a temporary position while Joey figures out what he wants to do with the vaccine. Um, and in that situation, just cause was appropriate. Uh, I think this is a narrowly a case that ought to be narrowly interpreted because of the specific healthcare component, the need to actually staff hospitals, uh, and the overriding need uh, to have vaccinated people working in hospitals. The next case is really just a real head scratcher, and I, I've gone uh, 30 seconds over time, but I'm going to bring this to your attention. This uh, case was decided in December 2022. Uh, the employee, uh, just reading this case, was, a, was just a bad employee, was a, was a troublemaker. The employee uh, was unvaccinated. The employer had a policy that required employees to either, either be vaccinated or submit to the rapid antigen test. It wasn't a mandatory vaccination case at all. It was, tell us if you're vaccinated, and if you're not, okay, you'll do the rapid, rapid antigen testing. Well, this employee says, no, I'm not going to tell you if I'm vaccinated or not. No, I'm not going to do the rapid antigen testing. And the employer sends the employee home and 16 leaders fires the guy. Now, I'm not crying uh, any tears over this employee. All he had to do was tell the truth and have the rapid antigen test. But he decided not to do it. Uh, and the, uh, the union grieved. And remarkably, the employer, sorry, the arbitrator upheld the grievance against his termination, basically on the basis that he'd only been given 16 days to figure out what he wanted to do with his life. And the arbitrator said that is too short. The arbitrator didn't say what a reasonable period of time would be to allow somebody to decide whether they're going to participate in the employer's system. But whatever it is, 16 is not enough. Uh, and the arbitrator made some, uh, I think, socially aware comments about that this is a very divisive social issue arising from the pandemic. Um, we need to give people time to make decisions that they feel uh, are very important to their lives. And the employer um, just didn't give this uh, a young man uh, enough time to make up his mind. Um, practically speaking, we have... Uh, the arbitrator in the Coca-Cola case that said four weeks, there was an obiter comment, obiter dicta, uh, comment in the Lake Ridge Hospital case where the employees were terminated for cause. And the arbitrator did say, you know, here, four weeks would be a reasonable period of time. It's the same period of time opined to by the Coca-Cola arbitrator. I think we should all uh, uh, take that as a strong indication that if uh, in future, uh, we're going to confront this again. It's four weeks, and we give the person notice that if they're not vaccinated in four weeks, it's that point in time they can be terminated for cause. Um, takeaways here um, with respect to non-union employees, uh, frustration is a useful doctrine to apply, 
provided the decision is imposed on you by a uh, third party customer or party that controls access to your own property. Uh, non compliance with reasonable policies can result in termination for cause for a good reason after a suspension of four weeks or better still indefinitely until the medical situation changes or the employee changes their minds. Um, and I think also it's uh, interesting here that the court cases were the ones that were the most pro employer, um, uh, which quite frankly is a bit surprising. Arbitrators need to consider the needs of the employer community and the unionized uh, uh, the unions. Those are the only two communities that need to consider. Courts uh, are not bound to keeping anybody happy or being seen as um, reasonable. Uh, they have pure judicial uh, independence, and they decided that uh, the employers are deserving of significant latitude and were. So these are all very interesting uh, cases to look back on 22, 22 with. Um, take your chances in 2024, but I think that these are all very useful um, conclusions that we can now use and apply to the next big thing. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we're running just a few minutes behind schedule. Nothing serious, though. But I know break time is important because, you know, people need to check emails, whatever, and take a little break. So we're going to keep it at a 15 minute break, but come back um, 1107, roughly. So you get your 15 minutes. Um, so see you then. 15 minutes. Thank you. Our next speaker is our associate, Hadi Malik. He's going to be speaking about the duty to mitigate, uh, which these days is actually um, a big battleground in uh, a lot of wrongful dismissal litigation. And Hadi and I have been in the battles ourselves in court, which you might hear a little bit about. Um, so over to you, Hadi. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think it's still morning. Good morning, everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about the duty to mitigate, what it is, how it works, and uh, how courts have dealt with it in a deeply variable way and how case specific can be. So, uh, what is mitigation? In every contract claim, if a plaintiff sues a defendant, uh, the plaintiff has a duty to mitigate their damages. That is to take some sort of efforts to alleviate their loss. Wrongful dismissal claims are no different. Uh, in wrongful dismissal claims, as many of you may know, uh, employees sue for common law reasonable notice. Employees are entitled to common law notice presumptively um, and that presumption is rebutted where there's an employment contract termination clause that's enforceable that limits that right. Otherwise, they're entitled to common law notice. Uh, what's notice is reasonable notice, and what's reasonable is determined by a judge on a case-by-case -case basis. Judges will look at four factors, uh, the employee's age, uh, the character of service, uh, length of employment, availability of similar employment, among any other relevant factors, and usually make a call based on precedent case law. Uh, Any time an employee is awarded common law notice, that is always subject to the duty to mitigate. That is the duty to find uh, or search for rather reasonably comparable employment. And where an employee fails to sufficiently mitigate, their notice entitlement is reduced accordingly. This sort of makes sense uh, uh, with respect to how common law notice works. Common law notice isn't a reward uh, for you know, good performance. It's not punitive against the employer. The purpose of it is to give the employee enough time to find a new job. And that's where mitigation comes in. So um, as I stated, courts will reduce the notice period based on a failure to mitigate or sufficiently mitigate. And in each instance, it's subject to judicial discretion. Uh, what does this look like? This looks like, for example, an employee failing to conduct an adequate job search uh, after their termination or alleged constructive dismissal. This includes not applying to enough jobs, not applying widely enough, and not applying regularly enough. 
But this can also include things like uh, getting an offer from a prospective new employer and declining it, and there not being reasonable cost to decline such offer. Or for example, let's say you're a high level executive, uh, you may be required uh, as mitigation to uh, seek out executive recruiters or your professional contacts because that's how you'll most likely get a comparable position. It could also include rejecting an offer of continuing employment with the same employer, depending on the circumstances, or deciding to uh, change careers or go back to school where other positions are reasonably available in the job market. Another thing is relocating away from the job market. Uh, let's say you decide to move away after you're terminated um, from a central city, let's say from Toronto to, uh, let's say the Kawarthas. And this is a case that Landon and I did, which I'll talk about shortly. And that may be found to uh, be a failure to mitigate, or may not. These things have been found to be deeply fact specific. And the cases I'll sort of go through today will show you <coughs> along which lines the case law has fallen and uh, where we sort of are today. So to prove that uh, an employee failed to mitigate their losses, that burden's entirely on the employer. The employer has to show not only that uh, the employee did fail to mitigate by uh, taking reasonable steps, but that had they appropriately mitigated, they would have gotten a comparable position during the notice period. This is a relatively high standard, and it's not a standard of perfection for employees, it's a standard of reasonableness. And the test isn't to find um, uh, any job, it's to find a comparable job. And the employees, employers not only face a burden in this instance, but also a burden with respect to, uh, sometimes when employees sue, they'll claim costs of their job search efforts, and employers have to show that these costs aren't reasonable. For example, if an employee is required uh, air travel for interviews, needs to rent a car, has to pay for resume prep, parking, you'll see these in a, in a lot of wrongful dismissal suits. The burden in that case is also on the employer to show that these costs aren't reasonable. I'll give you an example. If an employee, say, wants to fly to London to get a job or search for a job, um, then the employer could reasonably argue, well, aren't the, there jobs in Toronto? Why do you need to go to London? We're not paying for this. So uh, back to, does the position need to be comparable? Now, normally an employee is not required to accept a position um, if it's not reasonably comparable to their uh, the job that they lost. However, uh, there have been cases where um, if the job market is bad and the employee circumstances, and depending on the employee circumstances, if a comparable position cannot reasonably be found, then there may be an obligation on the employee to look for a, a position that's at least suitable to their skills and experience. What about something such as a change in career? Uh, as I've mentioned, if an employee decides, you know, uh, I'm gonna become a massage therapist after working in IT and they get terminated from the IT job, then uh, the benefit of the employer is it's up to the employer to argue that, you know, any income from the massage therapy job should be deducted from the notice period. Now, what about starting a new business? Employees often do this uh, where, you know, where one job comes to an end and they feel uh, enterprising. Now, let's say the job comes to an end. There are other uh, reasonably comparable positions in the marketplace, and there's evidence of that. But the employee decides, nonetheless, uh, I'm going to focus on my business and start this new venture. Uh, that can be likely found a failure to mitigate. However, if it's the type of situation where the job market really isn't great, there aren't many reasonably comparable positions, the employee tried, can't find anything, so has now decided to do this new thing of starting the business, then that would likely be found not to be a failure to mitigate. But the cases are very case specific and circumstance specific. What about taking less pay? I'm going to go through this case uh, that went up to the Court of Appeal in 2022. It's called Lake uh, Anne La Presse. That was the employer. So in this case, the employee was 52 years old, a uh, general manager of a French language newspaper. The newspaper was based out of Montreal and the employee was their most senior employee in Toronto, had about 13 direct reports, was compensated at a fairly high executive level, 185,000 salary, car allowance, annual bonus, pension benefits, the works. The employer closes its Toronto office and uh, the employee is terminated and sues for wrongful dismissal. Uh, this matter went to summary judgment, and at the motion, at the time of the motion, two years later, the employee still didn't have a job. So the employer argued a few things. Um, uh, first, that she'd waited too long to begin her job search. 
uh, that she was aiming too high when she did search for jobs. She was searching for vice president level roles that would be comparable to her general manager position. And um, she applied uh, for not enough jobs. At, uh, at the summary judgment motion, uh, the judge reduced the notice period of eight months to six months on this basis. But this was overturned at the Court of Appeal. Uh, the Court of Appeal found that, no, she was not aiming too high. And applying to uh, just the, in, in, and in applying to just the VP position, she had conducted an adequate job search. The motion judge had also suggested that perhaps she should apply to lesser positions, such as sales representative positions. And the Court of Appeal found that, no. Um, uh, and they said comparable employment is employment that's comparable in status, in hours, and in remuneration. And uh, the employee has no obligation to apply to a lesser compensating position. So what is a reasonable effort? What does the employee have to do to cross the bar? Uh, this case called Break the PJM2R Restaurant Inc. Uh, this involved a McDonald's franchise. Uh, gives a really good example of that and sort of where the line can be. This case involved a general manager of a McDonald's franchise. Uh, the employee's employment was found terminated. And during the notice period, the employee uh, got a bunch of uh, different jobs and tried to earn income uh, from various locations. So the employee had income from a job at Sobeys, at Tim Hortons, at a Home Depot. None of these were uh, manager positions. She did also try and start a babysitting and cleaning business that failed, uh, didn't really find uh, any manager jobs, but ended up staying at a Home Depot job at the end. The employer argued that this wasn't reasonably comparable and this was a failure to mitigate. The court said no. And um, I'll ex this quote, quote does a really good idea, a uh, really good uh, job of explaining sort of why. And I'll read it to you. And the court says, there's no magic formula that an employee must follow when making reasonable efforts to obtain other employment and thereby mitigate his or her loss. When an employer alleges that a former employee has not reasonably mitigated his or her losses, the question is whether the employee has stood idly or reasonably by or has tried without success to obtain other employment. So a terminated employee is entitled to consider his or her own long-term interests. Uh, so she will not fail to mitigate merely because she chooses to take some career risks that may minimize the compensation that her former employer will owe to her. So in this case, uh, that short period where the employee decided to try a few things, also apply to other jobs, uh, try the babysitting and cleaning business, that wasn't found to be sort of offside the du duty to mitigate. Now, this is sort of different than those cases where an employee simply decides right after the job is over to uh, go left field and start a new business. And uh, I suspect because this was a relatively low level position, the court wasn't inclined to reduce the notice period on this basis. Now, what about an employee's feelings about how they're fired? How long can they sit around and uh, sort of take time to consider before applying to anything? Uh, turns out the courts have said quite a bit of time. I'll give uh, examples of three cases which have ranged from two all the way up to six months. So the Battenson case, um, which came out in 2020 out of the Court of Appeal, uh, in that case, the court found that a two month waiting period was all right. Uh, during the two months, this employee did uh, look online for jobs, but didn't apply to any because they didn't interest him. And at the time, um, he was also getting start started on setting up a franchise that he was interested in and that he had invested in. And um, he spent some time training for that franchise. Uh, so that took time away from his job hunt efforts. And the court found that this type of this level of adjustment period was reasonable. So there was no deduction for mitigation. Uh, in the Corso case, which, uh, which is slightly older in 2009, uh, the, uh, the sort of adjustment period of four and a half months was found to be sufficient. Now, in this case, it was really interesting because in this case, the court determined that the employer had just caused to terminate the employee and there was no notice entitlement. However, in the alternative, the court made a finding on notice anyways and found that this employee would have been entitled to seven months, but there would be no mitigation, uh, for uh, no deduction for failure to mitigate uh, because even though he didn't have work after two years, um, didn't have a letter of reference or outplacement support, and it looked like it was difficult for him to find a position, and this transition period was acceptable given the facts of his termination. Uh, the poll case, six months. Now, this one's more recent. It came in 2022. Uh, this case involved an employee who worked in retail for the Hudson's Bay. 
And uh, this was a long service employee uh, who was terminated during COVID and um, got a 24 month two year notice period. And the court for various reasons said, no, there will be no mitigation deduction here. Uh, the employee, the court found that the employee's uh, six month period of not applying to jobs was actually uh, all right because of a few issues. First, the employee was terminated during COVID. Uh, at the time in the retail industry, those jobs were difficult to find and there was a substantial impact in retail. Uh, more significantly, and the court spent more attention on this, is the employee had uh, diagnosed mental health impacts from his termination. He was experiencing symptoms akin to depression and anxiety as a result of losing his job, which made applying difficult. However, the court did comment in this case that uh, six months would likely be the upper limit of what an adjustment period would be. And I think this case would be something that's uh, unique to these type of difficult circumstances. Now, what about fixed term contracts? So we've talked about common law reasonable notice um, and what that applies to is employees on indefinite term contracts. Uh, with fixed term contracts, there's no duty to mitigate because uh, if an employee is terminated uh, and they have a fixed term contract without enforceable early termination language, uh, the employee is entitled to the balance of the fixed term contract. Let's say you have an employee on a 20 month contract, you can terminate, uh, terminate them 10 months early. There's no term ter termination language in there. You owe them the balance of the 10 months. And uh, I have an example of the Livshin case here uh, where the employer terminated early similar situation and was liable for 20 months. So this sort of begs the question, why use fixed term contracts and when, when you could have an employee on an indefinite term contract with termination language that limits their common law entitlements? And this is a lot to think about, particularly in situations where the type of employer who's going to renew those fixed term contracts successively. And when that type of situations happen, uh, situation happens, terminated employees often tend to argue that because they're fixed, uh, they've been on successive fixed term contracts, their employment was effectively of indefinite duration and that they're entitled to a common law notice. So you end up back at mitigation anyways, but a strong defense you have in that instance is the termination language in your contract, which, uh, you know, it, which can sort of uh, stop before you get to step B of the common law notice. Now, uh, what about independent contractors? The opposite is the case here. Uh, we have this really interesting case that came out of the Court of Appeal this year, uh, basically says that independent contractors on fixed term contracts do have a duty to mitigate. They're not employees. So the base, uh, basically the common law of contracts applies to them as well. Now, uh, in this case, the worker was hired as a consultant on a 72 month term. His contract was terminated early and he sued for the remainder of the 65 months. There was no early termination clause, so he was entitled to the balance. Uh, in this instance, the trial judge found that he did not have a duty to mitigate, which was overturned by the Court of Appeal. Uh, the Court of Appeal confirmed that because this, this individual was not an employee, he was a true independent contractor. Uh, there was no relationship of ex exclusivity between him and uh, the company. Uh, there was no a core employee-like relationship. And the contract itself did say that he was uh, permitted to perform services for other parties, which is very important. However, in the end, the court found that uh, the company did not meet its burden of showing that the consultant failed to mitigate his losses. Uh, the consultant had put in uh, enough sort of job evidence of his job search efforts that the court found it to be sufficient. So what about you as an employer offering to continue an employee's employment um, with you after they claim they've been, let's say, constructively dismissed, which happens often. There's a leading case on that. It's called Evans and Teamsters out of the Supreme Court in Canada in 2008. In this case, Mr. Evans was a business agent for the union Teamsters. He'd worked there for 23 years and he'd been terminated. The parties began negotiations and they negotiated for about four months or so. And at that time he held firm I, 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 on his position that he wants 24 months notice. Eventually the company's lawyer writes to him and says, uh, after these four months or so that Teamsters wants him to return to work and serve out the balance of his notice period, uh, which would be the 24 months and he declined. 
The employer obviously argued that this was a failure to mitigate, and this goes up to the Supreme Court of Canada. So the Supreme Court of Canada did find that this was a failure to mitigate and came up with various factors that are uh, that come into play in these type of situations uh, to determine whether an employee has an obligation to re- uh, accept an offer of continuing employment or reemployment with the same employer as mitigation. Basically, the test boils down to, did their relationship get acrimonious? Would the employee feel humiliated or demeaned by going back to their job? Uh, a lot of the times, employees will claim constructive dismissal, uh, a constructive dismissal by because of a demotion. So, if it's the sort of situation where uh, they end up feeling like, oh, now, well, these people who I worked with, who used to report to me, no longer report to me, they're going to see me as less than. There may be an argument to say that that's humiliating, and um, for that reason, the employee is not obligated to accept the offer of continuing employment. So some of the factors the court uh, considered was, uh, what was the offer of reemployment made before or after the employee left? Has the employee considered commence litigation? Is the compensation, the salary offer the same? Uh, is there a similar position in the marketplace? Are there personal relationships involved in acrimonies? What's the history and nature of the employment? Is the work demeaning? Are the working conditions substantially different? Uh, these uh, since Evans and Teamsters, uh, these factors have more or less been more narrowly applied. And I'll apply them to a case that uh, Landon and I actually represented the employer on. Camus, uh, it was Mr. Quesnel, but it's actually pronounced Quesnel, I believe, and Camus Hydronics. So in this case, the empl- an employee's company truck was taken away, along with uh, the benefits that came with the truck company truck. Uh, so the 4-7 coverage, the gas card, uh, maintenance expenses for the trucks. And on this, ba- on this basis, the employee alleged he was constructively dismissed. So about a month after his alleged constructive dismissal, uh, the company offered him continuing employment uh, to return to work uh, and also be- have access to the company truck for one year. The employee declined. This matter went to litigation, and at summary judgment, the employee was found constructively dismissed, and we moved to the mitigation question. During uh, that one-month period, interestingly, so the employee would uh, commute from Oshawa to the company's offices in Mississauga, take the 407, use the truck. He had moved away during that period from Oshawa very quickly to his second house in Amimi, which is in the Kawarthas, and sort of appeared to have started a business as a fishing guide and maybe was on his retirement path. Uh, Interestingly enough, the motion judge found that by moving away from Oshawa to Amimi, uh, the employee was not obligated to take uh, take the offering of continuing employment in Mississauga because the commute was too far. However, in the same breath, the court found that the employee did fail to mitigate because he moved to Amimi and there weren't sufficient jobs in Amimi. He took him away from uh, himself away uh, out of the course of employment from a core from a core city center area. And on this basis, his notice period of ten months was reduced by thirty percent uh, to seven months, and this was a big success for the employer. Another successful case for the employer, uh, Humphrey v. Many, or Men, I don't know how you call it. This came uh, out of the Court of Appeal last year. Now, this case involved a relatively short service employee, three years, 32 years old, employed as a CEO of a company, um, and uh, went to, wrong, went to uh, litigation, and the employer argued that notice period should be reduced on account of the employee taking six months to apply to other work applying to two narrow range of positions uh, where reasonably comparable positions should have, were available, and more importantly, rejecting a job at, a job offer for a VP e-commerce position, which had greater or equal compensation to the employee's job. Now, the Court of Appeal uh, did not overturn turn the trial judge's findings on uh, the items regarding taking six months to apply to jobs and applying to narrow range of positions. Um, on the basis of taking six months, the trial judge has only reduced the period, notice period by one month. However, the Court of Appeal found that uh, in declining the VP e-commerce position, the employee had failed to mitigate. The reason she declined it, she said, you know, uh, it, it didn't have the sort of broad-based senior management role, uh, posi- uh, work that she was looking for. 
And from this case comes a very interesting comment, and it's very helpful to employers. Uh, the court found that the rejection was fairly mitigated, and it noted that reasonably comparable doesn't mean the exact same. What it means a comparable position, reasonably adapted to the plaintiff's abilities, uh, which this job was, and it offered equal or greater compensation. So the court stated that she was obligated to accept this position, and by failing to do so, she failed to mitigate. This chopped her notice period of 12 months and a half. So what do we take away from all these cases? Now, for employers, uh, what this means uh, at first instance is examine your employment contracts, uh, look at the termination language. Employees will not be entitled to common law reasonable notice where the termination clauses in their contracts and if their fixed term agreements are uh, early termination language uh, is found, in, un, uh, found enforceable. If you get to the stage of where there's a common law notice entitlement or a question of, and you get a demand letter or a statement of claim from an employee, this is a good time to sort of get your ducks in a row and start thinking about, well, what's the job market out there? It may be a good idea to start saving job posts and thinking of, and this is something you may want to discuss with your counsel or in response to any employee claims, uh, what uh, sending to the employer or their lawyer sort of a list of, look, here, here are all the jobs available. You should be able to mitigate quickly. Your common law notice period, the notice period you claim, is, it should not be this high. And this type of litigation documentation comes out anyways if you get into litigation. It normally tends to come out when you get to the documentary discovery stage, but sometimes the parties can exchange it earlier. And it can be very helpful in trying to resolve or settle a matter at an early stage, particularly at mediation, if that's what you wish to do. Also, um, offers of continuing employment. If the employment relationship hasn't gotten acrimonious and you can stand to have this person back in the workplace after, let's say, they've alleged constructive dismissal, uh, consider doing so and make sure to do so in writing if you're going to do so. If, the, if there's no sort of evident reason why the employee shouldn't take the job, if their compensation is the same, if their role is the same, uh, this can be a full capping of their notice period because this may be found to be a full failure to mitigate. Also, consider if you're going to terminate the employee outright and there's a common law issue of uh, if, you know, if it is an adjust cost termination and the relationship really isn't acrimonious, let's say it's a genuine restructuring, considering putting in a plan for uh, providing letters of reference or at least letters of employment. And if you have the budget and out, some sort of outplacement support uh, to help the employee get a job as soon as possible, if there is sort of a genuine issue of an entitlement to common law and reasonable notice. And ultimately, okay, I will be quick. I'm running out of time. Ultimately, uh, in these, if you get a demand letter, do not panic. Talk to a lawyer uh, and consider whether any of these options are available. And what that does is it puts you in a more comfortable position than not and puts you in the best position possible to deal with these sort of claims on a regular basis. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Heidi. <clears throat> I would ask this morning's uh, speakers to come up to the front here so we can go into the Q&A session. Uh, so for everyone here live, you have uh, these green sheets. That, that means the morning session for Q&A. So if you have any questions related to this morning's topics, uh, please write them out there and Angela will collect them. For those of you connected remotely, you can ask your questions by uh, hitting the Q&A button at the bottom and uh, type them out there, and we will uh, do our best to answer them. Sometimes we get more questions than we can answer on uh, the time we have. And I do ask as well that the questions be related to the topics that we've covered this morning. So without further ado, we will launch into them. Maybe Ryan, you can start first. All right. The question uh, is, if the legislature took uh, measures to ensure that owners do not come become constructors, where constructors also have the duty, then why would they intend the owner to be equated to employer, which also has the duty uh, related to measures and procedures? Uh, I'll be very blunt. This legislation has been, is drafted in a very confusing way. 
by having it being so broad as to say that uh, a constructor is responsible for everything on a site. An owner doesn't become a constructor by having quality control uh, and then turning around and saying uh, an owner is uh, an employer is, is everyone that you subcontract. Uh, it is difficult to reconcile what exactly uh, that means, what, what it, it means. And that's why, you know, the eight of the greatest legal minds in the country couldn't decide what it means for them, said it meant one thing and four said it meant the exact opposite. So uh, in other words, there really is no answer to that question. I think the real answer may be, as it sometimes is that the legislature just has to, um, uh, is, is, the, is the legislature just has to do a legislative fix. So, is there, uh, so really it may very well come down to the legislature just making a decision and amending the act to say that owners that uh, contract for uh, constructors don't become the employer. Jeremy? Yeah, thanks. So, so uh, one question here about uh, sort of a fact pattern. A female employee meets a male coworker outside of the office as part of a, sort of a social group. I gather this wasn't like a work event. It was just people socializing out outside of work. Um, and then the uh, female employee comes back to the office and reports inappropriate um, remarks from that male coworker occurred during that event. And the question is, should HR look into this uh, as it occurred outside the workplace? So this is a question about the legal nexus. That's the sort of fancy legal term. Is there sufficient connection between what happened outside of the physical workplace or working environment? And here where it's two coworkers, uh, the answer is probably yes. Um, and so you actually are put into an interesting situation where the witnesses that you may need your investigator to look into and speak to aren't under your your thumb. You, you may not have the ability to say to everyone else who was at that bar who are social friends who are not your employees, you have to come and tell the truth about what you saw and, and, and what happened that night. Um, but you certainly can do that with your direct employees. That might have an impact on your ability to make a determination about what happened. Um, but ultimately, you can discipline for off-duty conduct where that this where that that misconduct has a, a bearing on the actual employment relationship and interaction between the parties. In this fact pattern, this employee, the female employees, is refusing to work on committees because she feels unsafe with her male coworker. So this has had a direct impact on the workplace. You need to know if this is legitimate or if this is just some kind of a personal gripe, and then you need to figure out how you're going to address it. Um, we would have to get into the facts to deal with that. But the simple question is, yes, you should. And in fact, you probably have an obligation to look into this, given the impact on the workplace. I have a question. Another question for you, Jeremy, from a rem rem remote attendee. Does every harassment allegation have to turn into an investigation or can you just have a mediation? Well, if you don't work in BC, then the answer is uh, uh, probably not. Uh, if you work in BC, then as soon as a complaint comes in, you have no choice but to investigate and follow your policy or else you're going to get hit with an administrative monetary penalty, uh, even if there was no harassment. So thankfully, for those of you listening in who are in Ontario, uh, the first step is to determine prima facie, so the, the, at face value, if the allegations that are made could be harassment if proven, then you have an obligation to investigate. Now, unfortunately, often the complaint comes in or the facts come in and you may not be able to make a clear sort of for the Canadians here, hopefully everyone knows the NABOB test. It may not quite be that simple as just finding the bright white line. Could it be or could it not be? You often have to conduct that investigation to determine if, if uh, uh, the, the pattern is made out. One great way, if the complaint comes in and it's really vague and you're not sure what to do, ask them to put it in writing and to provide you as much detail as possible. That nails down their story, provides a clear mandate for an investigation if you're going to go that route, and it allows you to make a clear determination if, if these pleadings, which are sort of the complainant's best foot forward, could be harassment, then the obligation is engaged. Jeff, I believe you have question or two over there? I do. I have one question uh, that says, and uh, high marks to the questioner for including section numbers. Not necessary, but appreciate it. Um, can an employer's policy supersede things in the OH, uh, OHSA, Occupational Health and Safety Act? Short answer to that is no. Uh, legislation takes priority over any employer policy. You can't just say, no, I'm not going to follow the uh, legislation because it makes sense in a particular circumstances. But an example is given um, concerning monitoring 
vax status and there's reference to two things one is section 283 which says that the uh, employer is not required to require an employee to consent to medical surveillance and that how does that contrast with the obligation to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of a worker i take that to mean that um, the question is really, uh, you feel that in order to take every precaution, you need to put the employee under medical surveillance. I don't consider med- – so I consider the term medical surveillance to be a uh, mandatory and intrusive um, providing of information concerning someone's health status without their consent. And you're not allowed to force that. However, people that don't consent to provide you with reasonable information as to whether they're fit for duty um, is not medical surveillance, but rather just requiring to prove they're fit for duty. So proving that you're vaccinated, that's not medical surveillance. You don't have to provide the proof or not. Uh, But if you don't, there are consequences to that. So I think that all of these provisions can be read in harmony. Okay, I have a question for Ryan. Uh, If the owner employs a safety consultant, what level of due diligence do they need to uh, uh, adhere to in the selection, i.e. designations such as CRSP, PNG, et cetera? Ah, that raises an interesting question. The concept of unlike safety consultants, unlike say lawyers or paralegals, are not licensed. They can literally anyone can hang out a shingle to be a uh, uh, to be a safety consultant. So the kind of things you'd be looking for is certainly professional designations. I mean, if you even if you're looking for a professional engineer, if you're looking for someone, you'd only hire a professional engineer if you're looking for someone to be focused on engineering related issues. So I think more a CRSP is obviously a which is a Canadian registered. Safety professionals, obviously, one good indication of uh, uh, of uh, proper experience. It may very well be the person who's the consultant has a background as a safety manager uh, for a private com- private or public company. There's a number of individuals that are ex uh, Ministry of Labor uh, inspectors who uh, have done a good job of uh, hanging up their shield. So uh, the, the bottom line is, you would want to make reasonable inquiries as to that person's background as to what their experience is. It doesn't necessarily mean that having that you must hire someone that has a specific license, but certainly uh, it certainly would help. And certainly having relevant, what would be most important is relevant uh, industry experience. I mean, if somebody was, uh, his entire background was in construction and you're running a manufacturing plant, I'm not sure that's the best person to hire. Okay, I have another one for Jeremy. During the workplace harassment investigation presentation, you noted that corrective actions are to be shared with the parties. Is there any best practice or parameters around what should be shared? Are we expected to reveal if the employee was disciplined? Uh, Well, uh, first of all, it it might depend on the nature of of the investigation. So if there was uh, uh, violence uh, as part of the harassment, so it was harassment and violence, there might even be an obligation to report to the Joint Health and Safety Committee um, as well. Uh, but let's just say it was just harassment. There was no violence aspect to it. Uh, the complainant and respondent have a right to a summary of the conclusions of the report. And uh, there's no specific obligation to report the remediation um, in the Health and Safety Act or human rights context. But those are, from the case law, a best practice. And so uh, what you're sure to find is if you uh, have confirmed in your summary of conclusions that there was wrongful conduct and you don't tell the complainant, not maybe not the specifics of the discipline, but you don't tell them that any steps were taken in particular, they're going to say, well, so you've confirmed my complaint, you agree with me, and now I have to keep working with this person and you're doing nothing to take steps to prepare that individual to reacclimate with me in the workplace or to protect me from them on a go forward basis. Um, I, I think that that could lead to complaints of constructive dismissal. They could allege you're condoning a poisonous work environment. Um, so again, although there isn't an obligation to give the specifics, I think it's absolutely a best practice. And I would strongly recommend that you share that there will be a refresher training uh, that we're going to work on uh, ensuring that if it was a manager, that they have uh, training on how to 
professionally uh, manage people in the workplace. Um, if there are going to be disciplinary consequences, you might not have to say it outright, but you can certainly say that they're, uh, they're, they're going to face discipline as a result of this and a mark will go on their permanent record, for example. That would be a great way of saying it. Um, you don't have to tell them they're missing three days on a suspension or something like that. That, that isn't required by law. I think it's overboard. Okay, this is a question for Hadi on uh, mitigation. If we've terminated an employee and we are in the process of negotiating the final settlement, how can we as the employer uh, monitor the duty to mitigate and whether or not the employee has mitigated? So uh, presuming this is being done without lawyers, uh, in that instance, uh, if the employee is making a claim for a common law notice, you have to sort of go through the runs of the exercises of first making sure, you know, you don't hold tight at the position saying you have termination language in your contract. This is what it says. This is what you're getting. Um, anything above that, we can offer you more in exchange for release. If it's an issue of termination language, you've been advised it's unenforceable or there's nothing there. It's a common law mitigation issue. Um, in that event, you're entitled to, you know, just uh, ask the employee, provide us your job search efforts. We want to know. Uh, send them a list of all the jobs you found that are reasonably comparable. If they're saying, if the employee is taking the position, I'm entitled to 24 months notice, uh, and they've worked for you for five years in a mid-level role, you're entitled to say, please explain why. And uh, you're entitled to also say, look at all these jobs that are available. I did a quick LinkedIn Indeed search. Here's a list. You should be able to find comparable employment quickly. And what that does is puts you in a strong position uh, to come back uh, with what you believe is a reasonable counteroffer. Jeff, do you have a question? I don't. You don't? Okay. I have one here. Jeremy's got a lot of questions. Oh. So especially if people uh, remote, if you have questions for the other people, uh, we welcome them because... Otherwise, we're just going to be hearing from Jeremy for the rest of the Q&A. If you let me start, I'll never <laughs> stop. Um, well, so it, it, I have one question here from uh, one of the in-person in, in attendees. Um, so essentially what we have is a he said, she said. So someone's gone through an investigation and they, they don't think the complainant is lying, but they don't have enough evidence to sort of get over that, the, the, get the seesaw to tilt in the other direction. Um, so this is the problem faced by arbitrators, by judges. Uh, what you're doing is you're making findings of credibility. What you're doing is you're looking into the uh, uh, the evidence that is circumstantial that either supports or doesn't support the story of the person um, on one side or the other. But ultimately, the test is a balance of probabilities for employers in this circumstance. You don't have to find on a criminal standard beyond a reasonable doubt, but you're going to want to be sure that you have evidence that you think will hold up if you're challenged on why you came to the conclusion you came to. There is no tort of flawed investigation for an employer in a circumstance like this. But what happens is if you conduct a shoddy investigation, if you ignore obvious process, obvious evidence, uh, witnesses that you're told have something relevant to say, well, now you could get human rights damages awarded because you failed to conduct a proper investigation, for example, as required. So in this particular circumstance, what do you do when you technically have a 50-50 and it's a coin flip? The complainant has not substantiated. There isn't enough evidence to substantiate the complaint. But is it is it likely that you're going to really have a 50-50? Is, is that going to happen in every case of a he said, she said? I don't think so. I think you're, you're generally going to be able to uh, look at other evidence, uh, either of the conduct in advance, the circumstances, other witnesses, um, unless it's a single incident, uh, there should be other evidence available to help you make that call. But you know, I'll admit as an investigator, sometimes I'm torn. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to make those findings of credibility, but that's that's your role. And as long as you do it objectively in good faith and exercising unbiased independent judgment, you're, you're doing what you can. Another one for you, Jeremy. No. Uh, sometimes we have a complainant uh, that wishes to make a harassment complaint, but does not want their identity revealed. Uh, to the respondent for fear of reprisal. How best can this be handled? 
Okay. Uh, well, so first things first, is this a situation where there's uh, a risk of actual violence or physical harm? Uh, then you want to get the police involved. Um, and you may not be able to conduct your investigation while there are criminal charges pending, for example. Um, if we're talking about workplace harassment, uh, then when someone comes in, as I said during my presentation, and they give you enough information to conclude that if they're telling the truth, there's a, a real problem in your workplace. Someone has been harassed. Someone has been sexually harassed. Um, you have a legal obligation to conduct an investigation. The respondent has a legal right to know about the allegations against them and who it is that has brought those allegations. A random, vague allegation that someone in a workplace said you did something bad on a day, but we can't tell you when, who, or how, how, how can any respondent respond to that? They can't. So what you need to do is assure the complainant that you'll do everything in your power to ensure their safety, that reprisals will not be tolerated, that your policy and the Health and Safety Act itself forbid reprisals, and that the anyone who perpetrates a reprisal will suffer discipline up to and including termination, even if they didn't commit the harassment. And then when you actually conduct the interview with the, with the respondent, you make that clear. And in your witness statement, I always, I always make sure that the, uh, uh, the person giving evidence signs off on sort of a set of re recitals up at the top where they acknowledge they've been told they have a legal obligation to cooperate and be honest. They have a legal obligation uh, to respect confidentiality in the process, not to share anything they've shared in the session with anyone whatsoever. And they acknowledge that on pain of potentially termination of employment, um, they will not engage in any reprisals against anyone who participated in the session. And so that's that's something that's probably the best you can do, but you're going to have to tell them that we can't conduct this investigation if you uh, um, uh, without disclosing. So Jeremy, again, for you, um, this question isn't necessarily focused on uh, harassment investigations, but more the concept of harassment itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the question is, can it be considered harassment for someone to say to another employee that they look nice today? Uh, I think in this day and age, unfortunately, uh, we've come to the point where some people are triggered and are sensitive to that. And I think that from a legal perspective, that's a dangerous thing to be saying to another person in the workplace, whether you're from the same sex or, or, or otherwise. And uh, I'm not sure from a personal perspective that I would be offended if someone said that to me, but I'm not the litmus test, right? It, it's, it's what would an objective employee in those circumstances feel? And, uh, you know, I guess there might be certain people who would feel uh, more affected or triggered by something like that than others, but we have to make the workplace a safe place for everyone. And that's that's the end of that discussion. So thinking about how it used to be and how it used to be okay to do things, Mad Men is not the model for the modern workplace. It, it's just not. Here's a question for Ryan. What are your views about owners doing uh, checks of contractors before they start working? Like, uh, I guess essentially like making sure they have the qualifications to do the work safely. Uh, I think that's a great idea in the context of uh, due diligence that I spoke about. I think it's the one thing it's going to be pretty crystal clear uh, that with an owner, with an owner having employer obligations of every court is going to expect uh, that an employer has taken some steps to pre-qualify uh, a contractor um, in the construction context. One place to look at is the certificate of recognition, otherwise known as core, uh, which is a, uh, a nationally adopted uh, standard that uh, deals specifically with health and safety for construction contractors. That's one uh, example. There's some ISO systems uh, uh, that are out there. And as I mentioned um, earlier, certain trades, electrical trade being an example, or many others have specific licensing requirements uh, that need to be followed. You're going to want to have proof of legally mandated training, things like fall protection, uh, uh, in other words. So in answer to the question, I think that following up on things like core and other like objective uh, standards is going to be one of the really only ways, uh, aside from inquiring about regulatory history, as the Supreme Court pointed out, uh, to pre-qualify uh, a contract. Okay, that concludes our um, Q&A for this morning. The, there was a question about whether materials would be made available. As I mentioned, an email went out last night. Last right? night. With a from uh, from you, Jeremy, uh, we'll keep from our Mailchimp account. Right. 
Okay. So, uh, so an email did go out with a link to the materials. So if you don't see that email, check your uh, junk folder. And if it's not there, let us know and we'll make sure you get them one way or another. Uh, so you should have them. Uh, okay. So now it's time for the lunch break and we will be back at 1.15. Okay, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome back from the lunch break. Hopefully everyone is uh, feeling rested and uh, full and you're ready to face the afternoon. The first topic up is, is a perennial favorite. Um, Allison Taylor uh, uh, tends to either talk about how to draft employment agreements so you don't get sued or you can defend yourself or the latest and greatest in what happens in the court when you make a mistake and they sue you and how to deal with that. So this year she's handling terminations of employment. Um, and I, I'm sure I'm going to learn some things too. So please, everyone, uh, eyes open, ears open. Here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Well, I hope you're not like me and feel extremely sleepy after our very nice <laughs> Uh, hot lunch this morning, uh, this afternoon. Um, so I hope I will be able to give you something entertaining enough to keep you from nodding off um, after lunch. So uh, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the thorny issues that arise in connection with terminations of employees. Uh, some of the areas in which we find that we have the most difficulty in you know, defeating an employee claim, uh, being able to defend uh, various kinds of issues successfully, and also the bottom line, what is it going to cost you? And there have been some interesting developments uh, in the last year and a bit that I want to review with you uh, today, as well as talk to you a little bit uh, at the end of the talk about the treatment of CERB, which um, is, is a question that is associated with mitigation of damage, really, but it's got uh, um, ramifications all of its own. So I want to start off with just cause. Now, you may glaze over at this point and say, what is the point talking about just cause? Because we never can terminate for just cause anyway. Uh, some of you will know that I have, I've told clients from time to time that the way to get to just cause is if the employee burns your building down. And that's definitely just cause. Um, and that's a bit facetious, of course. Um, but it's meant to denote that just cause is something very, very serious. Now, in, in the real world, most of the time, the causes that employers would like to use to get rid of employees are not going to meet the threshold for just cause. They're difficult to get to at the best of times. They require warnings. They take a lot of time. And at the end, you just can't be sure that you've done it well enough. And this is a continuing theme in the talk today is how the heck can you know you've done it well enough? Because the Court of Appeal is not making our job easy in that regard these days. So most of the time, we abandon the idea of just cause. We know the person is a bad performer or a bad actor or has a bad attitude, but we suck it up and we pay them out because we know that it is just not worth taking the risk, particularly recognizing that if you get it wrong, in the old days, as long as you were acting in good faith, you know, if you're wrong, you're wrong, and the court will award damages, and that's fine. But today, if you get it wrong, the court is more likely to award aggravated and even punitive damages to the employee, even if you were acting in good faith in what you thought was a just cause situation. So it's more expensive. So it's really very unlikely most of the time that we will terminate for just cause because, you know, we just don't want to take the risk that it's going to be even more costly than it would have been if we just hadn't bothered. But there are some cases in which it is worth terminating for just cause. They're few and far between, but I want to talk to you about a few of them today. So the first one is Dove and Destiny Media Technologies, Inc., this is a case in which the plaintiff managed the defendant's music marketing business. Now, for truly inexplicable reasons, the plaintiff also worked in a store which was owned by the defendant's own CEO. So presumably he was doing something, he or she was doing something pretty naughty as well. Uh, and there was a second person. And th this person manned this store three to four hours a week during business hours. In other words, during hours that were supposed to be devoted to the defendant's work. 
And in the course of doing so, not surprisingly, the employee's work for the defendant was neglected. Now, it's only three or four hours a week. So, you know, probably could have been a finesse for a long time. But somehow this employee managed to meet a deadline related to the business plan. The company was struggling. The employee was increasingly absent from work, fall, fell behind on other routine matters. And so, of course, they let the cat out of the bag. Now, it's the letting the cat out of the bag that's fortunate for the employer because this kind of thing can go on for years and years and years with a really clever employee. But the employee clearly got complacent, dropped the ball. And in any event, the employer discovered that this was going on. Now, no formal warning was given to the employee about this uh, or about the fact that they were failing on the business plan, not attending at work on time, failing on these routine matters. So there's no disciplined communication of any kind. There was no formal written agreement either that had a full care and attention clause. You know, you must give your full care and attention to our work as your employer. There was a code of conduct that said you can't engage in act or apparent conflicts of interest, but that was it. So they tried to investigate. The plaintiff refused to participate in the investigation, which itself is a no-no and really should be cause for dismissal, although it's not always. Um, the em employer terminated the employee for cause. The employee sues. The case goes to trial, so obviously there may have been a settlement process during the course of this, uh, but the matter didn't settle. And the court concluded that the employer did have just cause to terminate this plaintiff. It, it takes the court a little bit of time and more time than you and I probably would think it ought to, to explain why this is. The court certainly held, which is not really rocket science, that an employee has a duty to provide full-time services to the employee. I work for you, you pay me, but that presupposes I work for you, right? Not for somebody else, not for a third party, but for you. So that by itself really shouldn't have been very difficult. This is not a moonlighting case. This is not a case where an employee is working after hours. So it's not a prohibition on working after hours for someone else. This is moonlighting, if you like, during regular business hours where you're being paid basically twice, right? So you're riding two horses with one behind, if I can put it that way. You're being uh, paid by the employer to be at work, but you're not at work. You're providing services to a third party. This was, to put it, shortly, time fraud, time theft. Now, the court therefore went on to emphasize, and again, it just takes a lot of words to come to this conclusion, uh, that the employer's work is to be done during normal business hours, whether the employee is busy or not. So you can imagine that there was some discussion about whether the employee's workload really necessitated that they be there all the time uh, and, and whether, you know, and so on. Of course, what the court says, not surprisingly, and one would think it was self-evident, is that I'm paying you for working, whether I have work at that time to give you or not. Now, why this came up at all, uh, given that this employee was behind on the business plan and other routine matters is unclear to me, but it may be that the court is simply kind of elaborating on the reasons uh, in this particular case. But effectively, the court is saying it doesn't matter whether you have a lot to do or a little to do during this time. I, as employer, am paying you. Therefore, I'm entitled to your time. The court also goes on to talk about the divided attention having an impact, compromising the ability of the employee to work effectively. And again, one wouldn't think it was necessary to talk about this. This is just fraud. Uh, but nonetheless, the court goes on to say this compromised this person's ability to focus, and therefore they weren't devoting their proper care and attention to the employer's work, hence the falling behind on these various aspects of work. So this is a very de de uh, detailed uh, um, uh, elucidation of a concept which should really be pretty clear, which is you cannot steal time from your employer. Um, the court held that it's not necessary to warn an employee not to do this, that this is self-evidently inappropriate. Um, the employer tried to investigate so this, even though there was no warning, the effort to investigate denoted the necessary good faith on the employer's part. The plaintiff refused to participate in the investigation on the advice of counsel, 
which is astonishing. I have to wonder who the council was, uh, but, you know, astonishing thing to say, because, of course, an employee has a duty to participate in investigations of a matter like this. This is not a matter of staying silent because this is a criminal investigation. It's not. It's a civil matter. And as you heard this morning, the balance of, of uh, probabilities test is what applies. There's the uh, civil burden of proof is what applies, and there's no right to remain silent during an investigation of this nature. So at the end of the day, the court came to the correct conclusion, which was this is time theft, and this really is cause to dismiss. And that's very comforting uh, in this day and age, because of course, we've got a lot of employees working from home. And I've personally had a number of cases where the employer has said to me, we suspect this person is working on their own business. We suspect that they are working as, as if they're consultants, but being paid 100% by us. And, but we, just, we see that they're absent. They're not, they're not fulfilling their duties as would have happened. Now, of course, one solution to that problem is to bring people back to the office because it's a lot harder to cheat this way if you have supervision. Um, nonetheless, that's not always possible to do, but what it tells you is that there's a, you need to have an awareness of the fact that it's very, very easy for people to do this kind of thing in a working from home environment. So this is something we're likely to see more of to the extent that work is of this hybrid nature or exclusively from home. Now, in order to bolster your defense in a case like this, which again, shouldn't be necessary because it's time theft, but one should certainly have a full time and attention, full care and attention clause in an employment agreement that says, during working hours, you will work exclusively for us because it's a piece of evidence. And the more evidence we have, the better case we have if we have to litigate a case like this. The best case out of BC is kind of an interesting case. It's a very small scale case because the employee only worked from October 2021 to March 2022, was terminated, and then the employee sued for compensation. And the defendants defended on the grounds that the employee had engaged in time theft. This was an employee who was working remotely. And this um, company uh, got timesheets done uh, physically by the employee, but it also had something called Time Camp on the computer system, which was a timekeeping system which allowed the 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 um, employer to see what documents were open, what procedures were being done, and so on. So it could tell if things were being printed and a very a variety of functions that were being done with the computer. <coughs> Now, it turned out that Bess was recording on her manual timesheets time that did not appear on the computer, which is a bit of a silly move because we all know that computers, generally speaking, don't lie and that you're going to have much more accurate timekeeping on a computer than you have on the timesheets. But nonetheless, uh, she might have been somewhat naive in thinking she could get away with this. This Video, this system video recorded activities on the computer, recorded electronic pathways and time spent on various functions. And it had everything from soup to nuts on it. The video showed that she did not work on the files she claimed to have worked on. She did not work, work on files for the time she claimed to have worked on. So they really had her dead to rights. She submitted 50 more hours than she actually worked. She said, I don't know what the discrepancy is. I don't really understand this, this timekeeping system. I may not be using it properly, et cetera, et cetera, which is the usual thing you get with people using computers who are always in a position to say, I'm not an expert. I don't know what I did wrong. But the court didn't really buy this in the end. Now, she said also, well, I was working with paper copies of things and the computer couldn't see that. And the solution to that was, well, yes, but then the, in, the result of that paperwork would have been inputted into the computer, which it wasn't. So we can see the end didn't support what was supposedly going behind it. So the court didn't have much difficulty in concluding that she really had stolen time. And it, it, the court said this, which is interesting. Given that trust and honesty are essential to an employment relationship, particularly in a remote work environment where direct supervision is absent, 
which is the key point. I find Ms. Bess's misconduct led to an irreparable breakdown in her employment relationship with Reach, and the dismissal was proportionate in the circumstances, so I find Reach had just cause to terminate Ms. Bess's employment. And then for good measure, the employer was awarded uh, the value of the hours that she had overcharged for. Now, this was an employment tribunal in BC, not a court. But nonetheless, that's a very strong finding because employment tribunals, as those of you who have dealt with ESOs in Ontario know, uh, are very inclined to give the benefit of the doubt a lot of the time to employees. But in this particular case, the functionality of this timekeeping system was so strong that the, nothing the employee could say could defeat it. And that, of course, is very useful information for us because if we're designing work from home environments, we want to be able to have a system which equates to supervision if we can do it. So having a login and a log out at the end of the day is really not the same thing as having a mechanism to be able to see what is happening during the day in terms of work. And certainly if you have some sense that employees are working for you and other people as well, or on their own businesses as well, or as consulting as well, it's very useful to be able to have this way of monitoring. Uh, and of course, there, the employee had no, really genuinely no defense to this. So those are my two timekeeping cases. And I think what that shows you is that it is possible to get to cause for things that have a monetary value. And this has really always been the situation. If an employee is dishonest about factual information, the court can kind of find a way around the dishonesty. I mean, even in McKinley, which is the major case on dishonesty uh, out of the Supreme Court of Canada, the question is dishonest about what? And in that particular case, the court said, well, you know, the employee wasn't 100 percent truthful, but then the employer wasn't entitled to the information that was being sought in the first place. So, you know, the dishonesty was sort of went away. But anything with a monetary value, if, if an employee steals your cash, that's not rocket science, but anything else with a monetary value like time, uh, like a competitive activity, this kind of thing is really not difficult to be able to use as a way of getting to cause. So the next case is Park and Costco. This is a case in which an employee who really must have had, really must have hated Costco, I think, but was employed there nonetheless for 19.5 years. This is a, the kind of case you see a lot. People who really can't stand their employer or their supervisors or whatever the case may be, but they won't leave. We've all had cases like this. Just find another job and go somewhere else if you're unhappy. You know? But they don't. They stay around and they're being in every, to everybody's existence. Anyway, this employee was an assistant buyer responsible for monitoring inventory and sales and negotiation with vendors. So far, so good. It's a managerial level role. He has some leaves of absence, which tells you something. He's unhappy with what's going on. He ultimately wants to get out of his department, and that is granted. And you would think that he would then be a happy camper because he's now changing departments. Hooray, problem solved. But not apparently for him, because he had built a cloud-based website for his previous department during working hours. And... And that was fine, and it wasn't widely used, but nonetheless, he built, built it during working hours, which meant he was paid to do it. This is important because this was not a hobby for him. This was part of his job. So the website it becomes inexplicably unavailable to his previous superior after he moves departments, and the superior asks him for, for access. And after receiving this request, Mr. Park deletes the website altogether saying, oh, I deleted it, nobody cared. So immediately we've got a problem because when you get somebody asking for access, it means they do care, not that they don't care. But he was clearly bitter and angry about his website work being unappreciated, and he thought he would stick it to his old boss and his old department. So he was, of course, then criticized for deleting this website after he'd received a request for access to it. So he then sent a very insubordinate email back on the subject. Now, the company was able to restore the website because they have sophisticated IT people and they know how to do these things. And then Mr. Park, not to be outdone, decides to delete it again. 
And he, his excuse for this was, well, it, it showed back up and I thought I hadn't deleted it properly the first time, so I deleted it again. <laughs> so you can immediately see that there's a lot going on in Mr. Park's mind here. Um, he is motivated by very, very nasty thoughts indeed. And Costco then says, okay, we need to get to the bottom of this. So they conduct an, in, conduct an internal investigation. And they come to the conclusion, not surprisingly, that the website was deleted on purpose both times after these communications, not before. So that the desire for access should have been obvious to him and that the destruction was intended to prevent access and to prevent use of this thing that he had done for which he had been paid. And this was damage to or destruction of property, which was explicitly dealt with in the employment agreement. The Park's defense in throughout was nobody was using this website, so it was valueless. So it had no value as property. Therefore, I didn't destroy property. The court, the, the employer disagreed with that, said we wanted access. We paid you for this. And, you know, we all know that some websites languish until they become wildly popular. So the fact that something doesn't get used doesn't mean it will never be used or that the content has no value. Um, and it was also very, very clear that the second deletion was clearly deliberate, that, that his explanation that he thought had just popped up again and then re-deleted it was just nonsense. And then, of course, he talked too much. As employees in this type of situation are want to do, he really wanted people to know how angry he was and how, um, I guess, disappointed in his previous 19 years of employment, um, how disappointing that had been to him. And so he was, again, wildly insubordinate in the emails that he sent. This also was cause under the employment agreement. Uh, and also, he failed to tell anybody what he'd done, which was a further cause under the employment agreement in terms of the destruction of property. So he sued, having been terminated for cause, uh, taking the same position as he had uh, during the investigation. And the court reviewed the three tests from McKinley regarding misconduct. Did the misconduct violate essential, an essential term of the employment agreement? Did it breach the faith inherent in the work relationship? And was it fundamentally inconsistent with obligations to the employer? And I don't think it's difficult to see why the court held that Park's misconduct did all three of these things and that the termination for cause was proportionate and his action was dismissed, and he received an award of costs against him for $120,000. And this is really comforting. Employees don't always realize what will happen if they bring silly lawsuits to court, but this is what happens. And for normal people, this is ruinous. Um, and it doesn't really get talked about enough. Partly that's because, of course, most of the time, cause cases are not as good as this one, but this was just dynamite. And it is very unfortunate for this guy that he decided to take it to court. So I want to turn now to some notice period cases. The, we've heard a little bit about Court of Appeal this morning from Hadi. The Court of Appeal in Ontario is very, what's a kind way of putting it? It's really pushing the envelope in a lot of ways, which are very disturbing. One of them is that it's got a tendency now to decide to want to award more than 24 months of notice to employees. This started with a case called Curry in 2022. Uh, you can see that this is a bad case on its facts. The employee is 58, but has 40 years of service. So literally their whole adult life. They claim 26 months of notice. The, it was a non-managerial job. The defendant said 15 months is appropriate. In other words, there's a lower plateau for this level of job. But the court said she's in the twilight stages of her career, highly specialized field, only one employer, limited education and skills, not surprisingly, since working at 18, advanced age. She was held to be unemployable. And... Now, all of these things are really what we call the Bardal factors, you know, age, length of service, the nature of the employment, the availability of other employment. So all of this really should have been taken into account under the normal criteria for notice. And 24 months has been the normal plateau for decades. But the court says, no, these are exceptional circumstances and that warrant a 26-month notice period. Um, 
it's interesting that the employee had actually retired in 2007 and being rehired, that didn't had no impact at all. So the defendant says this is not reasonable or right, and they appeal. And the Court of Appeal, not surprisingly, agrees with the uh, trial judge. The court uses both the Bardell factors and the exceptional circumstances to up hold the award. And this is despite the fact that in 2019, the same Court of Appeal, not the same members, but the Court of Appeal had upheld that Bardell factors are already included in the 24 months and are not exceptional circumstances. So you'd be understandably confused as to how they can come to different decisions three years apart. And we're all confused by that, too. So this has led to other cases of the same nature. Millwood, a 62-year-old director-level employee who worked for IBM for 38 years. There's a pattern here with 30-odd years. Uh, Big earner, 170,000 plus incentives, et cetera. He sued seeking 30 months. He also was relying on COVID because, of course, COVID had hit at the time that he was terminated, making his job hunt harder. And IBM said he's a 20 to 22 month at most employee. He didn't directly manage employees, so he shouldn't even go to the top range of 24 months. The court awarded 27 months. Now, interestingly, it said that COVID was not an exceptional circumstance. Now, if COVID wasn't exceptional, I don't know what is, but the court said, no, that's not exceptional. But he had applied for 122 jobs without success. So indirectly, COVID has an impact because he couldn't get a job because of COVID. So it's a bit of a circular argument. But what they really say is, you know, a guy like this is essentially being forcibly retired. He's never going to be able to work again. He's essentially unemployable. And that and his long service, his age, et cetera, the fact also that his skills are specialized to IBM are exceptional circumstances leading to 26 months. Oh, and we'll throw a month on at the end for COVID, uh, even though it's not itself an exceptional circumstance. So he got there in the end. So this is all very circular reasoning, which makes you wonder why we bother talking about Bardell factors at all if we're going to talk about how exceptional they are for people who happen to have worked in one employer for a long time. The court of the uh, IBM appealed. Unfortunately for them, uh, the Court of Appeal agreed with uh, Millwood. It relied on Curry, the case we just talked about, to say that the skills that he had learned in his 38 years were not transferable because they related almost exclusively to the appellant's products. Now, this is the common denominator for a lot of these cases. This person knew the IBM way of doing things. And that's, that's not the same as everybody else's way. Knew their products, not the same thing as other people's products. Um, the court thought that the throwing in of an additional month for COVID was just swell, even though, again, not saying it's an exceptional circumstance. Uh, and IBM, therefore, lost the appeal and got $20,000 in costs socked against it. So what this tells us, and I I just want to go on and mention one other case that's just come out, uh, which is a case called Lynch and uh, Aves Canada Corp. This again, you'll see a theme here, an employee, 38 and a half years of service, 64 years of age. The court rightly pointed out, this is the Court of Appeal, that the motions level judge had not explained the factors that led the employee to be awarded 30 months and said, well, of course, the court should really do that. Uh, The court then, however, rather than overturn the case, said, well, we think this is a case like Curry. So we think that the elements that were important were uh, that the employee was specialized in the employer's unique hardware, that the job was unique and specialized to this particular workplace, uh, that he was a key performer, uh, and that the job see- uh, environment in Belleville, which is where he lived, uh, was very poor. So commuting was not expected of him. Belleville was the environment. Of course, there was nothing uh, available for him in Belleville. Uh, And hey, presto, he's awarded 30 months. So even though the, the, the trial level court didn't elucidate what the factors are, the Court of Appeal helpfully filled all of that in and said, this is the same kind of case as Curry. Word to the wise, if you have a 38 year employee who's 60 years old, you are potentially looking at this situation in doing a termination. So this is something for which you want to get advice. 
Now, the last time I think I talked about short employment, it may have been after a recent case came out where some unfortunate managerial employee, I think fairly senior, who had worked for some months, got terminated and the court awarded him two months. And that was very unfortunate for him. And everybody went to town on it in the employment bar and said, maybe this is a turnaround in the law of long of short employment and lengthy notice. But it's not because we've got another case out of the court of appeal called Pavlov, in which we have a 47 year old director of marketing and communication. So mid career, less than three years employment, no employee report, so non managerial. And at trial, 10 months in lieu of notice was awarded to this less than three-year employee, plus bonus. Now, again, he was terminated early in the pandemic, so that probably had an impact. The employer appealed, saying, maybe so, but this is way too much and he shouldn't get his bonus. Uh, he applied for 100 jobs, and the, and the employer said, well, this shows there are jobs because there were 100 of them to apply to, so the length of the notice period shouldn't be lengthened because of scarcity of jobs. The Court of Appeals said no and socked them with $24,000 worth of costs. They agreed with the trial judge. In a way, it's hard to argue with this. Just because there are jobs available doesn't mean that if you get, don't get one, that you've failed in some way. You know, there can be jobs, but there are a lot of competitors for them. And, you know, so that does should not have an impact on the notice period. And the trial judge and the court of appeal both said, well, look, if you're going to terminate somebody during a pandemic. You have to expect this kind of thing. You have to expect that there's going to be a difficulty in obtaining reemployment. <laughs> and so the employer lost that appeal, too. So the message is. Don't be confident if you read one case that says two months is okay for a one-year manager, because uh, it may not be. And this is, again, a situation where you always want to get advice before you take action. I want to talk now about additional damages, which is really becoming a huge problem in litigation, because, again, largely out of the Court of Appeal, everybody and their uncle seems to be getting additional damages for things that have happened during the termination process, which objectively just don't seem to necessarily be always worth that amount of money. Telgeur is a case in which a, there was an employee who was 56 years old, three years of service. She covertly recorded the termination meeting. Uh, which is kind of a no-no, but the court didn't seem to have any problem with that. It was probably grateful for the fact that there was a recording of the termination meeting. Um, uh, although there is some case law that talks about surreptitious recording, apparently this doesn't qualify. The employer's misconduct included failure to give written notice of, of termination, failure to pay ESA entitlements on time, Failure to reimburse business expenses promptly, and unfortunately, they really did hold out on the expenses for a long time, advising the employee where he would get eight weeks of additional pay, but then only paying them the ESA, and encouraging him to resign during the termination meeting as he would be better off that way. So these things are fairly serious, not all of them as serious as others, but, you know, not paying somebody their business expenses, promising them something and not delivering, uh, encouraging them to resign. Those are no-nos. The court then awarded the plaintiff seven months for three years, plus $15,000 in moral damages and plus the unpaid expenses. Now, going to trial with unpaid expenses on the part of a defendant was insane. So I don't know who's advising them, but in any event. The employee was not Lily White here. The employee had a job, a sporadic job search, had put up anti-employer social media posts after employment. So not necessarily most sympathetic of characters. Nonetheless, the court awarded these uh, damages. And the court said there's no evidence that if he tried harder to get another job, he would have gotten one. So we're not going to penalize him for not getting any of these 100 jobs. Now, pool is a case that Hadi spoke about in another context this morning. This, in a, this is an employee with 28 years of service. He gets 24 months, which is the top end of the range. There's some interesting discussion, which I won't take you to right now, about how you value benefits. But for some reason, the employer, um, uh, there, there was some discussion about whether this should be based on what the employee contributed himself towards the benefits uh, or whether it should just be the employer contributing to these benefits and pension. Uh, so I leave it to you to sort that out since I don't really have time to, to talk about it further, but it's kind of an interesting discussion. Uh, 
The court then goes on to award 45K in um, aggravated damages and 10 in punitive damages. But these factors are really a little less impressive. It made an insensitive, this is the employer, made an insensitive decision to walk the employee out at the time of termination, even though this was part of a mass termination. So, you know, not a really clever thing to do, but not that unusual either. It included a termination clause when it made an offer of a lower level sales associate job in case he wanted to take it. Now, on the face of it, since it wasn't mandatory that he take it and it wasn't used against him that he didn't take it, I'm not sure why this was worthy of uh, censure. But in any event, it was censured. It, the employer failed to pay the ESA amounts as a lump sum. And that after two months to do so, it paid. So after multiple requests. So the question is, what was going on here? I've had a case similar to this where the employee couldn't decide if they wanted to deposit some of their money into their RSP or not, and there was a delay, and then that's been used against us. So word to the wise, you know, don't wait around for the employee to tell you what they want to do with the money because this is what could happen to you. Uh, and failing to issue a record of employment within five days of the date of dismissal. Now, these do not seem to me on the face of it to be of such bad faith that they're worth $60,000, but that is how they seem to the court, which cheerfully awarded $60,000 additional uh, in damages against the employer for these things. So this really means that if you've got sloppiness and it's mere sloppiness at the time of termination, not malice, not deliberately trying to hurt him. Nonetheless, the court doesn't care. Uh, normally, punitive damages would need some malice. There's no evidence of malice here, but it didn't help. So you simply cannot make mistakes on these issues without being uh, seriously impacted by a court. So I'm going to skip through the next slides because I threw some stuff on mitigation in here that interested me and go on to the Waxdale case. Waxdale is a case which we were kind of promised at the time would not necessarily result in the same outcome in all cases. That is to say, the notion was that it would be a kind of a case by case analysis about whether a, 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 an improper cause clause would bring down the whole termination clause. Waxdale is a case in which the use of just cause language voided the cause clause because, of course, in Ontario, and this is only for Ontario uh, listeners, in Ontario, you cannot not pay uh, ESA amounts unless the just cause is also willful misconduct, disobedience, or willful neglect of duty. So if you use just cause language in Alberta, you're fine. But if you use it in Ontario, you're not. And unfortunately, uh, although this was supposed to be a case-by-case -case analysis, it's really turning into a flood of void employment agreements, as these employers have found to their chagrin. The TAN case in 2023 has a termination clause that said the employer may end the employment relationship at any time without advance notice and without pay and lieu such notice for any just cause recognized at law. And then it went on to say the ESA terms are deemed to be incorporated herein and shall prevail if greater. So the idea was if we're wrong about just cause, this cause fixes things for us. Well, it doesn't. The um, reference to just cause brought it into the Waxdale line of cases. So by itself, the phrase just clause is just has to become obsolete, I think, frankly, uh, because not all just causes at common law are willful misconduct. For example, you can get to just cause if you've given warnings on performance and they're not adhered to. You can then fire for just cause, theoretically, uh, but it's not willful misconduct. So you have to pay in that scenario. So they're not equivalents, even though 30 years ago, the Court of Appeal said they are equivalents. But never mind, that was then and this is now. Uh, so we're now in a different world. And so any kind of just cause language is going to get you into trouble. So this is a phrase that we need to lose unless we know how to use it very, very carefully. And that is something even lawyers are struggling with these days. Secondly, that nice saving clause at the end just doesn't help. Just don't bother. You might as well save the ink because the courts have basically said, look, 
employees have a right to know what the story is. So if you put in this, but if not this, that, that is apparently too confusing for employees to follow. And therefore, that they shouldn't have to navigate contradictory provisions, even though it's not really contradictory. It's simply saying, if this is void, then we pay you anyway. So it's not contradictory per se, but the Court of Appeal says that it is. So even if the saving clause had been better written than it was, it wouldn't have mattered because the Court of Appeal is really into plain language for employees, spelling it out for employees. And so efforts to make it more complex make it worse, not better. And one could be sympathetic with that as a general concept, but really th this is not that far off of plain language I would have thought in this day and age where most employees are aware of their rights. Um, the next case is Terrace. This is an employee working under a fixed term agreement. Now you heard Hadi talk about fixed term agreements and how you have to pay to the end of the term. This is why these things should be obsolete and never ever used by anyone. Uh, but in any event, it's great to have one if you have a good termination clause. The problem is if you don't have a good termination clause, you get killed on this. And that's what happened in this case. The, the employee was sophisticated, had had counsel in negotiating the agreement, and it didn't make a difference because the language, again, used cause language. So the early termination clause fell. So they ended up having to pay more than two years pay to an employee under a five-year agreement because they had used a fixed term. And if they hadn't used a fixed term, common law would have been considerably less. So just don't use fixed term agreements unless you really want to go and have, a, have the language tested in court. Ram Charan, uh, another case, inexplicably went to court this year, even though Waxdale had already come out. I guess these guys thought it was going to be different from them, but it wasn't. He only had a year and seven months of service. The clause fell, therefore he got six months. Uh, and then uh, he got uh, an additional amount for the loss of benefits, calculated at 10% of salary, interestingly, because somebody at some point during the litigation process didn't find out what the actual value of benefits was. So this became a much more expensive termination for this employer. Interestingly, he also claimed vacation pay on a discretionary bonus and was awarded it. And in spite of the fact that the ESA says that discretionary bonuses aren't wages, so go figure. This just shows you the court basically saying, well, you know, um, this wasn't really a discretionary bonus because it was based on corporate and personal performance. So you may have called it discretionary, but it isn't. Word to the wise about that. Normally, if you put the word discretion in your hiring letter about bonus, you're in pretty good shape, but not anymore, because if your bonus isn't calculated in a purely discretionary way, you may be out of luck there too. Other ways to invalidate a termination clause. I think I'm going to skip through this because I'm out of time. Uh, but this has to do with the substratum, disappearing, what we call disappearing substratum. What it really means is this. If you change a person's job significantly, you need a new employment agreement. And that means if you give them more responsibilities, you have them travel more, you change them in a fundamental way, but you change, leave the title the same, it's not going to help you. You need a new employment agreement and you need it drafted with fresh consideration, with the timing done properly, you need to get professional advice because in this situation, the employee wiggled out of his employment agreement because he said, my job has changed immeasurably and therefore I've got effectively a new employment agreement and the court agreed with him. So CERB deductibility, I am not going to go through all the esoteric law on this, but I'm just going to give you the conclusions of two courts of appeal at this point. CERB, of course, was provided for a six-month period, I think it was, back in 2020. And the question at the time is, you know, it was going, always going to be, well, what happens when employers start being sued for wrongful dismissal and they pay money retroactive to the date of termination? What happens to CERB? Does the employee have to does the employer get to deduct the CERB that was received and pay less? How is that going to be handled? The answer to that question is the courts have said what happens between the government and taxpayers with CERB is none of your business. You shouldn't care. It doesn't matter if, you, if it's a windfall and you think it's terribly unfair. 
in the end, the courts will still award the usual amount of damages against you as employer. And if the, if the government in its wisdom decides not to pursue all these taxpayers who shouldn't have had CERB or shouldn't now have CERB or whatever the case may be, that is their bailiwick. And it's nothing to do with you as an employer. So that's essentially a dead duck in sort of the way that EI is. EI is also not mitigation. The difference is EI gets paid back to the government and everybody can see that that's sort of fair, whereas CERB really isn't going to get paid back to the government, which does seem a little bit like a windfall. But that's the government's problem. It's not yours. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thanks, Allison. Uh, so I'm now going to be speaking about what's going on in human rights, both at the Human Rights Tribunal, uh, like in the on the ground, as well as uh, some legal developments from the last year or two that I think are of um, interest to most employers. And uh, as many of you maybe uh, have experienced firsthand. Uh, human rights complaints have become fairly commonplace now for employers uh, way back, you know, a couple decades ago and plus now when I started practicing law, uh, clients would sometimes be incredulous that they received a human rights complaint because like, yeah, well, what does this mean? Like we violated their human rights. That must mean we're absolutely terrible employers and this is going to ruin our public image and, and how terrible is this? But now uh, human rights complaints are, are commonplace. Uh, they're filed often as a matter of course when someone is terminated in an attempt to get more money sometimes because the with the termination clauses, which back when I started doing this, employers didn't really use termination clauses. They, they didn't even know they could contract out of common law. But now they're more common. so. Uh, I've noticed that uh, that's actually increased the number of uh, complaints that people make to the Human Rights Tribunal, uh, trying to get something more than just perhaps minimum employment standards entitlements uh, on termination. So, and, and the other thing, of course, is uh, it's free to file a human rights complaint. Um, all you have to do is go on the Human Rights Tribunal's website, you fill out a form, and press send, and now you've filed a human rights complaint. Uh, filing a lawsuit is a bit more intimidating. It costs money. You have to file a fee. And if you lose in court on a wrongful dismissal lawsuit, then you owe the yeah. other side their legal costs, right? So if I'm an employee and I bring a claim there and I lose, I'm potentially on the hook for my employer's legal costs. Whereas if I bring a human rights complaint and lose, I'm not on the hook for the employer's legal costs. And it's it's a much more user-friendly system, so it encourages unrepresented uh, individuals to bring complaints there. And um, as well, uh, perhaps scarily for employers, the Human Rights Tribunal has very broad discretion in terms of how it applies the code. Now, the courts can and sometimes do step in where the Human Rights Tribunal has perhaps overstepped its bounds or made uh, decisions that really don't hold up under scrutiny, but by and large, they have a lot of leeway. Uh, so basically, what, what happens at the Human Rights Tribunal uh, is actually important for every employer in Ontario, even if you're not facing a human rights uh, complaint. Now, if you have any number of employees, there's a good chance it's going to happen sooner or later. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, like, you know, don't take this session off. <laughs> Pay attention, you know, tune in for, for at least a little bit, because uh, this could impact um, each and every one of you as employers, not to scare you too much, but just to say, hey, you know, this, this is actually important. So first of all, um, let, I'm just going to talk a bit about what's going on in the trenches at the Human Rights Tribunal. This is based on information that they they release the, the most recent information on the is on the number of cases they're dealing with 
apparently last year they dealt with 3,425 new, new uh, complaints filed. So as you can see, I think that's quite a bit, right? These aren't just rare occasions anymore. Although interestingly, I saw that it was down from the year before, or either, sorry, down from 2019 to 2020. So um, that surprises me a little bit. I, I, I thought the trend was going up, but I guess it's leveled off and maybe even cooling off. Maybe the people have um, discovered that filing human rights complaints is not necessarily easy money, which I'll be discussing um, uh, a little bit later. Now, the time for cases to wind their way through the human rights system has increased. It's now an average of almost 600 days for a case to, to get through the system. And very few of those actually get to a final decision, right? Um, in 22, 23, the, the tribunal, this surprised me, only issued 33 final decisions. These are decisions that consider uh, the case on its merits, giving a full hearing to the decision on its merits. So considering they they get like between three to 4,000 cases a year, that that's interesting that only 33 roughly a year are getting a full decision. Um, now, some of those settle, of course, um, and others get dealt with by way of a summary hearing process, which I'll be discussing in a little bit. And this is also interesting. Of the 33 decisions they issued in 22-23, uh, discrimination was found in slightly less than half of them. And discrimination was not found in 17. So you got 16 where it's found and 17 where it wasn't found. So, you know, uh, a little bit of good news maybe for employers there. Uh, sometimes I hear from clients where they just assume because it's called the human rights tribunal, that they're doomed, that, you know, it's so pro-employee that they, you know, they're going to lose. But in fact, it doesn't really work out that way. And again, I'll be talking about the summary hearing process in a bit, uh, which, which shows that. So if you, again, if you get the human rights complaint, uh, don't despair, right? Um, most of the time you're going to come out okay, right? Uh, now, um, one thing to know, too, with this backlog of cases, again, which probably is helping, you know, get some of the cases of the system as well, because it's taking so long to get to hearing. Um, that also kind of favors the employer as well, because if an employee is facing two, maybe three years to get to a hearing, that might encourage them uh, to settle along the way or to compromise on their claim or maybe even give up on it altogether. A um, few other little interesting factoids from the tribunal. Uh, they talk about final decisions other than on the merits, uh, 1,400 roughly. Again, almost half of the new cases coming in. Now, they don't define fully what that means. I assume that means cases that are settling and getting dismissed pursuant to a settlement, as well as those decided by summary hearing. Most new applications involve disability uh, complaints. Uh, those are often, by the way, the most difficult ones uh, to respond to. And most hearings are being held electronically. And those of you who have been through the process, as you may know, the Human Rights Tribunal provides an optional mediation process. Now, it's not mandatory. You can participate if you wish, if you don't want to meet it, you don't have to. Uh, but you check off a box when you file a response, if you do mediate. And uh, the mediations typically take two, three hours. Usually three hours is the limit. And in my experience, most of the officers at the tribunal who handle the mediations are pretty good and uh, fairly balanced in their approach. In their approach. Now, sometimes they do take, and I think this is on both sides, a bit of a rough and ready approach where they're not so much going to tell you if you'll win or lose, but just, well, you could lose and you're going to spend all this money litigating and defending it. So they're going to settle for X thousands of dollars. Why don't you just take that? Um, but sometimes that makes sense depending on the case and 
the risk and the facts involve and what you as an organization, what your view is on um, whether or not you want to fight it. So uh, anyway, 51% of the cases settle at mediation, which if you decide when you get the application, you really don't want to fight it to a hearing, then uh, mediation might provide a good avenue uh, to get rid of it. Okay, so that's just a quick overview of life at the Human Rights Tribunal, on, at least from a statistical perspective. Uh, so now I'm going to get into some cases and some case law in terms of what's happening legally. So the first topic I'm going to be covering is proof of citizenship and residency requirements. As many of you are probably aware, uh, the Human Rights Code sets out what are called prohibited grounds of discrimination. So it lists various characteristics on which an employer cannot discriminate against an employee. Of course, they include things like age, gender, race, uh, sexual orientation, gender expression. Um, there's others, right? I'm not giving you the full uh, list. One of them is citizenship. Uh, so the Human Rights Code says you can't discriminate on the basis of citizenship. However, at the same time, um, federal law requires employers to confirm that employees are authorized to work in Canada. So, and if you do employ someone who isn't legally allowed to work in Canada, then you could be charged with committing an offense. So, you, you, as so, employers right there have to navigate between these two duties of not discriminating on the basis of citizenship, but making sure that your employees can legally work in Canada. So the issue was litigated in Imperial Oil in Hasib. In this case, Imperial Oil advertised a job. Uh, it was an engineering job that listed permanent eligibility to work in Canada as a job requirement. Mr. Hasib did not meet that requirement. He had temporary uh, right to work in Canada, but not permanent uh, uh, right to work in Canada or Canadian citizenship. But he applied for the job anyway, and he told Imperial Oil that, in fact, he did have permanent eligibility to work in Canada. So he was offered the job, and it was on the condition that he provide proof of permanent ability to work in Canada. So, of course, at that point, uh, Mr. Hasib had to come clean and disclose, in fact, he's not a permanent resident, but that he would be issued a three-year work permit. He was a student who was here on a student visa, that he'd be issued a three-year work permit on graduation. Uh, so then at that point, the employer uh, withdrew the job offer, and they also took the position that part of the reasoning for doing so was that Mr. Hasib had lied to them about uh, his ability to work in Canada. So this case has gone through three levels uh, of decision-making processes. So I, I, the first step was the Human Rights Tribunal. And uh, the tribunal said that Imperial Oil had discriminated against Mr. Hasib and breached the code. Then it went to the Divisional Court. And just, you know, the Divisional Court is kind of this funny court where it has an appellate type function, but it doesn't hear all cases, but it hears certain cases. And it, it's the first stop when, uh, if you apply for judicial review of an administrative tribunal decision. So it went to the divisional court and that, that court is a panel of three judges and they decided that there was no discrimination under the code. Well, then it went to the court of appeal and the Court of Appeal decided that there was and restored the original HRTO decision. So in its reasons, the Court of Appeal went back to the Human Rights Tribunal's analysis and decided that it was reasonable, that the tribunal's decision was reasonable. And they noted that the policy discriminated against some non-residents. Um, and so that was sufficient to find discrimination, 
right? By parsing them out. And they didn't accept the defense from Imperial Oil that the real reason they revoked the job was because of dishonesty, because there wasn't enough evidence um, provided at the, at the tribunal hearing uh, uh, for that finding, right? So what do we take away from this? Um, so I think the first thing to keep in mind as an employer is that you shouldn't be discriminating against based on the type of work permit or legal right to work in Canada. If they have the right to work in Canada, even if it might be temporary, that should be treated the same as a permanent authorization to work in Canada. Now, if their uh, right to work in Canada expires under a temporary permit, then that's different. Then you'd have your legal obligation not to employ them uh, kick in and you could terminate their employment at that basis, on that basis. It's also a good idea not to ask questions in the interview process regarding their citizenship, uh, place of birth, ethnic origin or anything like that, right? Keep that out of the interview process. And I would also suggest that you don't even ask about citizenship when asking for confirmation of ability to work in Canada. Uh, because if you have a work permit, you may not be a citizen, but quite frankly, from a legal perspective, whether or not they are a full Canadian citizen or not, or landed immigrant or here on a temporary work permit, really doesn't matter in terms of their legal right and ability to work in Canada. But to make sure that you are complying with your obligation not to hire someone who can't work in Canada legally, um, you should confirm their right to work but do it at the job offer stage. So not at the interview stage, but when you're making the job offer, you could put in the job offer. This offer is conditional on you providing proof of your ability to work in Canada. And then after you've hired them, then ask for their social insurance number. And certainly at that point, if you don't get a proper social insurance number, then the red flag could go up that the person may not have the right uh, to work in Canada. Okay, now I'm going to move on to um, uh, whether unionized employees have the right to file human rights applications. Uh, under the Ontario Labor Relations Act, arbitrators have the right to enforce employment legislation. So that includes the uh, Employment Standards Act and the Human Rights Code, um, as well as any legislation that deals with employment matters, arbitrators have the right to enforce that. And the Act also says they have sole jurisdiction to decide disputes arising out of collective agreements. Okay, so, so if somebody files a grievance, uh, or rather if somebody goes to the employer and says, you're not, uh, uh, posting a job properly that I want to apply to, or you're not paying me the overtime I'm owed under the collective agreement, right? Or in some other aspect, not complying with the collective agreement, then they have to file a grievance, right? Um, there was a case from the Court of Appeal, Weber and Ontario Hydro, that reinforced this principle and made very clear that any disputes arising out of a collective agreement go only to the labor arbitrator. They don't go to court. Um, they don't go to the human rights tribunal. It's you go to arbitration for, for those disputes. Now you can get into a bit of a gray area where you're talking about enforcement of employment legislation. So just a bit of background, there was this Supreme Court of Canada case a few years back called Northern Regional Health Authority in Horrocks. And the Supreme Court in that case came up with a two-part test for deciding whether a labor arbitrator or an administrative tribunal would have exclusive jurisdiction to decide a dispute. And, you know, pretty simple, really. The first thing they ask is, well, does the legislation 
give exclusive jurisdiction over that matter that's being um, uh, the subject matter of the dispute. And then, okay, does this dispute fall within that matter or fall within that jurisdiction? So then we come to, uh, you know, the Human Rights Tribunal now dealing with this issue in a case called Will Gosh in London District Catholic School Board. Um, so in this case, the tribunal noted, first of all, that arbitrators only have exclusive jurisdiction over disputes arising from collective agreements. That is what is provided for under the Labor Relations Act. Um, and they've decided that arbitrators and the tribunal have concurrent <clears throat> jurisdiction over enforcement of the Human Rights Code. So what that basically means is an arbitrator could deal with a discrimination complaint arising from the Human Rights Code, but so could the Human Rights Tribunal. And they they focus very much in that first part of the Horrocks test I was mentioning that as to whether the legislation grants exclusive jurisdiction to the labor arbitrator. And they said, well, that's not actually what the legislation says. And in fact, the code gives the Human Rights Tribunal jurisdiction over disputes arising from the code. And they noted that there are spots in the code where their jurisdiction is ousted. And one example they gave is if an employee files a wrongful dismissal claim in court that includes human rights allegations, then the court then has exclusive jurisdiction over that claim, not the tribunal. So what are the practical takeaways from this? If you're a unionized employer, there, there are a few of them that you should be mindful of. Um, first and foremost is if you have a em unionized employee who doesn't file a grievance alleging discrimination, but goes straight to the Human Rights Tribunal, leaves their union out of it, then um, you know, there's really not a whole lot you can do to stop them from that. And in fact, there's one or two unions out there I've seen where that's their like routine advice to the members is, well, don't bother us with a grievance. Just file a complaint to the Human Rights Tribunal, which to me seems wrong because <laughs> you know, a union's duty is to represent their members. And quite frankly, they're much better served by going through the grievance arbitration process than going to the Human Rights Tribunal, right? Like remember that almost 600 days to get you know, to get processed through the Human Rights Tribunal process. Well, if they file a, a grievance uh, under the collective agreement, uh, I mean, they've even got the right to expedite it if they want to under the Labor Relations Act, in which case the hearing is scheduled to start within three weeks of, of them filing the request for expedited arbitration. And even if they don't do that, they'll likely get to a hearing much faster than if they go through the tribunal process. But in any event, that's their right. If they go that route, um, then they can go to the tribunal. But where, where things get murky is if they file a grievance and then also go to the Human Rights Tribunal, right? Um, generally speaking, like if, this might come up in a discharge case in particular, right? You've terminated the employee, they file a grievance. Now, um, if, they're, if they claim in the grievance that they've been discriminated against or the reason for the termination was in breach of the Human Rights Code, right? Let's say if the claim was because of age, race, you know, gender, et cetera, then they're raising that issue of the Human Rights Code in the grievance. So in, in those cases, if they then also file the human rights application, which happens sometimes, then in your response to the human rights application, you can say, well, they've already filed this case here and we shouldn't have to deal with both of them, right? And usually what the tribunal will do is they will defer the hearing of their application pending the outcome of the uh, arbitration. And the same thing can happen with, say, a human, sorry, with a worker's uh, WSIB claim, right? 
where if they claim, oh, I was injured and then they fired me and I filed a workers comp claim. Well, same thing. If they then go to the human rights tribunal, you can ask the human rights tribunal to defer that application until the decision is made by the uh, uh, either WSIB or WSIAT, whoever deals with it. Then ultimately, if you do get a decision in the grievance or the other pr proceeding, then any findings that deal with human rights matters should be followed by the human rights tribunal and could dispose entirely of the human rights application. Now, if you have a case, uh, say a grievance that gets filed and it settles, right? Especially if it's a discharge case and maybe you offer the union a certain amount of money and or the griever and they take it. Okay. All fine and good, but make sure that in your either minutes of settlement or you have a release signed that covers human rights claims. Uh, because if you don't, the employee might say, well, I just said whether or not they had just cause to fire me. And I, that's what I was grieving. I wasn't raising the fact they discriminated against me based on a prohibited ground. And so there's a risk then the tribunal might, after you've paid the employee on the discharge case, might still take their case and decide whether or not they're discriminated against contrary to the code. So you want to make sure they get covered off. Okay, family status discrimination. I know that this is becoming more and more of an issue uh, for employers. And part of the uh, challenge employers face is deciding how to uh, you know, weed through whether or not you have a duty to accommodate family status accommodation requests, right? So the, there are two tasks floating out there. Um, the first one I'll call the Johnstone test came from a case that went to the federal human rights tribunal and then went to the federal court of appeal. And they came up with a test that actually sets a fairly high bar. And in my view, uh, a sensible test for approaching these cases where the employee had to show or has to show several things like, first of all, they have a child under their care. They have legal responsibility for the child and that's engaged. It's not just personal choice, i.e. Um, I need to have like accommodation in the form of alternate work hours or something like that because I actually need it and not just because it's a preference. And as well, the employee would have to show that all reasonable efforts were made to meet their child care obligations through reasonable alternative solutions and they could not find them. And that the workplace rule interferes in their child care obligations in a manner that's not trivial or unsubstantial. So that was from the federal sphere. Uh, here in Ontario, the Human Rights Tribunal has followed a different test, first laid down in a case called Meistich. And it's quite broad. It really just says, does the employee have a characteristic protected from discrimination? And that, that it's very broad. Like, if family st status is engaged, then the employee has a characteristic prohibited from discrimination. So that basically, like most people are part of a family. So most people potentially could have this engaged with respect to their employment. Then the employee must show that the employer requirement has having an adverse impact on their family status. And the, they must also show that their protected characteristic anti, sorry, their uh, uh, family status was a factor in the adverse impact. So very, very broad, right? Not a lot of clear guidance for employers to deal with these cases. And uh, so then we have this case, Espinoza and Napanee Beaver Limited, which I think also shows how broad it is, but the employee became pregnant. Uh, she went on a medical leave, first of all, and then maternity leave. Uh, while on the leave, she asked if she could work on a modified work schedule when she returned. And at that point, she was refused. And when she made that request, she said she wanted to have more time with her kids on Fridays. Now, then after that, she asked again. But this time, she specifically invoked the Human Rights Code. 
and said, I'm requesting accommodation under the Human Rights Code. And the employer uh, took some time to get back to the, this employee. They took 45 days to respond at that point. And then they told the employee no and said, you have two weeks to get full-time daycare um, and you have to come back on your regular hours in the office. Now, the employee said that's not enough time. And she was having some particular difficulties because she had twins. And uh, in her area, most of the daycare was in-home daycare. And under government regulations, you couldn't have uh, more than one child on, you know, under a certain age. So she said she couldn't do it. And um, then she quit. Um, now, none of the employer's witnesses said that granting the request would actually impose an you know, undue hardship. So the uh, Human Rights Tribunal applied that Meistich test I referred to. It considered the Johnstone test I referred to earlier and rejected it. And uh, it's an interesting decision because it found no breach and then a breach. So the tribunal found there was no breach with respect to the employee's first request for accommodation because she didn't invoke... Uh, she didn't say she absolutely had to have it, and she didn't invoke the employer's obligations under the Human Rights Code, which to me seems a bit legally technical, but that's what they said. But then the second time around, when the employee invoked the code and said she needs this to accommodate her childcare obligations, and the employer said no, then the vice chair found that that did breach the code. Okay. And the vice chair went on to say that the employee didn't have to show that she had made reasonable efforts to find childcare obligations. Seems like in the hearing, the employer put a lot of energy into cross-examining the employee to show that she didn't do everything she really could have done to find alternate childcare. And I think reading the decision, they probably had a pretty good argument on that. It seemed like there were some holes in what she had done, but the, tribunal didn't care. They said, look, you know, she didn't have to show that she did everything she reasonably could have done. Basically, as soon as the request had been made, invoking the code and making clear she needed this accommodation as part of her family status, the ball was then in the employer's court to show why they couldn't reasonably accommodate this short of undue hardship. And it looks like the employer just basically didn't do a very good job in digging into why they couldn't accommodate the employee short of undue hardship. They just said no. And also the vice chair seemed to put a lot of weight in the fact they waited 45 days and responded and then gave her only two weeks to uh, uh, find childcare. So in the end, they found a breach on that basis. They awarded her lost wages. They got, you know, they got lucky on this. She found a job fairly quickly uh, and she was awarded a little over 12,000 lost wages plus another $10,000 for injury to dignity um, and her feelings and self-respect. So just some practical pointers that we can take away on dealing with family status requests. Um, if the employee is asking for it, you know, just clarify whether they require the accommodation or if it's just something, you know, they require the accommodation, it's linked to their child care obligations or it could be parental care obligations. Make, make that clear. And then if it is, then you need to engage in a process of seeing if you can accommodate short of undue hardship, right? Uh, and, and by the way, in that Johnstone case, that's where the employer fell down as well. It, in the context of disability cases, the tribunal talks about the procedural aspect of the duty to accommodate, along with the substantive aspect. So basically what that means is they want to see that you've tried, that you turned your mind to it, you looked hard, there's some documentation showing you've grappled with whether or not you could accommodate, right? And you need to show that, and then you also need to show that you couldn't accommodate to the point of undue hardship. So you really need to do both. So make sure you don't just close your mind and say no. Otherwise, uh, you could get into trouble with the tribunal. And make sure you 
reply in a timely manner and don't just kind of uh, put a push off on it. And then if you can't accommodate or you, you tell the employee you cannot, be clear as to why, right? Set out specifically what the operational impact is going to be if you cannot accommodate the employee. Okay, and then finally, what I'm going to be uh, talking about is how the tribunal is dealing with weaker applications. So um, it, the reality is most, you know, newsflash, most of the applications that get filed at the Human Rights Tribunal are weak applications. Like they don't make out a great case for violation of the Human Rights Code. Now, part of that is because a lot of the applicants are self-represented. And uh, as I said before, it's free to file a complaint. And a lot of people go there just kind of also hoping they can shake the employer down for a few bucks and see what they can get. Uh, and a lot of people don't understand that the Human Rights Tribunal's jurisdiction is limited to prohibited grounds of discrimination, right? And, and as well, you've got to have some evidence that you actually were discriminated against. So what the Human Rights Tribunal has developed to deal with these cases is a process they call the summary hearing. And uh, this is usually like a conference call. Uh, they can last an hour or two. And the vice chair on these calls spends most of their time quizzing the applicant as to what the basis for their complaint is. Because sometimes these applications that get filed at the tribunal are very uh, hard to understand, quite frankly not always coherent in everything that's set out. Sometimes they it's, they say very little and sometimes they say a lot. You might have 20 pages of a rambling narrative that has no paragraphs, <laughs> and a lot of caps and things like that. So so they want to find out, okay, like giving them the benefit of that, let's find out what, what they might actually have as a case. And you on the employer side, typically you're not calling witnesses Although you might be asked some questions in terms of what you did. And uh, when I do the cases, I make very clear, like fairly forcefully, what our defense is and why we say there wasn't a breach of the code. So then the tribunal applies this test, which is, does this case have a reasonable prospect of success? Right Now, they, the idea here is not to determine whether or not the applicant is telling the truth. They basically assume what the applicant is saying is correct, but they do take uh, what they also call a global evaluation of the case. So they do take into account how the employer dealt with things as well. Um, but they don't just accept the applicant's assumptions as to why they were fired or why they were disciplined or why some, they didn't get the job they wanted, right? They want to see that there are some factual allegations made that if true, could support the conclusion that the code was breached. So here's a recent case to give you an example of how these, uh, how the tribunal is dealing with these cases. So we had an employee who is a short service employee. She was a CSR. There was a policy not to use cell phones during working time. She had a, a, an ill father and asked for an exception to the policy. Now, the employer agreed on the basis that she can only take emergency calls, right? So if it was an emergency call regarding her father, she could take the call. Now, after about four months, uh, well, after three months, they did a performance, like end of probationary period review where the employer, you know, reminded her of this policy that these are the rules and asked her what was happening and what accommodations she needed. And then a month later, she was terminated and they just told her she was no longer required. They didn't say too much more than that. So uh, the tribunal dismissed the case and found that there was no reasonable prospect of success. And they made the point that the applicant's belief that she was terminated because of her request for accommodation and because of her family status, there's nothing on which to for that to be based. They said... The employer's rule was reasonable. And in this case, the employer didn't provide much of a reason, which I think left them open uh, to, the, to this kind of situation. But they, they were okay. They, basically, the, the tribunal said, look, we don't have anything on which we could concretely conclude 
that there was a breach of the code. So um, what does this mean for you if you're facing a complaint? Uh, if you get one of these applications, take a close look at it. And if they're not alleging concrete facts that could underpin a finding of a breach of the code, then you're probably going to want to ask for one of these summary hearings. And you do that by filing a separate form. And, uh, you know, if you get to one of these summary hearings, you've probably seen a reasonable chance of success there and can avoid yourself the grief of going to a full-blown human rights hearing, which is essentially like a trial. So those are my comments. Uh, I think this is break time now, really. So we're breaking until 3 o'clock? 3 o'clock. Yeah, and then at 3 o'clock we come back. We have uh, four short topics and uh, some interesting recent developments on those. So please stick around, and we look forward to seeing you in a few minutes. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your break. And now uh, this is the most exciting uh, uh, program of the day because it's like really short hits on a variety of different employment topics. Um, so the I'll, I'll kick it off because I'm, I'm talking about Canada Labor Code amendments. Now, uh, fortunately for most of you, you're not regulated under the Canada Labor Code. The Canada Labor Code is for employers that fall under federal jurisdiction. This includes, for example, First Nations employers, uh, airlines, railways, telecommunications, as well as companies whose but the nature of their work is interprovincial, as well as certain other works that might be declared to be under the federal uh, jurisdiction. So for most of you, uh, this doesn't apply. Um, so if you have some emails you want to check the next seven minutes, I won't be offended. But it may not hurt to pay attention because uh, I think the Ontario Ministry might just be getting a few ideas from this. So don't be surprised if some of these uh, innovative amendments don't find their way into uh, provincial legislation. First of all, there's new requirements actually set out in the code for employers to reimburse employees for reasonable work-related expenses. So interestingly, like under the Employment Standards Act doesn't speak to that here in Ontario. Uh, so this is something new. Uh, now the expenses have to be work-related and they have to be reasonable. So as you might imagine, the, there could be a lot of uh, dispute about what that means. But assuming they are work-related and reasonable, the employer must reimburse the employee within 30 days of the employee submitting the claim, unless there's another time frame established by a written agreement or a collective agreement. Next off, uh, there's a new obligation to provide uh, employees with materials made available by the Federal Ministry of Labor respecting employment rights. Um, and they must be provided within 30 days of an employee's first day of work. Now, uh, last I checked, uh, the federal, at least I couldn't find it. It doesn't look like the federal ministry has actually gotten around to publishing what these materials are. So it doesn't apply until 90 days after the day these uh, materials are first made available. So if you are federally regulated, every once in a while, you just might want to check in on the ministry, federal ministry of labor's website to see if the materials are available. Um, another uh, new requirement is for employers to provide employees with written statements regarding certain terms and conditions related to their employment. And this must be provided within 30 days of their first day of work. <clears throat> the regulation outlines the information that must be provided, like job title, rate of wages, and um, this must be updated uh, if there are any changes made to these requirements. Now, I, most employers provide this in any event, but um, if, if you don't, well, you got to do it now. Another new requirement is the provision of menstrual uh, products in the workplace. This would come into effect December 15, 2023. The uh, new requirement is to provide menstrual products, including, uh, they say, clean and hygienic tampons and menstrual pads in each toilet room, and also a container for disposing of the products. And if you don't have them in a washroom, 
then the employer can provide uh, another private controlled space for these products. Um, next, we have uh, an increase that'll be coming into effect February the 1st, 2024 to termination entitlements. Uh, the, the Canada Labor Code is actually fairly cheap for employees compared to a provincial, especially the Ontario Employment Standards Act, um, which provides in, in Ontario, you employees get up to eight weeks notice. Plus, if they have five years or more of service and the payroll's over two and a half million for the, the employer, then the employee also gets a week pre or severance pay. So the um, um, currently the Canada Labor Code only provides for two weeks of notice or pay in lieu of notice. Uh, so this is going to be increased to two weeks after three consecutive months of employment. And then after that, three weeks, after three years, and then an additional week per year, up to a maximum of eight weeks. And uh, in addition to that, they also receive severance pay in, under the Canada Labor Code, which is two days uh, pay um, per year or, or a minimum of five days pay. And then finally, the uh, ministry will have the power to impose administrative monetary penalties for failure to comply and the amount of the penalty will vary depending on the circumstances including type of the violation the size of the employer and the employer's compliance history so that's it who's up all right i guess i'm next welcome to the world of occupational health and safety once again uh a couple of things. Um, the first case I wanted to discuss, um, it's the only case I really want to refer to specifically because there's uh, so many Ontario occupational health and safety cases. It might be more helpful to give you a more broad overview than talk about the specific facts of a specific case. But um, the, the case I wanted to refer to is R versus King. I mean, some of you may have uh, attended the Blame the Boss uh, webinar that Jeremy Schwartz and I put on a while ago. Um, this was a case of a super, an individual supervisor, Mr. King, uh, who was charged individually arising out of uh, an accident uh, in New Brunswick um, that had to do with improperly securing a drain and a tragic uh, drowning of a worker. Um, so for those of you who don't know, criminal cases are uh, essentially um, the Crown has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt wanton and reckless disregard uh, by the accused, uh, which means basically that it's not just an OHSA violation, it's something that's really beyond, uh, uh, beyond serious. Uh, and is someone that was grossly grossly reckless. And Mr. King's interesting defense was, well, it was all the employer's fault. Ever heard that one before? Uh, ultimately suggesting that, uh, uh, that he, um, he acknowledged that he himself didn't bother to read any of the training manuals that were provided to him by the employer. Uh, and uh, even though he claimed to the employer, he did. Uh, but uh, so his whole philosophy was that, uh, you know, even though he didn't bother to take the employer's training, that was the, the employer um, should have trained him better. That obviously that went well in court. Yeah, not really. Uh, so ultimately, he was uh, convicted of criminal negligence causing death, which is um, a relative. There's not been too many of those um, convictions in Canada, despite the uh, amendments to the criminal code and Bill C-45 some tw almost 20 years ago now. Uh, ultimately, um, the question was interesting is what would be his sentence? How long would he spend in jail? Ultimately, his, his lawyer's position is that he um, should uh, be basically on the equivalent of house arrest. Uh, the Crown sought a more significant sentence, and he got a three-year jail sentence, which is known as federal time uh, in criminal circles, uh, meaning that he, um, which is one of the longer sentences that's ever been imposed against an individual uh, for a workplace safety violation in Canada. It's a symbol that uh, we might be shifting towards where there are significant safety violations uh, towards uh, uh, some uh, issues of more jail time uh, for individuals. And that's something supervisors have to appreciate. Um, historically, in moving to provincial fines in Ontario, um, there was a fine against um, a supervisor recently. Um, historically, supervisor fines involving fatalities have been somewhere in the range of uh, 10, 25,000 on the high end. Um, there was a recent case where that fine went, went up to $70,000 plus the victim fine surcharge uh, in, in a case uh, involving a supervisor who failed, who was supposed to be uh, assigned to a position where he was to ensure that a fire extinguisher was used in a particular operation in a mine. And not only did he not ensure the fire extinguisher was being used, he was in his uh, truck uh, doing something else. 
So ultimately, this is, to my knowledge, the highest fine ever imposed on a single count against a supervisor uh, in the province of Ontario, and a symbol that perhaps we're moving away from this historic range of relatively low fines or even, frankly, charges withdrawn against supervisors if corporations plead guilty. So, I mean, again, very much a significant change. That is a huge amount of money uh, to be imposed against a supervisor because when you factor in the victim side and fine surcharge, uh, which is a tax on a fine that doesn't go directly to the victim, interestingly, uh, you're looking at close to $100,000 in fines. Um, we, I, I alluded to during my Sudbury presentation an increase in the fines in Ontario, the maximum fines. Those haven't really had a significant impact. Look at the fines this year. Um, critical injuries, which are things like broken arms and broken legs and things like that, uh, we are looking at the range of fines. Smaller companies have been in the range of around fifty to sixty thousand uh, dollars, closer to one hundred ninety to one hundred thousand dollars for larger companies. Uh, fatalities, smaller companies, low end is about seventy five thousand. Uh, larger companies, higher end is just over three hundred thousand. General Motors was at three twenty five, which was the highest um, fine that I was able to find that was imposed against an individual company this year. So, but those ranges are pretty consistent for first offenders or larger. Um, Larger entities. I haven't seen uh, uh, significant shifts uh, in, um, despite the increase in the maximum fines as of yet. I will certainly report back uh, uh, if that changes. But really, this, the story is health and safety penalties for this year is about individuals, jail time, and criminal offenses, and uh, and certainly at least one very significant fine uh, as uh, as against a supervisor. Uh, well, well, we got to keep an eye on it. With, certainly, with the increase in the maximum fines, the reality is that. Health and safety prosecutions don't move with, with alacrity, as they say. I mean, they have now up to two years to lay the charges and 18 months to bring the matter to, to conclusion once the charges are laid. So it'll take a year or two for us to get a real sense whether the range of penalties imposed in Ontario have increased. But certainly, uh, fines are on the way up and penalties particularly as against individuals. Thanks, Ryan. So I guess uh, it's my turn to talk about the changes to the uh, occupational health, sorry, the uh, employment standards that you have me think about the OHSA. Uh, so uh, Mr. Ford and his government were, were aware that I had this presentation today, so they saw fit to introduce a new Working for Workers Act, part four, just for me. That's why they did it, not because of, they're trying to address any actual problems in the workplace. Uh, like some movies should not be made. Sequels, most should not be made. Um, if you guys can remember back as far before the pandemic, I know we all have sort of a fog, but the wind government right before they were fighting for re-election, they just changed everything, right? The Employment Standards Act, Labor Relations Act, all these things had huge changes all over the place. And the first thing that Mr. Ford's government did when they came into power within about a month or two, they just wiped almost all of those changes completely out, right? So the, the wind government had a bunch of uh, uh, committees and, and reports that came, a report that came out, and then these changes were introduced. Uh, Mr. Ford's government didn't have any of that. He just sort of wiped out everything that uh, the wing government did and then has been slowly introducing things in the last three years. Um, and frankly, I remember all the seminars that we had, you know, helping everybody get ready for the changes that were initially made. And then all the seminars and policy changes we had to do to get all that stuff we worked unmade, right? I don't know if you, you guys lived, that, uh, lived with us through that. Uh, but in any event, we've got this sort of these, this snazzy title. And so now we're all distracted from the sound bites about all the sort of stuff that's been going on. So fantastic. The Working for Workers Act Part 4. Um, now, some of the changes are pretty vanilla. Some of them most employers would have expected uh, were already part of the act, although there's been some issues about it. Uh, for example, the uh, definition of employee now includes someone who's doing a trial shift or a trial period. Um, and so that is considered work by an employee. You can't just sort of try somebody out and then not pay them minimum wage, uh, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, it sort of boggled my mind. It never occurred to me they weren't employees, but apparently there was some confusion there. But there were a couple of really big changes that are, were announced, and I thought uh, I, sh I really should take them to you. Um, one of them, for example, is the obligation, seemingly innocuous obligation, if this law passes, which it likely will, um, that employers who are posting jobs um, and AI is used in the selection screening uh, um, or assessment process that you have to say uh, in the application that you're using AI, 
sounds simple. You know, okay, AI is the buzzword. Let's all do that. Um, I think the timing is very innocuous. And for those who are watching the privacy sphere and, and thinking about these things, and I, I tend to be fairly focused on these things. Um, the federal government recently amended PIPEDA. Okay, which generally doesn't uh, affect employers in Ontario because we don't we don't have to follow the, the, the PIPEDA for employment law. We do it for commercial and things like that, but not with respect to our employees. Um, but they also uh, amended and created this new law, this sort of companion legislation called the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act, the provisions of which will be in place by 2025. Why should you all care? Well, um, the most serious oversight and enforcement provisions are going to be applied to so-called high impact systems, which likely include all employment related uses of AI from recruitment, assessment, selection, internal promotions, layoffs, you name it. And AIDA, or whatever, I'm not sure how you pronounce the, this acronym, um, it's no laughing matter, okay? So it has teeth. The maximum potential fines, the greater of $10 million and 3% of your gross global revenue for violations of AIDA. So if you don't know what that is, um, now would be a great time after this to go looking at it. But this, this came up just as the government now is saying, you all have to tell people when you're using AI in your recruitment process. So add to this that telling candidates that you're using AI paints a human rights target on your back. Um, Amazon learned this the hard way when they had to scrap their AI engine because it was found that the data sets had trained their AI to be biased. Uh, uh, both on gender and other, other uh, ra racial basis. Um, the U.S. Uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, recently filed suit against Facebook, which was allowing employers to target their ads to people of certain ages, certain ethnicities, certain backgrounds, all those sorts of things. And they said it violated their anti-discrimination laws. Um, and here in Canada, once an employee, you heard from Landon, once an employee asserts a human rights violation, the onus of proof is flipped. Now the employer has to prove that they didn't discriminate. But if, if you're not in charge of your AI, if you're using Indeed or one of these other services, you have no idea what their algorithm did. You, you, you have no idea if AI is being used for this, this, or the other thing, and you might not be able to see inside that black box. So now you're telling people, or you have to tell people, we're using a service that uses AI to do this sort of screening and selection process for us. And now you have to disprove when someone says, I'm a black disabled uh, uh, person who comes from another country, that any of those factors was part of the reasons why this AI refused to select that person for hiring. And you can't see inside the black box, so you have absolutely no idea. So I don't know how this is going to drive change when the majority of employers are using gigantic third-party services for their recruitment, and they have absolutely no control over the way any of those things work. Uh, so basically, the Ontario legislation requires employers to invite lawsuits. Um, I I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I think this could be a real problem. I don't I don't see any discussion about this in the debates. Um, in 2018, there was the Pay Transparency Act, which sort of got shelved when the Ford government came in. It was got royal assent, but was never proclaimed in force. So it's technically still out there, but no one's doing anything with it. So now under the Working for Workers Act Part 4, uh, employers will have to post salary uh, uh, ranges for the jobs that they post, either the salary or the salary range. There's a few other provinces that did that. BC is a good example. They did it a year or two ago. Um, and I think PEI did it last year. Um, and this seems to be the way of the world. Everyone's sort of moving in that direction. Uh, we don't have regulations yet. And sometimes the devil is in the details. Uh, but for example, I have some questions, right? Will it be permissible to post that this is the salary? And then when you interview someone, the person you hire really doesn't justify what you suggested was going to be their rate. Can you pay them less? Can you pay them more if you're having trouble recruiting? Do you have to report if what you initially posted as the salary range isn't what you ultimately put forward? Um, at first blush, this appears to be a good idea, right? It's, it's about transparency. Hopefully it'll cause employers to uh, ensure that they're not biased in their hiring decisions. Hopefully it'll mean that, that sort of the gender and other wage gaps are closing over time. Um, but there are some unintended consequences, I think, that we're all going to see as a result of this. Um, what if the salary range posted is below what current staff are getting? Will they read this as a sign the company is looking at cost cutting and layoffs? Are people who are getting paid an extra 10 grand a year for the same job, are they going to be wondering to themselves, uh, are they going to hire someone new and then lay off the more expensive people? 
That's a legitimate concern post-pandemic. Um, what if you only have a few people or one in that position? Are you now telegraphing to everyone that person's personal financial information? Here's what Joey is earning, right? Um, what if it's a tight labor market and you're forced to pay a premium for certain positions to outcompete, um, but you don't want to uh, increase the amount you're paying to your current workforce because then it's sort of doubling the cost of that premium. Um, what 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 will the effect be on your current staff? Will they not be disgruntled that you're bringing in new people at or about the same amount of money that they've been here for five years and that's all they're making? Uh, the timing on this is also very interesting. Uh, the Federal Competition Act came in force this past June and the changes prohibit agreements between employers to fix wages. It's one of the things they're not allowed to do. Um, you can't, uh, there's a no poaching agreement. So two employers can't agree not to hire each other's workers. That's now illegal as of June. Um, but also they're not allowed to fix wages between the camp, right? But now we've got this obligation to post your salary or your salary band. So we, you, you sort of say the, the government of Ontario made me do it. That's the new defense. I'm not engaged in a conspiracy to fix wages. I'm just posting the salary in accordance with uh, um, Mr. Ford's wishes. Um, also, uh, in case you thought it was a good idea, uh, having a, an automatic data retention and deletion policy so that you, maybe no one will know this is all going on, uh, you're required to hold on to all your job posting and all application forms for three years after the ad is pulled from public access online. Okay, so you've got to hold on to everything. If you're posting it in 14 different places, um, then you're going to have to pull those down. Uh, the new law will also uh, prohibit employers from posting or including in any forms a requirement that uh, people uh, uh, related to Canadian experience. So you can't specifically say you must have experience in Canada or whatever else. Uh, for now, again, we don't have regulations. We don't know uh, if there's going to be a requirement that employers have to ignore the fact that someone doesn't have Canadian experience or that we can't place greater weight on Canadian experience when it is on a resume, but you're not allowed to post it in the specific application po uh, uh, post online. And I'll just end with, uh, hopefully you can all join me next year uh, when no doubt I wrote this joke out. So I'm just going to read it. Uh, we will be discussing the Working for Workers Act Part 5, or maybe a reboot of the whole saga starring your favorite B-list celebs from the early 2000s. The possibilities are truly truly endless <laughs> see bum, bum, bum. i knew this would be about 3 yeah. 30 so i just thought i had to very droll thank you very very droll. Droll. all right your very turn good. very funny okay uh, thank you jeremy so um you can introduce my topic okay. <laughs> jeff will be talking about the significant labor arbitration decisions yeah so i'm going to be talking about two significant labor arbitration decisions in canada over the last year um, these cases uh, deal with the process of labor arbitration and uh, i think are going to have um, significant um, influence in the years to come prior to the pandemic a labor arbitration was always held in person, uh, just like a civil trial was always held in person. The parties got together at a uh, official recorder's office, sometimes at a conference center, and the arbitrator was there, the employer was there, the union was there, and it was uh, very much like a mini trial. With the shutdown of 2020, uh, the whole process uh, had to turn 180 degrees on a dime. And over the course of really 30 days, uh, an entirely new process of arbitration was born, and that was uh, remote hearings where uh, lawyers could be in separate cities and separate provinces, witnesses could be in separate cities and separate provinces, the arbitrator could be in a different country, uh, but everyone was uh, in the same Zoom account or Microsoft Teams account, and the hearing went ahead like that. Clearly, practical problems uh, arose from that, uh, largely related to ensuring that witnesses uh, were actually alone while they were giving their testimony. But to a large extent, uh, the parties accepted the process. And for the last couple of years, that has been how arbitration has taken place in the past, uh, uh, well, over the past couple of years. Uh, this, of course, was all a product of necessity uh, with um, government regulations prohibiting uh, a certain number of people in meetings, physical distancing, and so for cases to be heard, they had to take place online. 
now that uh, mandates have been lifted and there are no limitations on the number of people uh, permitted in any room at any time other than the fire code, uh, the question then became, would the labor relations community go back to having in-person hearings? And by large measure, uh, most cases have taken place remotely by the consent of both sides. However, uh, there are cases where one side wants a remote hearing and another side wants the case heard in person. So this year, there have been two cases to decide that issue. The first was decided in January uh, 2023 involving OPSU and the Toronto Bail Program. Uh, that case was a discharge case. The employer wanted the hearing held in person and basically argued that uh, an in-person hearing was most appropriate to determine the credibility of the witnesses that were giving evidence in the hearing. The uh, union, on the other hand, said that its uh, direction from the provincial union was that all arbitrations are to take place remotely. Uh, and argued that this was cost-effective and should be followed. Uh, so the arbitrator had to decide whether he was going to require the parties to get together in an act the same physical space or conduct the hearing remotely. Uh, the employer argued before the arbitrator that uh, we're now at a point in the legal world where trials in the Superior Court and in the Ontario Court of Justice are now taking place again in person. The Ontario Labor Relations Board has directed that its hearings are now to take place in person, and therefore the labor arbitrator should follow that path uh, cut by other actors in the legal system. Uh, the union, uh, on the other hand, essentially argued that um, it expected the mediation to take place in person, uh, sorry, remotely. Um, and that it was more cost effective. And for that reason, it should get what it wanted. The arbitrator decided that the hearing, in fact, would take place remotely. The fact that courts and tribunals are requiring that hearings take place in person was immaterial to what should happen in the arbitration milieu on the basis that arbitration is a consensual process and uh, unlike a court or tribunal compelling people to come to its location to um, hear the case. The arbitrator said that most hearings in the past few years have taken place remotely. And in most of those cases, both sides agreed that they should take place remotely. And therefore, it's uncommon for any party to want a case to happen in person. And therefore, the presumption, uh, although the arbitrator took pains not to use the word presumption. The presumption is that uh, absence and agreement, the hearing should take place in uh, remotely. Go forward six months in time and a similar issue arises in Alberta. Again, another discharge case. In this case, it is the employer that wants the case to be heard remotely. Uh, because the case uh, originates from a workplace in Lethbridge and a number of the participants in the hearing are in Calgary and they don't want to travel to Lethbridge. Um, the union, on the other hand, wanted the hearing to take place in person. And so this is a case where the it's a discharge case, like the Toronto Bail Program case, but in this case, the shoes are on the other feet. Uh, the employer argues cost-effective, don't have to travel to Lethbridge, no need for overnight hotels. The union argues that, and this is the argument that was made, the griever needs to look her accusers in the eye, needs to feel the dynamic in the room. And the griever can benefit from the union's in-person assistance at the hearing. The arbitrator said, well, you know, there's pros and cons to both sides of this issue. However, uh, a video conference can't match the personal connectivity provided by in-person hearings. And therefore, when scheduling issues are minor, uh, the pros and cons have equal merit. The balance should tip in favor of the preference of the griever. So uh, it's the griever's livelihood that is uh, at stake in a discharge case. 
and the griever would benefit from reassurance if the process the griever wants as follows, uh, the griever is more likely to accept the outcome in the case. Uh, how do we reconcile these two cases? On the one hand, the employer wanted it remotely. Uh, sorry, on one hand, the union wants it remotely and gets it. On the other hand, uh, the employer wants it remotely, but the union gets it in person. I think reading these two cases together, uh, you come up with the uh, bedrock principle that the union gets what it wants. That's it. This is the part where my laugh is start. Yes. <laughs> that was an impromptu joke. Jeremy. I didn't, uh, didn't write it down. All right, guys. So uh, now is the Q&A portion of our uh, afternoon. Uh, so uh, 30, roughly 30 minutes. And this Q&A is for uh, questions related to any of the sessions we've had this afternoon, including the lightning session. Uh, we do have one question from Allison. So maybe I'll pass that down, give her a chance to read it. And then uh, why don't we ask, um, uh, here's a question for Landed. Um, would the principles of accommodation for childcare also apply to elder care? <clears throat> yes, they they would. And I know in the Johnstone decision, that point was noted. Uh, so I, I, I can see no substantive reason why the tribunal would take a different approach for elder care than child care. So that's actually an easy answer. Yes. Um, and uh, this one's just so we can all commiserate. I don't think it's a real question, so I'll read it while you guys are, and then I'll, I'll ask Allison to answer. Uh, why is time theft not a criminal matter? Why? Okay, so everyone ponder that. Allison, are you ready for your yes. Uh, question? Yes. So the first question is, should our new employment agreement, should a new employment agreement to document a change in job responsibility provide an offer of fresh consideration as an incentive to accept the new terms? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, um, when you're making a significant change in terms and conditions for an existing employee, uh, or let's say you just want to standardize, as I've heard many times, your employment agreements, you cannot just hand an existing employee a new contract and say, here, sign this. Uh, you know, it, an employee may sign it, but it's not binding because they already have the job and the job is normally the consideration for the original terms. So you, you're not giving them anything new and your, your agreement may be taking things away from them. So if you want an employee to agree to new terms and conditions, including if you are promoting them, changing their job duties, whatever the case may be, then you want to have an agreement, a new agreement that specifically says that we're giving you such and such in fresh consideration. That can be monetary. It could be an additional week's vacation. It can be uh, options or incentives or various other forms of new compensation, but it should be stipulated that it is new consideration. And if there's if you say we're going to give you $50 to sign this agreement, make sure they get paid the $50 and keep the receipt. Because when you're in a situation where your consideration for your agreement is being challenged, it's very helpful to have it spelled out in the new agreement that there was fresh consideration, what it was, and that it was actually provided. And in the face of that, your agreement will, at least on those grounds, maybe not on termination grounds, but on those grounds, your agreement will, will hold up. If you do not do that, it's, it's uh, a commonplace for agreements like that to be set aside on the basis that there was no fresh consideration for them. Should I go into my next one? Sure. Okay. Is an employer legally obligated to inform, explain to an employee a reason for termination when it is without cause? Uh, no. Uh, you can just terminate someone and say they're being terminated and provide them with what you feel is reasonable notice at common law through the offer of a severance package. Is it a good idea to give a reason? Yes, frequently, because sometimes if you don't tell people what the reason is, they will, as people inevitably do, uh, come to their own conclusions with or without any evidence as to what the reason was. And that will be usually a reason that is worse than the actual reason. As you heard earlier about Landon talking about, you know, what people believe in human rights cases, people will are capable of believing many things about why they were terminated. And so sometimes if you provide a reason, 
they may not be happy with the reason, but it's a reason, as opposed to no reason, where they're then looking around for what the reason is, which will normally be more nefarious, perhaps, than the other the actual reason is. So I think it's a good practice to give at least a basic uh, reason as to why an employee is being terminated just from a defensive standpoint. Uh, Landon, I think you have one in uh, person. There's a few online as well. Sure. So this question is, where does the right to work come from? Because for someone to exercise their right to work, that implies that someone else is compelled to give them that work. <clears throat> so I assume this is coming out of the uh, duty to accommodate family status that, that I was talking about. Um, I, I think it probably oversimplifies or overstates what the law says, what the tribunal is, is, has said to characterize it as a right to work. But for sure, it does impose a duty on employers to facilitate an employee's ability to work uh, who might have, say, child care, family status obligations. <clears throat> Whether that's right or wrong um, goes too far. I can't say. I mean, I just report the law. I don't make the law. But it, and I, I know, you know just, just kind of more broadly topic. Frequently, we hear from our clients because we act for employers frustration about uh, employment laws generally and how they are slanted towards employee employees against employers. And I think that's a fair comment. And that's the overall direction of employment law. Over the 27 years I've been doing this has been towards the balance of uh, the, the employee versus the employer. Um, so all, all I can say is we're here to try to help you navigate through that. Um, and uh, that's by design, right? The, the government's passed these employment laws for the purpose of uh, balancing what they see as an inherent imbalance in the economic power in the employment relationship in the favor of employers. The Supreme Court has come out repeatedly and made this comment that there's this uh, inherent imbalance in the employment relationship. I think that's probably less true today, and we're in some, particularly in some areas where there's labor shortages, where the employee has a lot of bargaining power. Um, probably less true today than it used to be, but there's probably still a fair bit of truth in that. So uh, it's not an even playing field. It's just unfortunately the way it is. Um, but we're here to try to help you work your way up that uneven playing field. That's about all I can say. And I've got a couple of quick ones, hopefully, uh, here. So one of them is, does the HRTO, the Human Rights Tribunal, have limits in damages in terms of money they can award? Um, no, they, they have very broad uh, discretion. Now, interestingly, though, like, there are no set upper limits. But I will say they tend to behave themselves, right? They, they don't get too carried away. And as a matter of fact, I would say the Human Rights Tribunal has now become a bit more conservative than the courts in terms of awarding damages. Like in the courts now, it's, it's turning into a Wild West show. I mean, you saw some of the decisions earlier and some of the damages awards coming out where they're, they're just pulling numbers out of the hat and hammering employers. Uh, whereas I think the tribunal is being a bit more restrained, maybe because they know that the courts will step in if they overdo it. But, uh, but yeah, the, to answer your question, uh, they have broad discretion. They can do it to work. Only a lawyer can take the answer no and turn it into a two-minute response to a question. <laughs> um, here's another. You here's should an, talk to I know I'm worse. <laughs> I do talk. That's the problem. All right. So, uh, Landon, you mentioned that some cases are taking at the HRTO more than 600 days. And this is a sort of an interesting question about the process. Um, what happens if a case ends up taking longer than the statute of limitations? Does that have any impact at all? Well, the statute of limitations does not apply to how long it takes for a human rights case to be heard from the date it's filed, right? Like generally, when you talk about the statute of limitations, that applies to civil claims, right? Maybe a wrongful a general wrongful dismissal claim, for example, the employee has up to two years to file the claim. Even in the courts, though, after that, it can take however long it takes before it actually gets to a hearing. And, and it's very different. You might have heard about these 
you know, criminal cases being tossed for taking too long. Um, that notion does not apply with uh, the Human Rights Tribunal. Uh, maybe it should, but it doesn't. Um, so, uh, Allison, is, is there ever a time when a fixed term agreement is appropriate? You know, to my mind, the risks associated with a fixed term agreement are rarely worth it. Uh, I can't think that I have seen an agreement that needed to be fixed term, except for the fact that it's a convention in the industry to have fixed term agreements. So these are things like uh, leadership positions, sometimes in sort of pub public facing uh, services where there's the notion that, you know, somebody's going to have a tenure of five years to lead an organization and then they'll move on and there'll be another five year tenure. And, you know, so it's got this kind of quasi uh, term associated with it as though in, in the same way as um, uh, MPs serve for a term, you know, but but these are not elected positions. They are contractual positions. There's no real connection other than it's a convention in the industry. And it, it was a convention that started at a time before we had all these helpful decisions, which say, you know, if you overhold even by a single, single day, you become a permanent employee. Or there's no mitigation associated with fixed term agreements if there's a breach and the person is fired. Or um, the termination clauses, you know, if they if the if the early termination clause falls, then you're into this very vast uh, uh, range of damages. So these things come from a, a time before all those negative decisions. And so, other than convention, I don't see a good reason for anybody to use a fixed term agreement. I think the risks are too high. I think you can, if you write a good termination clause, not necessarily an ESA clause, but a decent termination clause, if you're unhappy with the person, you let them go, you move on to someone else. Um, and, and there's hardly ever an environment where you need to have a security of tenure on both sides that's of a fixed term. So I, I can't really see the point of them. Um, as I say, if, if, if everybody agrees that it's a convention, then that's fine. But there are a lot of risks inherent in doing it. So uh, okay. I need to be convinced. So I have a follow-up question, which is exactly on that point. You and I have talked about this before, so I think I know where you're going. Um, what about a seasonal employee who's only going to be hired for a few months? Even in a seasonal case, I've had um, some employers who hire seasonally who've had to let people go for various reasons, not cause, but for various reasons, who have been very glad that they had um, good termination clauses in their fixed term agreements. So you can understand why a seasonal employee would be subject to uh, a fixed term because, you know, you're hiring for the summer and the summer starts here and ends there. And so, you know, does it make sense to hire indefinitely and then keep terminating? Maybe it doesn't. Um, the only cautionary note is that you have to have a bulletproof um, uh, early termination clause, because otherwise, as soon as you create a fixed term, you create the risk that getting rid of this person is going to cost you a lot of money. So um, it's understandable why you would do that for university students or whatever the case may be. Um, but, you know, it, it inherently has its risks. And so the question is, is it better to just say, I'm going to hire you and then I'm going to terminate you when I don't need you any longer? So, I mean, I can I can see the point for for summer students. Um, but but I was thinking more in terms of more longer term employment. I don't see any point in those circumstances. And either way, you have to have a good early termination clause if you don't want to pay way too much money if you have to let the person go. Yeah, thanks, awesome. Um, so, Lane, and this one's for you. Uh, what will happen if a candidate does not disclose that they are on a closed work permit up until the offer is issued? And at that point, the employer uh, presumably learns. Can the employer refuse to proceed after they've made that offer because they need help? This employee needs help with a new permit. First of all, I'll ask Ryan, who has in the past dabbled with immigration law, what is a closed work permit? Uh, and the closed work permit is a work permit that's attached to a specific employer as opposed to any employer. Okay. So the question was, what if they've lied about their... So own? they basically, they, they have the right to work in Canada right now, 
uh, mm-hmm. tied to the employer they're with. They apply to work with you, um, but now they're going to need you to sort of sponsor their new permit because it's a closed work permit. It has to be okay. issued to the employee with the specific mm-hmm. employer they're going to be working with. Can you withdraw the offer since they don't actually technically have the right to work in Canada? That is a very good question. And I don't know. I'm, like, I'm, I'm looking at this from the human rights side. It's like a modified Hasib situation. Yeah. Right? yeah. Like, like could the, I could see the argument the employee is going to make that, hey, if, if you just turn me down, but I could work for you if you sponsor me. So you're, you're just discriminating against me on the basis of citizenship. Well, there isn't a positive obligation to sponsor someone for their closed work or to sign into it. No. Uh, so that would be the argument on the other side. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, is anybody aware of a case dealing with I don't think there's anything like that, right? Because yeah. Hasib is fairly novel yeah. in itself. So, I, I mean, I, the, I, you, I'm stumped on this one. I, I, I'm not really sure how how that would get decided. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting question, though. Um, but I can see arguments on both sides. Sorry, I can't be... I, I would have to really dig into this more and try to waft through any cases out there in the last 20 years uh, that might address it, but in some indirect way. But I don't think there's any direct answer. And uh, it, I think there'd be one of those tough courts, just like you saw with the seed. Yeah, the HRTO went one way, the divisional court went another, and then the Ontario Court of Appeal flipped it back. So I, I, I think this one would be even, I think this one would be less clear cut than the seed. So, yeah, if someone wants to bring that case to me, I'm happy to fight it. Uh, yeah. Because what, frankly, I agree with Landon, there is no answer to this, but this is different facts in his would, Wouldn't the difference have something to do with the fact, though, that y- there would be a time delay in order to obtain that work permit, whereas a graduating student who has applied for a work permit would presumably be able to work immediately on graduation. Like, Ryan, how long would it take to get rid of these closed permits? Oh, forever. And the and and the and, and the other and the other piece of this is like, look, uh, in, in Hasib, a case that I'm, you know, I've always found amazing in terms of its <laughs> outcome, to say the least. Uh, in Hasib, part of the the, the April Oil asserted they terminated him for his dishonesty, uh, and, the, and they just found at the tribunal level they just couldn't prove that. So it's a case of marshalling evidence. Uh, I, if someone wants to take this on, I'd love to fight it because I think we'd win. But who knows? The seed was, I would have thought the seed would have gone a different way. But I think there's a good argument for the employer to say, someone presenting a closed work permit with proper reasoning and proper legal advice, like calling us at the, be- like, you know, at the beginning, uh, I think chances are better than not we win. And I think, and Ryan touches on a good point. Quite often the outcome depends on how the employer handles the situation, right? Like it kind of sounds like with Imperial Oil, they – Maybe they didn't present the proper evidence at the beginning. They, they were putting all their, they probably assumed they were going to win just based on the notion mm-hmm. that the guy could work permanently in Canada. So they thought that's a no brainer. So they didn't really put in a lot of evidence on the fact the guy lied to them as part of the application. But you got to wonder how there could be a lack of evidence because factually it was clear that he didn't have the permit that he needed. And presumably somebody got up on the stand <clears throat> and said, we felt he was being dishonest with us. So what other evidence was there to have other than that, the factual well, situation? They may not have gone the next step and said, and that's why we then withdrew the offer. Oh, I see. I think that's where they saw But I thought they said that that was the reason. I think they said that later. Oh, oh, later. Oh, okay. Like they're kind of. Yeah, they're, retro, they're retrofitting hole. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, how much evidence you really need on a subject like that? That it's mm-hmm. not rocket science to figure out that you should, you know, put all of your reasons solidly at the beginning whenever you make a decision right. like this. It is. And in why defense you need a lawyer. Of, but in defense of imperial loyal, who could have imagined that <laughs> decision <laughs> being made, frankly? But yeah, I mean, again, I would not. Um, it was a very unique case, very unique facts. This does not stop us from saying, to people who apply to us on, dishon- on a dishonest basis to apply for a job you're not legally entitled to work for is fundamentally dishonest, non- non-trustworthy, uh, and I'm prepared to fight to, well, I would be prepared to fight anyway, enough of that. Uh, he's ready. He's ready. Yeah. Oh, exactly. that, he wants to go back to the Supreme Court of Canada. It's Never say here. die. All right. Uh, so, uh, Allison, here's an easier one. Uh, what is the difference between a fixed-term agreement and a contract? 
Oh, okay. Um, a fixed term agreement is a con- is a contract. It's a contract that runs for a fixed term. That is five months, a year, two years, and then it ends. And all other forms of employment agreements, whether they're in writing or oral, are indefinite, meaning they don't have an end date. So that so when we talk about a fixed term agreement, all we mean is that it's an agreement that has a firm end date. And again, that's why I said earlier, unless there's some actual reason why you need to have a firm end date, why would you want one? Because it creates all kinds of problems that an open-ended, indefinite hiring doesn't create. But sometimes you get this confusion where people talk about, oh, she's a contract employee. Yes. But yeah. technically, all employees are contract, Our contract employees. employees yes. Even if you don't have a written contract, there's an implied contract. Yeah, yeah. Right. Contract employee can mean a lot of things. It can mean somebody who's an independent contractor. It can mean uh, someone who is, uh, you know, on an assignment, a secondment, um, uh, who somebody who's on a fixed term, somebody who's a mat leave replacement. I mean, these things can relate to a number of things. A mat leave replacement is a good example of a fixed term agreement where. Arguably, I suppose you could say it makes some sense because there's the fixed term is related to the absence of another employee. But, you know, you do have to keep in mind that, you know, that it's it's fair enough that that employee should be able to be there for the whole of the term. But if you have to let them go early and you don't have the proper termination clause, you have to pay them out the full entirety of that term. But when I say I'm not in favor of fixed term agreements, I mean, short of something where a term is necessary, like a replacement for a mat leave. Um, in other circumstances, I have seen people who are being brought on in a three agreement, three year agreement, say. And you say, well, why is it a three year agreement? Well, we always do three year agreements, or just because. There's no, that is not a good reason to have a fixed term agreement. You want a fixed term agreement if you actually need to have a term because somebody else is behind has to sit in that chair. And that's a good I, reason I, for I would see an argument, way. though, for at least being clear to people that the arrangement is not indefinite, right? So using your example, you're being brought in for a mat leave. And if you just hire the person on a open-ended contract and fire them after 12 months, um, you're sort of deprived of the opportunity, unless you made that clear at the very mm-hmm. up, uh, at the very beginning, you're deprived of the opportunity to rebut presumptions of discrimination, uh, that may arise at the time of termination, right? You're, like, you're not going to be able to say, oh, well, it was only for a year, mm-hmm. even though it was only for a year because you didn't say it was only for a year. No, I mean, and that's why I say if you're hiring f- to replace another person who is coming back, then that makes some sense because it, it's inherent in that hiring that unless you know that you have some other place to put this person, um, they have to go at the when the yeah. other person returns. Yeah, you don't want to make a guarantee for the whole period no. of time. No, I think that's I fair mean, enough. I mean, you are bringing somebody on board who may have had another option to go somewhere else, for example, and that could get you into some difficulties. But you do just need to be aware of the fact that having fixed terms, as I said, for reasons other than t- temporary replacement of people who are off for whatever reason. That's really the only circumstance where they're that they where they make sense to use. And the most sensible way to use them really is for people who are coming back after a fixed amount of time that that is definite. So it's 12 months or it's 18 months for mat leave. That's the best example. Because then nobody is under any illusions. The person goes at the end of that time, and unless something goes horribly wrong in the middle, they should work out the entirety of that time and not need to be terminated. Um, But otherwise, there's really no reason to use fixed terms. And yet some people are very wedded to fixed terms because they think it provides some kind of assurance or guarantee to the employee. Um, that they're serious about them or that they're they're going to have more security of tenure or something along those lines. And, and that, to me, is not a good reason to do it. Yeah, so sometimes we have clients who are not-for-profits mm-hmm. where it's tied to project funding. Mm-hmm. So, okay. I mean, but the only thing, just be careful with them, right? Just two things, like as Allison said, make sure you have an early termination clause in case things aren't working out. And then whatever you do, don't forget about the end of the term. Because if they keep working past the end of the term, yeah. then like magic, they become an indefinite hire employee 
then we'll be entitled to common law notice. And there are many, many cases where employers, you know, come and present a termination problem. And it turns out that the employee was originally fixed term, then went to another fixed term, but they got went to the second fixed term after the fifth, first fixed term had expired. So the employee was already indefinite. And it just turns the whole thing into an exam question. And, you know, you really feel like, well, it, was it really necessary that they be a fixed term in the first place? I mean, if you knew that you had the probability of renewal, then isn't it really inherent that this is not really a short term deal? This is a longer term deal, in which case, why not just treat it as an indefinite type of situation? Um, I can answer that. <laughs> like the reason why employers do this is for the own because of the rules they place on themselves regarding headcount. Well, right. That's true. And it's, oh, well, um, you know, we're only allowed to have a headcount of 100, but one year fixed term, that kind of that gets sloughed. That that gets it goes into away. another pot. Yeah. But you're it, really yeah. just doing this for your own artificial reality that you've created. Yeah. Yeah. If you've got limits on how many FTEs you can have, that's not a good reason to go fix term. <laughs> All right. So I've got a question any one of us could handle. Who wants it? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take it, Jeremy. This one's Ryan's. All right. <laughs> if an employee is terminated with cause and is provided termination and severance pay, um, or termination pay and severance, so I'm not sure if that's common law or ESA, and they agree to a package and they sign a full and final release, can they still try to take you to court? Uh, if it doesn't exceed ESA minima, if you just signs for ESA minimums, yeah, they absolutely can take you to court. They're entitled to ESA minimums. So. Excellent. You don't want to keep going? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so here's here's a question. I suppose this one is, is, is for Allison. Um, if you have an employee who doesn't really have a current contract, although I suppose that means a sort of a full-blown written contract, maybe they just have like a simple offer letter or something, um, we're going to be modifying their role and we want to give them an amendment. Should we have them sign a whole new contract or just like an amendment for the new stuff they're going to be doing or responsibilities? Well, if let's start on the assumption somebody has a written agreement already. I know this is not that case, but it's easier to put it this way. You have a written agreement already. You're going to make an amendment. Your contract provides for amendments, probably, in which case you can have a simple amendment that says this document evidences that we're amending this agreement in the following ways, blah, blah, blah. All the other terms and conditions remain unchanged. And that's an amendment, and that's fine. But but if you start off with a an agreement that's not in writing, and you're going to amend it in a significant way, then at that point it may make some sense to have a written contract because you didn't before, but now you make the amendment, and you may say, depending on what the amendment is, let's assume it's something very advantageous to the employee, and you say, well, we're prepared to make this change, but in return, say we want to have a termination clause we didn't have before, or maybe we want uh, confidentiality and non-solicitation provisions we didn't have before. Then it may make some sense in the context of that amendment to say, let's have a whole new agreement. Um, I would still fresh throw in some fresh financial consideration, because the question of whether an amendment is for the employee's benefit or the employer's benefit can come up when you're just changing duties. Um, but in those circumstances, I think it may make some sense to go to a written agreement if you didn't have one previously. And in that case, it would be a full written agreement as opposed to a one-page amendment. But you know, you could you can make a one-page amendment if you're content with the existing terms being very vague. You can of course always make a, a one-page written amendment if you want to. It's just that if you have nothing fuller, it gives you the opportunity to create something fuller at that time. I would just add one thing on to that. Uh, some of it, for those of you who are regular attendees, you may recall a couple of years ago, the Employment Standards Act was amended to make non-competes invalid. Yes. But it, it was this curious provision. I think it's October 25th to 2021. Any contracts with non-competes before that date are not caught by this prohibition. Mm -hmm. Any contracts entered into after that date are caught. So in this scenario, if you're dealing with amendments or new contracts, if you have an employee with a, a contract that predates October 25th, 2021, with a non-compete that 
actually is important to you that you want to keep, then you should be careful not to enter into a completely new contract because then it will be caught by the prohibition, yeah. unless they're a C-suite executive, in which case you can yeah. still have it. Now, that being said, I'm going to tell you odds are your non-compete likely wouldn't be enforced by the court anyway, unless, quite frankly, unless we drafted it. Like 95% of those I see drafted by the lawyers, like just won't survive in court. Yeah. Um, so you may be, it may not be worth doing <laughs> to save something that isn't worth anything anyway. But if it is a good non-compete and you want to keep it, then something to think about in and terms that, of how you go about it. Yeah, and that would presuppose that the employee was in a category which would be caught by a non-compete. So if you're dealing with a senior managerial employee or an executive, you'd probably already have a written agreement with them anyway. But let's assume that you don't. Then you're, then Landon's right that keeping that non-compete for a senior manager might be very worthwhile because now you have to be in a C-suite to have a non-compete at all. Um, but if you're dealing with a sales guy, the non-compete isn't worth anything anyway. So it wouldn't be worth worrying about. Okay. So with that, we do have a few questions that we frankly don't have time to get into the uh, depth on. So if you had a burning question that we didn't get to, uh, then please do feel free to uh, reach out to one of us and and, and maybe we can uh, uh, do what we can to, to, to get into it with you. Um, but in the meantime, Landon, maybe if you want to close us down. Uh, well, just for those of you who are here live, um, you know, welcome. You're welcome to join us for drinks afterwards. For those of you attending remotely, uh, thank you for joining us. And um, also we have evaluations, right? The questionnaire. Will that go up by email? Or? Yeah, that's right. So uh, uh, shortly after this, uh, sometime before the end of this week, there'll be a uh, online survey monkey request. So if uh, you see a weird survey monkey email that says Stringer LLP, please don't ignore it. Uh, we really do appreciate your feedback. It helps us plan for these programs. Um, and we do take, uh, take note of all your suggestions and complaints. So uh, thank you for that. So thank you for joining us at this year's conference and we hope to see you next year.